Chapter 28 Caution and Pain Cal was regretting having sat down. His entire lower torso felt as though it were filled with molten lead, which was burning through his skin and fusing him to the chair. He had a talent for pushing pain aside, but those talents were fast failing him. He had searched the huge laboratory for pain patches, but it had been like looking for a fusion coil in a military junkyard. He was hot, too damn hot, to the point that his t-shirt had become soaked with sweat. Where the hell were the others? They were supposed to be bringing a med kit from the Star Splinter, and if they didn't arrive back soon, Cal had a nasty feeling that he'd never stand up again. Ever. He stared at the unconscious figure on the bunk. The woman with the white blonde hair had been out cold for a good thirty minutes now. He'd been right about her age. She was young, maybe late twenties or early thirties. Her skin was pale, flawless. Cal wondered when she would wake, so he could get some answers and some merciful distraction. He took a few grating breaths and allowed himself a little experimental stretch. All he achieved was an agonized groan. Aborting the stretch, he stiffly glanced to the doorway of the living quarters where Melinda stood. The synthetic woman remained still, silent, and apparently untroubled by his obvious pain. If he was honest, he felt like crying. If he wasn't so afraid of how much it would hurt, he just might have done. Every ten minutes that passed felt like a new lesson in the nature of true agony. He was glad that no one else was in the room to witness him in such a state, unless, of course, that someone possessed a dozen pain patches. He did his best to bring his attention back to the unconscious woman. How the hell had she launched Toka through the air like that? And how could she possibly have challenged the cybernetic strength of Melinda? He'd seen her inject herself, possibly a muscle stim of sorts to give her a huge physical boost. But he'd personally experienced muscle stims as part of his military training, and even the very best fell far short of the strength increase this woman had displayed. Besides, muscle stims left you drained, looking and feeling like an addict at their worst. This woman looked nothing short of radiant. He closed his eyes tight and had an overwhelming urge to shake his head. Where the hell were the others? He was sure they'd be back by now. Earlier, in the lab, Victor had partially managed to access the strange ship's systems. The boy had been animated about it too, so much so that he spent a full two minutes gushing its praises before revealing that, bar a collection of suitably contained live alien specimens, they were the only living souls on board. A one-person crew seemed extremely unlikely considering the ship's complexity, size and living quarters, but Victor had been adamant. Victor had also managed to locate the star splinter down in a docking bay, and it was there, that Cal had sent them. He had decided that from now on, caution would be his new motto, so the first thing he wanted to ensure was that the Star Splinter was intact and fit for a quick launch. Secondly, he had requested a fistful of pain patches, and thirdly, thinking it best the woman woke up without them all looming over her, he'd sent them off to complete the first two tasks. Now that he thought about it, this last decision was possibly a very early deviation from his new motto. His decision to leave her unrestrained to avoid her panicking was most definitely a deviation. He really wasn't thinking straight. That angelic, beautiful woman could probably break him in half with very little effort. Still, Melinda was nearby, something Jumper had thankfully insisted upon before they left. What the hell was in that injection? Trying his best to keep his breathing steady, Cal continued to ponder the woman's strength and speed. Strangely enough, it was during that very ponder that the woman leapt from the bunk and wrenched him violently from his seat. With a forearm pressed hard into his neck, she slammed him against the rear wall. More than a little shell-shocked, Cal stared into the woman's pale blue eyes that were now only inches from his own. A sudden new appreciation for her strength kicked in, not to mention for the importance of his new motto. After what felt like an eternity, but was likely only an instant, Melinda was tearing the woman away, leaving Cal to drop to the ground in a ball of agony. Melinda, wait! He managed to rasp, between desperate attempts to suck in some air. He tried to hold out a pacifying hand towards the cybernetic woman, but failed miserably. Let her go! He managed, before a coughing fit sent more searing pain through his spine. Melinda released her arm from around the woman's neck, but didn't back away. Please, Cal said, looking up at the woman. We don't want to hurt you. 
The woman turned her wide eyes to him as she backed away from Melinda. Why should I believe you? She sounded almost calm, but didn't look it. There was definite fear in those pale blue eyes. Cal crawled over to the chair that he'd been sitting in, and, remaining on his knees, managed to push himself almost upright. Because I think this is a military craft, he reasoned. A damn advanced one like I've never seen, but military. And if I'm right, then we're on the same damn side. The woman had backed up into a corner of the room. She was shaking her head. You're pirates. If he didn't feel as though he was being pounded by a giant meat hammer, Cal might just have laughed at that. We're not pirates. My name's Cal Harper. I was a lieutenant. The woman appeared far from convinced. Even the act of talking was causing excruciating pain, but Cal forced himself to continue. The tall black man is Jumper de Coup, a big game hunter. The girl's Eddie. I mean, Edwina. Edwina Cole, military private. The blonde guy is... Cal realized that he had no idea what Toka's surname was. Or maybe he just couldn't recall. Was Toka even his real name? Well, he's Toka, and he's a... Well, he's a... He's a what? A celebrity? Cal was fast regretting this approach. The boy is Victor, and... Well, he's... Military too? The woman's doubt didn't seem to be diminishing. Look, we're not pirates. We're... We're... What the hell are we? Cal desperately needed to clear his thoughts. He wanted to shake his head, but his spine would likely come apart. You healed my friend's arm, he said in an attempt to change tack. It was an opportunity, an experiment. I needed a broken bone and didn't fancy breaking one of my own. Cal could feel a shitload of sweat trickling down his face and neck. I don't suppose you have a, a pain patch? The woman ignored the question. That star splinter? It's a stolen ship, she said accusingly, as no doubt is this synthetic. She glanced at Melinda and shook her head as if in disbelief. Who the hell modified her? The boy, Cal managed weakly. The words didn't seem to want to leave his throat. It was as if they were being sucked back down by a vacuum in his lungs. He was pretty sure that elaboration was necessary, but he had nothing. Words had become a lost art. The pain had seeped up his spine and was burning the nerves in his brain. There was a loud thumping in his ears and high-pitched ringing. His vision swirled, and through those swirls he thought he could see the woman staring at him in an odd fashion. Even Melinda was staring at him now. He tried to take some deep breaths, but he didn't even manage shallow ones. His ribs seemed to be shrinking. The chair he was leaning on was scraping across the floor, and some small part of his brain realized too late that he was toppling forward. That same part of his brain thought about throwing his arms out in order to break his fall. Unfortunately, a thought was all it was. He was unconscious before he hit the floor. Chapter 29 Thick Air Cal woke up. At least he thought he was awake. There was a possibility that he was asleep. Either way, he didn't much care. He felt strange, like his brain had been dipped in honey. He was feeling slow and sort of distant. He was shrouded in darkness and floating in midair. Of this he was almost sure. His arms and legs were gently swaying, but not in a loose way, more slow and sluggish, just like his brain. It was as if the air all around him was thick enough to float in. He tried moving one of those swaying limbs, but was unsure which one. In the end, it really didn't matter. None of them obeyed. The lack of control didn't bother him. He didn't feel like moving anyway. He briefly wondered whether he was experiencing some sort of delirium, but the thought didn't have much impact, and it soon faded away. The next thought was a realization. He was naked. Well, mostly. This really didn't bother him either. Despite the dark all around him, Cal could see his body clearly. He briefly considered whether he was floating in space, but he could see no stars. Somewhere, right at the bottom of his mind, he suspected he should be experiencing panic. This should be scary, shouldn't it? Being suspended in a strange, dark place, unable to move? Yes, it probably should be scary, but it was hard to feel scared when you felt good. And he did feel good. Weird, 
but good. As he continued to float in the nothingness, there came a gradual awareness of something to his left, possibly his right. He couldn't say for sure. Two pale snakes writhing in his peripheral vision. He thought about turning to take a proper look, but it seemed like a lot of effort. He probably couldn't move his head anyway. He floated a little longer. Five minutes. Possibly an hour. Now there was something else. Something new. Even paler than the snakes. A kind of white smudge far above him, possibly below him, maybe even in front of him. He decided that it didn't really matter. He stared at the smudge for a while. Not that he had much choice. Not even his eyelids obeyed. The white smudge was getting bigger. Definitely bigger. Maybe closer. Also less smudge-like and more solid. And it was wobbling. A fish? Was the thick air liquid? Yes, liquid. It seemed obvious now that he thought about it. Perhaps the depths of some dark ocean. Maybe the white fish was a shark. One of those big demonic ones, the ones with big black eyes and rows upon rows of sharp triangular teeth jutting from a downturned mouth. He'd had nightmares about those big white sharks before. But this wasn't a nightmare. He was feeling good, happy, peaceful. If he'd been able, he might even have laughed. He was sure he was awake now, but not completely sure. Closer, clearer, the white thing wasn't a shark, not even a fish closer, clearer. Cal knew what it was now. It was an impossible thing. It looked just right, just how he'd imagined they should. He was feeling confused, but he didn't much care. The mermaid glided closer. Shining white skin, long hair flowing, beautiful. Then she was beside him, dealing with the writhing snakes, protecting him. Something occurred to him, a strange, dull something that grew slowly brighter in his mind. He was breathing. He shouldn't be able to breathe, not underwater, should he? It was all becoming a little confusing, more confusing. But that was okay, he didn't much care. The mermaid was hovering over him now, her body and tail a blur, but her beautiful face as clear as day. Blue eyes, incredible pale blue eyes. She was cradling his head in her hands, delicate but strong fingers. Was she to guide him to the surface, free him from the dark depths? But he was breathing, must be air, not water. He stared at the mermaid. How could such a creature survive in such a place? But the answer was out of his reach. He really didn't mind overly much. Did I die? That thought came quicker and sharper than the others. Was this an angel? Perhaps here to guide him back to life or onward to heaven, or maybe to hell. After all, he'd killed. He'd killed many, always in defense of himself or another, but it was still lives taken. No. He decided after some time, or perhaps no time at all, that this beautiful creature had nothing to do with hell. Her face was close, long shining hair slowly curling bright white against the blackness. Such blue eyes. Cal could feel her hands lightly pressing against the sides of his face, firm but tender. She was looking directly at him. He thought maybe there was an expression on her face. Sadness, seriousness. Yes, a little seriousness, but not entirely. Concern, yes, possibly concern. Concern for him? He wasn't keen on the concern. He tried a smile to remove the concern from that beautiful face. Had he managed it? He really wasn't all that sure. He felt suddenly strange, stranger than before. He felt as though he was drifting, suddenly drifting, but without moving. He didn't mind. The blue-eyed angel was still with him. His vision began to fade, but with an edge of defiance he continued to gaze at the beautiful pale face. Then the concern was gone, and just before his vision went completely dark and his conscious mind faded away, the blue-eyed angel returned the smile. Chapter 30 Kaya Cali boy, wake up, bro. The days are wasting away. Cal was lying down, that much he knew. He blinked open one eye and saw a face looming over him, 
The face was deeply tanned and dominated by a white-toothed grin. Man, I knew it! I knew you were awake! I think I might be psychic. With an effort, Cal blinked open his other eye. Toka. Yes, bro, it's me. You okay? Yo. At least I think so. Cal brought his hand to his face and rubbed his eyes. Toka, I've been meaning to ask you. Toka gave him an encouraging nod. How the hell do you keep such a tan in deep space? Toka showed even more of his white teeth. Ha! Knew you'd be fine. I told them there ain't much that can keep Cali Boy down. That's what I told them. He reached out a hand. Gratefully accepting it, Cal pulled himself to a sitting position and was surprised to find that, apart from a little disorientation, he actually felt pretty good. Pretty damn good. He looked about. He was sat on one of five bunks, set along the straight back wall of a large, high-ceilinged, D-shaped room. Seeing monitoring equipment to the rear of each bunk, he guessed he was in some sort of medical facility. Just like all the other rooms he'd found himself in of late, it was almost entirely white. There was a high viewing panel stretched across the entire length of the curved wall through which he could see other white rooms housing more equipment. Cal had been in more than his fair share of medical facilities in his time, and despite the obvious advanced nature of the facility, nothing he saw was particularly unusual. Nothing, bar one exception. A large round pool was set within the circular-shaped portion of the room that was filled almost to the brim with an eerie-looking inky black liquid. Weird, eh? Toka said, having noticed the direction of his stare. Kind of spooky looking. Cal agreed with a nod. What, uh... What the hell is it? Toka offered. That's a good question. Some kind of healing juice. There was a lot of science talk, to be honest, bro, which kind of shot over my pip. Whatever it is, though, it healed you up good and proper. The very same stuff that fixed up my arm, apparently. Cal could feel confusion settling in. What about the woman? Woman? You mean Kaya? What a lady, eh? Gorgeous. Cal rubbed at his face. I think you might have to fill me in a bit here, Toka. I'm feeling a little out of the loop. Sure, yeah, sorry, I'm not being all that helpful. The woman's called Kaya. She's a scientist. She thought we were pirates. You believe that, Cal? Toka smiled. It took us a while, but we managed to convince her that we were goodens. Well, Victor and Jumper did most of the talking. I think Eddie and I were kind of making things worse. I tell you, Cal, it's a pretty damn amazing ship, this. Some sort of research vessel? We had a good look round yesterday. Real advanced stuff. I didn't really get most of it, but it had Victor grinning from ear to ear, like a pig in the finest slop he was. Yesterday? How long have I been out? Oh, right, let me see. Uh, a good few days. Three, no, three and a half, I think. You were in pretty bad shape. It was kind of scary for a time. You've been sleeping like a baby for most of today, though. Cal took a moment to get his head around what Toka had said. Three days? What the hell had happened to him? He sighed and followed up his face rubbing with a bit of habitual neck massage. How are the rest of the gang? They about? Sure, Jumper should be here soon. We've been taking it in turns sitting here, waiting for you to wake up. Appreciate it. Of course, Toka said with a wave of a hand. I think Victor's off with Melinda doing tech stuff, and Eddie, he shook his head. Well, Eddie is off searching for clues. Clues? Yep, she still doesn't trust Kai even after she saved your life. Crazy little nitwit sneaking around the ship trying to find something to incriminate her. Personally, I think she's still pissed off at having noodles chucked in her face. Toka shrugged. She'll calm down eventually. Anyway, how's the back feeling? My back. Cal instinctively reached his hands behind himself. Of course, his back. How could he have forgotten? He stretched, slowly and experimentally at first, then more rigorously, even throwing in a couple of twists from side to side. It feels... Well, it feels fine. It feels... Great. That's incredible. Toka nodded enthusiastically. Uh-huh, it's that pool, the black juju juice. It's crazy stuff. You were scratching at death's door when you went in that pool. Kaya had you at the bottom of it for a full day and night. Cal looked again at the inky black liquid and shook his head in confusion. What the hell happened to me? We found you crashed out on the floor. I gotta tell you, pal, I thought you were a goner. You look like death on a stick. 
There was a bit of a crazy tussle at first. Kaya was kneeling next to you with some sort of Zappa device when we turned up. Looked like she'd done you a mischief. Found out after it was a medical scanner, but not before Eddie had launched herself at Kaya, used all of her limbs and her head to pound on her. Let me tell you, bro, after we got Eddie under control, there was a shitload of arguing and confusion. My head still aches from it. Eventually, she convinced us that you croaked for sure if we didn't let her help you. Die? From a bad back? Not just the back. You had a fever, too. A bad one. Goongoo or Garngar fever? Something like that? Toka grinned again and shook his head. Man, you gotta have some guardian angel looking over you. If we hadn't ended up on this particular ship when we did, he continued to shake his head, but the grin left his face. Sorry, kind of morbid. Anyway, none of that matters now. All is good. I guess so, Cal murmured. He had a ton of questions in his head and more flooding in by the minute. And his back it felt completely normal. Better than normal. Nothing short of a miracle. I'd like to talk to her. Uh, Kaya. Is she about? Yep, she's actually closer than you think, Toka replied, nodding towards the inky pool. Cal raised an eyebrow. She's in there? Right now? Uh-huh. She went in a few minutes before you woke up. She said she had to do some maintenance. How deep is it? Fifty feet, apparently. Fifty? Yeah, seems a bit excessive, right? What's she using for breathing apparatus? Toka chuckled. That's the weird thing. She's not using any. Some sort of breathable liquid? Nope. She had to put a bubble mask on you when she took you in. Took me in? Huh. A small gum breather, then? That's what I thought. I use a gum breather when I surf the big waves. Damn clever bit of kit. Thing is, she swears she doesn't need one. And you know what? I believe her. She's one hell of a lady, Cal. Capable. She's probably fixing the tubing on the bubble breather mask. There was a bit of a malfunction the first day you were down there. You should have seen her, bro. She was pretty scared for you. Stripped off and dove in there like some kind of mermaid. Huh. Mermaid. Cal narrowed his eyes at his young friend, a strange feeling that he was being mocked creeping in. Yeah, you know, part chick, part fish, Toka continued. Tell you what, Cal, I wouldn't mind another go in there myself. Cal slowly nodded. He didn't blame his young friend one bit. Despite his confusion, he really was feeling pretty damn good. It can get quite addictive, came a female voice. Cal turned to see that Kaya had surfaced in the center of the pool. Only her head was above the surface, her pale skin and white blonde hair offering a striking contrast to the black liquid. It's the particles in the liquid. They charge up the cells in the body. Oh, yeah, Toker exclaimed. Cal thought his friend's voice a touch higher than normal. How'd you even see when you're down there? Toker asked. Kaya swam to the pool's edge before answering. It's like when you're in a cloud. Everywhere you look is white, but you can clearly see yourself. Except, of course, in this case, it's black. Placing her hands on the white floor, she nimbly pulled herself out of the pool. Cal was surprised to see that the black liquid looked almost clear as it ran off her body. I'm glad you're awake, she said, giving Cal a radiant smile as she walked towards the bunks. Uh, yes, so am I, he replied, and returned a smile, albeit an awkward one. It sounds as though I might not have woken at all, if it wasn't for you. Thanks. Kaya frowned. Please, you don't owe me any thanks. Certainly not after disabling your ship, knocking you all out and dumping you in a cell, she said, the guilt plain on her face. Then, of course, there was that wall I slammed you against. Cal shrugged, hoping he came across more composed than he felt. Just mistaken identity. He reached out an open palm. I'm Callum, but, um, I guess, well, I guess you probably already know that. Pull it together, Cal. The woman's radiant smile seemed to have disrupted the coordination of his mouth and brain. Kaya, Dr. Kaya Svensson, she said, taking his hand and shaking it. Hey, Doc, Toka said, seeming unsure where to direct his eyes. Can I, um, a towel? Can I get you a towel or something? Cal smiled at his young friend's awkwardness. Not just me, then. I'm fine, thanks, Toka, she replied tipping her head and giving her hair a twisting squeeze with her hands. She seemed completely unaware of the effect she was having, which to Cal only made her more attractive. To be honest, you'd be hard-pressed to find a towel on this vessel anyway, 
she continued. There are tiny micropores in the floor that sense damp skin and direct warm air at you wherever you walk. No kidding, Toka said, his awkwardness fading a little. That's pretty freaking clever. She nodded and squeezed her hair again. Great for your feet, not so great for your head. Toka chuckled. Mind if I give it a go? Knock yourself out. Grinning, Toka perched on the edge of the bed, yanked off his boots, and made his way barefoot over to the pool. Cal enjoyed the amused expression on Kaya's face as she watched Toka hop away. Unfortunately, it turned to one of guilt as she looked back at him. I really am sorry, Callum. Just Cal is fine. She nodded. The way I treated you all, I was confused and, well, scared. Understandable. These are crazy times. He glanced at Toka. And we are a bit of a weird bunch. Kaya smiled, but the guilt lingered in her eyes. You were just being cautious, he added. Too cautious. He shrugged again. Maybe you could give me a few tips. I'm trying caution as a new motto. She laughed at that, then turned to look at Toka, who now had his trousers rolled up and was sitting with his legs immersed in the black liquid. You've got some good friends there. I saw real fear in their eyes when I explained what was wrong with you. I couldn't hope for better, he replied honestly. Can I ask what exactly was wrong with me? She indicated the end of the bunk. You mind if I sit? Please do. She perched on the corner of the bunk, and after a moment asked, Have you ever been to the Guan Islands on Philly Debt? Huh. Now that really did confuse him. Actually, yes. I was on Philly Debt about five years ago with my squad. We spent about four months there, most of it on the islands trying to protect a group of scientists from the local wildlife. Kaya raised her eyebrows. Bet that was a tough job. He nodded. Eventful. Quite the lethal planet. Yes, and most of its dangers you can't even see. Ah, parasites. I'm afraid so. But that was five years ago. There's a parasite called the Guan Gara, a nasty little critter, and it's all but impossible to detect on scans, at least while it remains dormant. It waits in hiding until the host body is subjected to a suitable level of stress, then it strikes hard. It's strange, really. Why would it kill its host, its home? But that's what it does, and it does it quickly. Cal took a moment to absorb Kaya's words. I guess I was pretty stressed. This ship of yours is unusual. I was convinced for a time that I'd offered my friends up on a plate to, well, who knows. The problem was physical, too. Your lower back was in a complete state. Yes, I, uh, had a bit of a tumble off a cliff a little while back. Why didn't you get it fixed? Cal felt his cheeks warm. Jesus, what am I, a schoolboy? Kaya suddenly reddened a little, too. Sorry, that was a bit abrupt. He laughed. No, that's fine. I really should have had it seen to but I never seemed to find the time. The reason sounded lame, but that didn't make it any less true. Probably for the best, Kai replied. Military doctors would have only made it worse. I'm sorry, if I'd paid more attention, I could have fixed it when I saw to your friend's broken arm. Cal looked over at Toka, who was still sitting at the edge of the pool, sporting a wide grin as he waved a wet left foot over the floor. Well, that black liquid seems nothing short of magical. My back feels stronger and healthier than ever. As a matter of fact, my whole body does. Kaya smiled with a knowing nod. It's a safe bet that neither the parasite nor the back will trouble you again. I wish I could tell you how it works, but truthfully we don't have a clue. All I can tell you is that the deeper you're immersed in the liquid, the more powerful the effect. Where's it from? The northern mountain ranges of the planet Alvor. There are entire lakes full of it. Alvor. That planet again. He still had clear visions of the Alvorian oak that Jumper had led them to on Mars. The mammoth tree had been a wondrous treat to the eyes, just as its fruits had been to the taste buds. You know, even though I've never stepped foot on it, Alvor is fast becoming my favorite place. Kaya smiled. Yes, it's an incredible planet. The discoveries we've made there are spectacular, and we've only just brushed the surface. We? Oui. Sorry, Cal, you must be pretty confused right now. Just a bit. He turned to gaze at the black liquid. His mind felt as full as the pool and then some. That was some pretty impressive breath-holding you did down there. She recognized the compliment as the question it was intended to be. I have certain... 
abilities. So I've noticed, he said, looking back at her. You're the first person I've met who's managed to tackle and surprise a synthetic. You gave Melinda a little run for her money for a moment there in that lab. I'd love to know how you... He dropped his head and suddenly found himself chuckling. I think maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. I have so many questions for you, Kaya, but I really have no idea where to start. And I can barely look at you without feeling like a jabbering teen. Kaya nodded, her blue eyes full of understanding. I know the feeling. I've been firing questions at your friends pretty much non-stop for the past couple of days. Sitting up straighter, she shot him another of her ridiculously radiant smiles. I guess I've had my chance to get ahead, so how's about I help you catch up? I'd appreciate that, thanks. Okay, she said, using her hands to brush back her hair. It was almost dry now, and its wavy length was beginning to form into ringlets at its ends. This ship is the Aurelian, one of three scientific research vessels. It has 18 departments, including motion physics, cybernetics, biological upgrading, and alien study. I'm the head of biological research. One of three? What happened to the other two? Kaya shrugged. I wish I knew. What happened to the rest of the Aurelian's crew? Kaya paused for a moment, the smile faltering ever so slightly. Fear happened, she said. There were 310 of us on board originally. People started getting scared when the long-range communications went down. Cal nodded his understanding. Isn't it amazing how much we rely on communications to feel safe? The mind starts to fear the worst when the lights go out. Yes. I guess this time the worst had happened. Eventually, word physically reached us of Earth's destruction. Oh? It was a private vessel. They'd witnessed the attacking ships firsthand before they fled. The state the crew was in, I wouldn't be surprised if they're still fleeing now. We spent a few weeks trying to confirm it, visited a lot of colonies. A few months after that, I was the only one left on board. Cal detected bitterness in her voice. What happened? The majority of the crew bailed early on. Roaming through space with the threat of an advanced, aggressive alien race just proved too much. Then, there were rumors that military starships and bases had been attacked and overrun. Those rumors turned out to be true. All the bases we visited were empty and in ruins. Like Delta Point Three. Kaya nodded. During that time, we didn't cross paths with any starships but we all feared the worst. The remaining crew didn't want to risk staying on board a ship with military connections. There were arguments, of course. Dr. York argued that the Aurelian was one of the safest places in known space. He was the scientist responsible for our ghosting net technology. Ghosting net? A new stealth and cloaking technology, so new that only the Aurelian and a few other ships had been fitted with it before the invasion. The crew still didn't feel safe, though, and eventually they all jumped ship. Where did they jump ship to? Most to Alvor. We have three large research bases there. They hadn't been attacked? No, but Alvor's quite a distance. She looked lost in thought for a moment. Also, they're not listed as military. You didn't fancy Alvor? Seems it would make a nice home. I had my reasons to stay. I wanted to learn more about the threat. So did Dr. York and some of his team. What about military personnel, soldiers, security detail? They didn't feel it their duty to stay on board? The Aurelian isn't a military vessel. It's part of Sync Corp. Cal shook his head. You're unlikely to have heard of it. They didn't exactly advertise. They develop advanced technology, or at least they did. They often supplied the military but were never owned by them. We did have a sizable security detail on board, but none of them felt any great loyalty. They weren't soldiers, just hired muscle to keep order among the crew. She gave Cal a half-smile. Scientists have a habit of heatedly disagreeing from time to time. The truth is that threats from outside forces were never really considered a potential problem. The Aurelian is a stealth ship, and with Dr. York's ghosting net system, we relied on never being detected in the first place. Well, it certainly worked on us. We didn't have an inkling of your presence until you came into view. If I'd had the ghosting net on full, you wouldn't have seen a thing. You'd have been none the wiser until the ship's clutches had grabbed hold and the knockout probe burst through. Sorry. You disabled our star splinter like it was a child's toy. She gave him another half smile. Might as well have been. Sync Corp designed and built every star splinter ship on the market. Really? Yep. Cal detected a hint of pride in that yep. 
They don't exactly advertise the fact, but they're behind most of the best tech out there. All of the smart technology, smart straps, smart glass. They had a hand in nearly all of the military's technology. Even the computer systems that big starships operate on were designed and built by Syncorp. Hmm. Cal suddenly felt a little stupid. He'd never given much thought as to where those technologies had originated. In truth, he'd always assumed that the military had been responsible for their own tech. And the synthetics? Yes, those two. In fact, many of Melinda's counterparts were built here on this very ship. Really? Victor's going to love that. Kaya laughed, and Cal felt his heart skitter. Your young friend is already loving it. He's practically set up home down in the cybernetics department. That kid is incredible. Yes, there's some brain in that head of his, Cal replied, surprised at the swell of pride he felt. So I guess that explains how you managed to disable Melinda too. Kaya nodded, that touch of guilt peeping out again. Sync Corp never likes to completely relinquish control of their products. Every one of them contains what's called a TCW, a transparent control worm. I'm not convinced even the military knows about it. Any major Sync Corp computer can detect their products within a particular radius. Then they can hack into it and take control. That's how I discovered your ship. Strange, Cal said after a moment's deliberation. Kaya looked at him questioningly. Sorry, it's just that... After what you've just told me, I was wondering how in the hell a man like Aaron Hogmire could ever manage to get hold of and keep a stolen star splinter. Hogmire is... Yes, Kaya interjected, one corner of her mouth curling. Your friend Toker over there has already told me about Hogmire and how you acquired his ship. The reasons for him having it are probably simpler than you think. It's just deception on the part of Sync Corp. They take steps to hide the presence of the TCWs by allowing a certain percentage of their products to get stolen. In fact, I wouldn't put it past them to employ a man like Hogmire to help arrange such deceptions. Cal nodded and scratched his head. So, um, we seem to have strayed a bit. What happened to Dr. York and his team? If they were so confident in their new stealth tech, why didn't they stay? They took a ship and headed to Alvor just over a month ago. They finally got cold feet. Yes, but it had nothing to do with alien invaders. Pirates scared them off. Pirates? How the hell could pirates manage to threaten such a ship? Cal decided to put that particular question on the back burner. Something else had begun to dominate his thought process. Forgive my snooping, Kaya, but I couldn't help noticing the two rather large Carcarians in your lab. Yes, sorry if they gave you a fright. Your friend Jumper was quizzing me about those yesterday. I'm studying them. They're just specimens, then? Specimens. And prisoners. So the rumors are true. The Karkarians are involved in this threat? Yes, they're involved. But not in a way that you might think. She looked down and gave her head a little shake. I've learned a lot in recent weeks. A hell of a lot. She looked up at him. But I think it would be easier to show you rather than tell you. Cal suddenly felt a wave of hope, excitement even. Kaya's words were like music to his ears. He might finally get some answers, some real answers. Time to stop being bounced around, he hoped. Looks like you have a visitor, Kaya said, pulling him from his thoughts. Cal looked up to see Jumper strolling towards them, a broad grin stretched across his face. Maybe it's best I give you two some time to catch up, Kaya suggested, pushing herself up off the bunk. How's about I meet you in the specimens lab when you're ready? Sounds good, he replied, his smile finally losing its awkward edge. Jumper knows the way. Okay. And Kaya. Thanks again. You're welcome. She turned and headed off towards the exit, exchanging a friendly greeting with Jumper as she went. Cal took some deep breaths to oxygenate his overtaxed brain. So much had happened, so much had been learned, and he'd bloody well slept through it. He was glad Jumper was finally here to help set free the cacophony of questions battering his skull. Jumper would help get him back on track, and he didn't fancy his old friend in the least. Good to see you awake and looking fit, Jumper said as he approached the bunk. Well, my feet haven't touched the floor yet, but I guess looking fit is a good start. Jumper stood at the end of the bunk for a moment. Something strange in his smile. You okay? Cal asked hesitantly. Jumper didn't answer. Instead, he walked around the bunk, leaned forward, and gave him an embrace. 
Cal was taken aback. Jumper had never been one for openly showing emotion. So much so, in fact, that when Cal was a boy, it had taken him quite a while to recognize his subtle expressions. Jumper continued the embrace. Damn it, I thought I'd lost you for a time there, kid, he said, before releasing him and straightening up. His smile had turned to a deep frown. I'm, I'm sorry to have scared you, Jumper. Jumper noisily cleared his throat and just about managed to lose the frown. Yes, well, just don't go doing it again. Cal nodded. I'll try. See that you do. Jumper rubbed at the back of his neck and had a look around the room. Everything all right with Toka, he said after a moment. Cal looked towards the black, shimmering pool. Toka was on his hands and knees, directing his long, dripping wet hair towards the floor. He's just experimenting. Jumper sighed. You know, Cal, it was far easier when I was going solo, only having my own hide to worry about. Having people that you're fond of is, well, it's pretty damn stressful. Mm hmm Cal nodded. You know, if you wanted, we could always drop you off on some jungle planet. A good one, with plenty of big nasty beasties to stop you from getting bored. Jumper chuckled. You know what? All the stress in the world wouldn't make me abandon you lot. He was still watching Toka, who was now making his way around the pool in a sort of sumo wrestling stance, his rapidly drying hair still flopping forward. Being on your own is peaceful, Shaw, but it's bloody difficult to keep yourself amused. I'm glad to hear it. Jumper nodded. Besides, who the hell else would make sure you lot ate properly? Cal grinned, and the two men sat in silence for a few moments. His old friend's exceptional zen had somehow quietened the questions within him. But it couldn't last. So, our new friend Kaya's been filling me in on a few things. Kaya, yes. She's something, eh? She's like a magician, and this ship's her box of tricks. Beautiful, too, and brave. It must take a lot of courage to go solo on a ship like this. Quite a woman. Cal grinned. Definitely not just me. Chapter 31 Catching Up Man, that's weird looking. What? Where is it? Eddie's nose was practically touching the smart glass barrier as she squinted and peered through it. I don't see it. Do you see it, Cal? Toka sighed, exasperated. Of course Cal can see it. It's right there. Toka stabbed his finger forwards, on the back of its neck. More parasites, Cal asked, turning to Kaya. Of a sort, she answered. To be honest, they're like nothing I've ever seen before, and I haven't had them here long enough to study them in full. Cal nodded and continued to stare into the chamber. Nothing had changed within since he and Jumper had first seen it two Karkarians on separate platforms, although Kai had turned one of the aliens in order to view a parasite-like creature on the back of its neck. The other Karkarian was glaring at them, its silvery eyes bright and its white fangs bared. Both aliens were propped upright, their muscled forms bound by restraints that seemed disturbingly flimsy. Cal wasn't worried. The real protection lay in the huge slab of smart glass that made the viewing possible. It would take nothing short of a severe act of God to break it. Cal could understand why Eddie was having trouble seeing the critter in question. Even though it was the size of a large hand, it was as jet black as its Carcarian host and was attached to the back of its neck almost seamlessly. You lot are having me on, Eddie grumbled. There ain't nothing there. I can make it more visible if you'd like. Eddie turned to look at Kaya with hostile eyes. With an uncomfortable smile, Kaya picked up a control wand and used it to activate a slim, robotic arm within the chamber. Smoothly moving it up and forward, the arm expelled a fine mist towards the strange parasite. The moment the mist made contact, the little critter jerked in spasm, and its jet-black form burst into colour, a mottled mass of vibrant blues, greens and yellows that wriggled back and forth across its length. Whoa, man, now that really is weird, Toko exclaimed, taking a step back in surprise. Tell me you can see it now, Ed. Of course I bloody do. Toka turned and raised an eyebrow at Kaya. So the little beastie's not keen on your spray, eh, Doc? It's a really acid. Not particularly strong, but for some reason the parasite reacts to it. The mist does no harm to the Carcarians. At least, it wouldn't if they were alive. 
Not like that mist you sprayed at us then? Eddie commented. No, Kai said, her uncomfortable smile turning to an apologetic one. Geez, Ed, hold a grudge much? With a sour face, Eddie mumbled something inaudible and turned back to the glass. Using the control wand, Kaya stopped the acidic mist and retracted the robotic arm. Almost instantly, the parasite stopped its wriggling and rapidly darkened until it once again matched the color of its host. They're dead, Cal asked after a moment. Kai looked at him questioningly. The Karkarians. You said that even if they were alive, the mist wouldn't hurt them. They seem pretty alive to me. You'd be forgiven for thinking so. I thought the very same thing not all that long ago, until I began my studies and ran some scans. To all sense and purposes, the Karkarians in there are most definitely dead. Their brains are completely offline. Those parasite-like creatures are running the show. They've inserted minute tendrils through the neck directly into the spinal cord, probably killing the host instantly. Through those tentacles, they control the entire body. The Karkarians are nothing more than drones now, vehicles. So they've basically killed the mind and hijacked the body? Exactly. They're much more than parasites, though. They don't require their hosts to be alive to assure their own survival. In fact, they ensure that the host doesn't survive. It kills them, then it nicks the body. Oh, man, Toka said, turning to Cal and Kaya with a disturbed look. He shook his head, and seeming unsure of what else to say, simply turned back to look back through the glass. Oh, man, what, idiot? Eddie spat. Toka looked at her. Well, it's... Well, it's just bloody evil, isn't it? How can a little thing like that do all that? I wish I knew, Kaya answered. Their biology is completely baffling. To be honest, I've never seen anything like it, and trust me, I've studied an awful lot of species. Trust you, Eddie exclaimed, her voice somewhat muffled by the barrier in front of her face. That's a laugh. You know what, Ed? Toka interjected. You need to start being a little more polite. I've a good mind to put you over my knee. He flashed Cal and Kyra a quick grin. And what is it with you and glass? You just have to press your face against it, don't you? Shut it, blonde. Eddie's glass-muffled retort was interrupted by a loud bang as one of the Karkarian drones snapped forward, slamming against its restraints and issuing a strange alien hiss as it did so. Taken by surprise, Eddie fell back and landed heavily on her backside. Toka's grin widened. Is there a lesson learned? He wagged a finger down at her. You don't press your face against the glass. Eddie shot him a look that Cal wouldn't wish upon his worst enemy. A second later, Toka was dashing off across the lab, Eddie hot on his tail, fists clenched. She really doesn't like me much, Kai said, as she placed the control wand on a nearby desk. I guess I can't really blame her. Don't worry about Eddie. She'll come around, Cal replied as he watched the pair battle their way around the lab. Sorry for any damage. It's fine. Kaya said with a wave of her hand. The only things of any real importance are the two, well, four creatures behind this glass. Cal turned back to stare into the chamber. Where did you find them? We came across their wrecked ship shortly before Earth was destroyed. They'd fallen victim to the Kaloth Drift. Cal nodded. He knew the K-Drift well. He'd had to navigate it as part of his training. The physics of it was way beyond him, something to do with the close proximity of multiple planets, moons, and asteroid fields. Ships passing through the area had a habit of suddenly and quite severely being pulled off course, often resulting in a crash. They were shipwrecked. Yes, on one of Ceros's moons. There wasn't much of their craft left. It was incredible these two remained so intact. Just shows you how tough the body of a Carcarian is. There were only two of them. As far as we could see, yes. The wreckage suggested the craft was small. Scouts, maybe. I'm no engineer, but their technology seems just as baffling as their biology. We gathered the wreckage for study. I'd like to see it. Kaya shook her head. Sorry, Cal, the technology engineers kept hold of it. They took it to Alvor for further study. Cal shrugged, feeling a little disappointed. Lost in thought, he approached the glass to get a closer look at the neck critter. The other Karkarian drone hissed at him and slammed against the restraints. Cal ignored it. What the hell are you? The critter itself was completely motionless, but he could see the gentle rise and fall of the alien drone's heavily muscled shoulders as it breathed. He formed a mental picture of the tendrils that Kaya spoke of and could imagine them worming their way through the Karkarian's neck into its spinal column. Things are starting to make sense, he said, turning to look at Kaya, 
but at the same time they're becoming more confusing. I've never known a great deal about Karkarians, but I know enough that the thought of them flying planet-destroying vessels is pretty ludicrous. These parasite critters are the start of an explanation, but where the hell do they come from? And what the hell are they? Any theories? Kaya frowned and gave a small shrug. Theories are pretty much all I have in that regard. They're obviously not from our little section of known space, not even close. The advanced nature of their technology certainly suggests that they're capable of traveling extreme distances. Also, the biology that I've studied over the past ten years is hugely diverse, but these creatures, well, it's like their biological structure is governed by a whole different set of rules, rules that have evolved very differently to any ecosystem I've ever studied. Looking at them in the scans, they almost seem too simplistic, too basic, not enough there to control an entire body like they do, let alone hold the intelligence to design and build their technology. To be honest, I don't think these creatures are our enemy. I mean, not our true enemy. I don't think I follow. Kaya let out a small, frustrated sigh. Sorry, I'm not explaining myself very well. I don't think they're a complete living entity. They're more like a remote receiver, a biological remote control receiver, controlled by something else somewhere else. Cal looked back in the chamber with a frown. It's just a theory, Kaya finished with a shrug. But if that were the case, wouldn't they try to locate this ship and retrieve their drones? Perhaps. Kaya looked down, seemingly lost in thought. Despite the questions filling his head, Cal tried to do her a favor by staying silent until she continued. There's more I have to tell you, she eventually said, looking up and fixing him with her blue eyes. Much more you have to see. What I'm showing you here is only the tip of what I've discovered. She looked back through the glass and went quiet again for a time. Maybe if their controlling signal is biological in nature, she suggested, perhaps it would function completely differently to a technological counterpart. If that was the case, whoever or whatever is controlling these two drones might not know anything other than what can be seen, heard, and felt through the drone's physical senses. Kaya's words were cut short by a high-pitched alarm. Damn it, she exclaimed quietly before hurrying over to a nearby console. They're bloody relentless, she said, sounding annoyed as well as a little scared. Bemused, Cal followed her to the console and looked up as she activated a large holographic screen. Do you see them? she asked sounding stressed as she pointed up at the screen, which revealed a view of deep space. There was a distant planet with multiple moons, but that wasn't what she was pointing at. With a movement of her hand, she enlarged a view of an approaching ship. Cal recognized it immediately as a pirate ship, purely because every pirate seemed compelled to adorn the hulls of their ships with custom weaponry. Such modifications often made them look ridiculous, but not this particular case. The ship looked nothing short of deadly. Pirates. Yes, they've been tracking the Aurelian for months now. I don't know how or why. They shouldn't be able to. They shouldn't even be able to see us, let alone track us. Twice they've almost commandeered the ship. They're the reason that Dr. York and his team left. I take it you can't disable them like you did the Star Splinter? Not a chance. That's a black market ship built from scratch on some backworld, most likely. What weapons and defenses does this ship have? Kaya shook her head. None. He looked at her in surprise. It's a research vessel, she said a little defensively. It relies solely on speed and stealth. The ghosting net is, or at least should be, its real protection. So how are they beating the system? I have no idea. I wish I knew. Somehow they're managing to track us even through the ghosting net. They keep locking onto the Aurelian's flight signature. It shouldn't be possible. Not even our new alien invaders are capable of that. This last statement took Cal by surprise, but the questions would have to wait. Luckily, their ship's nowhere near as fast as the Aurelian, Kaya continued. They'll never catch us, but it certainly hasn't stopped them trying. Maybe they're hoping to catch you with your pants down, if you'll excuse the expression. Probably, especially if they somehow knew I was alone. Well, they've got seven of us to deal with now. Kaya briefly turned from the holographic screen to smile at him. It was a smile that said a lot. Finding yourself alone in space, even in peaceful times, was trying even for the bravest of souls. Cal suspected that Kai was deeply grateful for the company. Have you managed to scan their ship? Yes, just basic sweep scans that I've run each time before fleeing. They have a crew of 78, and the energy scans suggest multiple weapons. A large crew for pirates. Kai cast her eyes down to her console and nodded. Yes, and by all accounts an unusually sophisticated ship, 
she said, her hands dancing over the console's controls. I've set the Aurelian at full speed on a random escape vector. It will shake them off our trail, but it means it'll take us longer to reach our destination. Cal watched as the lethal-looking ship rapidly faded into the distance. Soon it was nothing more than a distant blip on the scanners. Satisfied that the threat was well and truly left behind, he turned to Kaya. Our destination. Chapter 32 Insidious Mushrooms Cal stared at the gleaming white table, his brain spinning like a defective gyro detonator, just as it had been all night. Despite his sleeplessness, he was still feeling pretty damned good. Whatever that magical pool of black liquid had changed within him was lasting in its effect. He was grinning, something he'd been doing periodically since the previous day. He felt ten years younger, better even. There wasn't a hint of pain where his old injuries had been. It was as if they'd never existed, nothing short of a miracle. He looked over at Jumper, keen to discuss the miracle for the hundredth time, but his old friend looked to be at a crucial stage in his cooking process. The scrambled eggs in Crassian herbs and salted taka sausages smelt divine, a little miracle of their own. Cal looked to the opposite of the canteen table. Toka was slumped in his chair, head back, eyes closed and snoring softly. Eddie sat next to him, intently tying a fistful of his long, blonde hair to the frame of his seat. Victor, Melinda and Kaya were yet to arrive. Cal hoped they wouldn't be long. He wanted to talk things through, plan things out. He wanted to chat, and not just about the magical black elixir. Not by a long shot. Not after the previous evening's discussions. Kaya knew where at least some of the invaders were. Not only that, but she'd observed them for five full days. Cal shook his head, still not quite believing she'd managed it. Her discovery of the huge alien ship on the surface of the Karkarian planet C-9 had been the start. A giant block of a ship, and close to it a prison camp revealing the terrible plight of thousands of military personnel. She had also seen the battle-class starships those prisoners had once crewed. Perhaps a third of the Federation's military fleet, now empty and drifting aimlessly among C-9's many moons. Cal could scarcely believe the truth of it. How could so many heavily gunned starships have been overpowered and so many soldiers taken captive, even if they were technologically outmatched? Fortunately, it seemed Kaya had some answers. Despite knowing her for less than a day, Cal's admiration of Kaya had continued to rise exponentially. Of the Aurelian's substantial crew, she'd been the only one with the dedication and courage to stay on board and then some. She'd put her faith in the vessel's unparalleled technology its highly advanced ability to remain unseen and undetected, and taken a bold risk. He could barely imagine the fear she must have faced and subsequently conquered when she'd set the ship on a course into what was possibly the heart of the alien invader's territory. Fortunately for Kaya, and quite possibly the rest of the human race, the gamble had paid off. Even orbiting the conquered Karkarian planet in close proximity, the cloaked vessel had remained undetected. Still lost in his musings, Cal scooped his mug of tea in one hand and looked up to see Melinda entering the canteen. She was wearing a close-fitting bodysuit similar to Kaya's, and he could have sworn her hair was a shade lighter. He slurped at the hot beverage as she approached with her long strides and sat at the end of the table. Good morning, Cal. Eddie. Almost spilling the steaming cup over his lap, Cal suffered a small coughing fit. Not once during his time spent in Melinda's company had the cybernetic woman ever addressed him directly. In fact, he'd never seen her talk to anyone other than Victor. Wiping his chin with his sleeve, he tried to clear his throat. <clears> throat> yes, uh, morning, Melinda. She smiled at him and then relaxed back in her chair. A little confused by this turn of events, Cal looked over to Toka and Eddie. Toka was still snoring, and Eddie was slouched back, grinning, as she glanced at the huge blonde knot she tied around the chair. Cal wasn't all that surprised that Eddie had missed the unusual event. She wasn't the most observant of girls. He'd have to remain confused on his own. But then he'd been confused a lot of late. At least Kyle was helping to clear some of that confusion now. Is, um, is Victor on his way, Melinda? Yes, Cal. Six seconds the cybernetic woman replied, turning to smile at him again. Still not quite human, but close. Moments later, Victor entered the canteen. He was walking side by side with Kaya, deep in conversation. Bartoka, 
who slept on, and Eddie, who was busy staring at Kaya suspiciously, morning greetings were voiced by all. Cal didn't believe for a second that Eddie's glaring held any real malice. He suspected the girl had already accepted that Kaya was on their side, but was reluctant to lose face. He also suspected a little jealousy. How did you sleep? Kaya asked as she took a seat next to him. Fine, thanks, Cal lied. Victor sat himself on the other side of Kaya. Melinda talked to you yet, Cal? he asked eagerly. As a matter of fact, she has. The boy beamed. Did she come across as natural? Cal nodded. Very, he replied a little generously. Victor continued to beam. Kaya's been helping me. You should see the tech lab down there, all the kits and spare parts you could dream of. New stuff too. I can help myself, right, Kaya? She nodded. Anything you need. That's very generous, Kaya. She gave a little shrug. It's just good to have someone down there who really knows what they're doing. The boy's cheeks turned pink. Oh, bloody hell, Eddie suddenly snapped, glaring at them from the other side of the table. Don't tell me you bloody fancy her too, Vic. Shut up, Victor hissed, his face turning from pink to red. Cal looked at Kaya. Unlike Victor, she'd barely reacted to the comment at all, so much so that Cal thought her oblivious to Eddie's meaning. No arguing at the breakfast table. Jumper said without turning from the stove, else you'll be getting nothing but long-life protein blocks to chew on. The calm threat even managed to silence Eddie, but the peace was brief. Oh. Toka had finally woken and attempted to sit up. What the? He reached up with his hand to find the large, tangled knot of hair. First he looked shocked, then he grinned. Very bloody funny, Ed. Eddie's sour look had been replaced by silent racks of laughter adorned with an occasional uncontrolled snort. Yeah, laugh it up, Toker encouraged. Don't forget, though, little pipsqueak, you don't get one past old Toker without it coming back at you threefold. He was standing now. At least he was attempting to stand. The chair dangling from his head was forcing him to bend over as he desperately dug his fingers into the tangled knot. I can't undo it. I can't bloody untie it. Seriously, guys, I'm not joking. Okay, new rule, Ed. Not the hair in the future, okay? Or the face. Agreed? Eddie was too busy fighting for breath to answer. Cal looked at Kaya. Her eyes were bright with amusement. The lonely existence she'd endured had well and truly been disrupted, and she looked very glad of it. She turned his way, smiling. Realizing he was staring at her a little dumbly, he returned the smile. Never a dull moment. Jumper approached the table, a huge bowl of eggs in one hand and a tray filled with sausages in his other. Breakfast is served, he said with a wide grin. Leaning over the table, he placed the bowl and tray down, then walked over to the still struggling toker. Casually pulling a gleaming chef's knife from a sheaf on his hip, he flicked his wrist and sliced through toker's hair just above the knot, causing the chair to crash to the ground. Take a seat, toker. We don't want the eggs to get cold. Toka held the clump of shortened hair before his eyes, then turned to shake his head at Eddie. She was too busy wiping the tears from her face to notice. I was gonna ask Melinda for a haircut anyway, he mumbled, picking up his chair and sitting himself down. That would be my pleasure, Toka, Melinda replied. A little startled, Toka looked across the table at Melinda. Who the hell are you? It's Melinda, you dolt, Victor snapped. I know, but since when does she speak? Toka asked, looking around at everyone. I mean, to anyone other than her little man. I've been upgrading her programming, the boy replied with a sniff. Been meaning to do it for ages, but haven't had a decent enough tech lab. The military can be damn stingy with their gear. You programmed in any new moves? Eddie asked casually, reaching over and grabbing a handful of sausages. I mean, she's strong, but her fighting technique is a bit off, if you ask me. Guess I could teach her a few things before we get to facing these alien critter things. You're kidding. Victor snorted. Melinda's combat programming incorporates the best of 121 proven fighting disciplines. Uh-huh, so programming my fighting discipline and she'll have 122. Ha! <laughs> Toka blurted as he leaned over the table, scooped up a huge portion of scrambled eggs and dumped them on his plate. You haven't got a fighting discipline, Ed. You bloody make it up as you go along. Right, Eddie agreed. That's the best kind. It's instinct fighting. Better than squealing like a little girl and running away. Toka looked at her. An egg-filled fork paused partway to his mouth. Little girl? You do realize that you actually are a little girl, don't you? Eddie snorted. We'll soon see. 
When we face up to them neck critter things, then we'll see who's the biggest little girl. Toka put down his fork and grinned at her. You know, I wonder sometimes if even you know what the hell you're going on about, because sure as hell no one else does. I know what I'm saying, Eddie said defensively, then filled her cheeks with an entire sausage. Cow, when are we going to get to them neck critters? She mumbled between chews. Cal winced inwardly at the question. His caution motto had lasted all of one day. In his defense, he'd originally voted against heading to the planet C9. In fact, he'd argued caution for a full hour or near enough. But then Kaya had convinced him otherwise. Even if she'd been wrong, she'd still probably have convinced him with that smile of hers. But he had to concede. She had it right. Risking the lives of a few for the lives of many may be a cliché, but it didn't make it any less true. Of course, it didn't help when those few were your friends, your family. But it was a mammoth task. Surely the rescue of thousands required at least hundreds and not a few. Again, Kaya had shown her worth. She'd already proved the effectiveness of stealth over force, and she devised a plan that utilized the best of that stealth. There would be an inevitable point where force was needed, but the supporting numbers were already there. What better fighters than those fighting for their own freedom? All they had to do was give the imprisoned soldiers that fighting chance, something that the seven of them might just be able to pull off. We'll arrive at C9 by tomorrow, Eddie. Then at least a week of prep, right, Kaya? I think a week will be enough, she replied, looking a little worried, uncertain. Cal knew the feeling. He'd come up with a fair few military strategies himself over the years, and doubt was a constant partner. The bigger the plan, the bigger the worry and this plan certainly wasn't small. The plan is a good one, he said, hoping to take the edge off her unease, and if all goes well, we won't actually be facing the enemy at all. The prisoners will have that privilege. Eddie looked on the verge of protest, but instead pushed another sausage into her mouth. I think we need to come up with a name, Victor said after a moment. None of us know what to call these alien critter parasite thingies. Toka nodded. He's got a good point. Carcarians, ain't they? Toka shook his head. No, Ed, they're just drones. The poor buggers who ended up dead and hijacked, he said, scooping up another huge portion of eggs even though his plate was still half full. It's the evil little hitchers on their necks that need to be named. Eddie nodded thoughtfully, and after a moment of chewing, blurted out, Wormoids. No, slugoids. Toka screwed up his face. We'll save those as backups, I think. Don't see you coming up with any good ones. I think Kaya should name them, Toka said, turning to Kaya. What say you, Doc? You kind of discovered them after all. Eddie huffed, letting a few bits of chewed sausage fly free to land on the shiny white table. Kaya hesitated, then gave Cal a quick glance before saying, Actually, I think Eddie was pretty close with wormoids. There's a species called the hairworm, or Spinocordodes tellini, a parasite sometimes found in grasshoppers. The nasty little things like water, so they control the grasshopper and get it to drown itself. Grim, Toka muttered. Yes, Kaya agreed. There's also Paraponera clavata, an insidious fungus that takes control of the brains of ants. Huh, Parapona clavata, and you thought my names were bad, Eddie protested. He's up bad. No, it's fine, Toka, Kaya said quickly. Eddie's right, I don't have a creative flair for names. Too much dull science going on in my brain. How about puppeteers? Victor offered. Not bad, bro. Maybe a little bit on the cute side, though, eh? Cal? Huh? Cal tore his eyes from Kaya and looked around. Sorry, Tonka. Um, what? Tonka eyed him with an amused glint. Any ideas for names? Uh, no. Coming up blank, I'm afraid. Eddie scooped up some eggs. Vampoids. Tucker shook his head. You got a thing about the oids, don't you? Eddie dumped the eggs clumsily on her plate, then said, Insidions. Toka went silent for a moment. Huh, insidions, he said, his eyebrows raising. That's what I said, insidions, like Lady Doc over there said, insidious mushrooms or something. Insidions. Toka repeated the word, rolling his tongue around it. You know, I reckon that's actually... Well, that's actually pretty damn good, Ed. Insidions. Yeah, I like it. Eddie grinned, then shrugged nonchalantly. What thinks the rest of you? Toka said, looking around the table. Sounds fitting to me, Kai said. 
The unanimous nodding seemed to settle it. Baffled, Cal watched Toker and Eddie consume the last two sausages. He didn't doubt the two of them were way beyond full, but just like most things, eating had turned into a competition between the pair. Letting out a contented sigh, he stood up and reached over to take the bowl of eggs, now scraped clean. Melinda stood. Please allow me, Cal. Cal smiled and nodded his thanks as the cybernetic woman reached over and picked up the empty bowl and sausage tray. Melinda had included herself numerous times in the various conversations over breakfast, but it was still taking him by surprise whenever she spoke. Kaya passed her plate along. Jumper, I think that was the best meal I've had since, well, ever. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Jumper said with a broad smile. A fit, healthy young woman like yourself can't live on rehydrated noodles alone, especially with a scientific brain to feed. Isn't that right, Victor? The boy, who was still nibbling on a sausage, quietly nodded in agreement. I've given cooking a pretty good try in the past, but it's not really my forte, I'm afraid. Well, I'm here to cook for you now. We can't have you starved of nutrients. In fact, I'm eager, if you don't mind, that is, to dig into that huge collection of Alvorian herbs. I couldn't help noticing the culinary section in the botany lab. I imagine there's some real gems in there. I don't mind at all. You'd be wise to stick to the blue vials, though. We found some pretty strange herbs on Alvor that have odd effects on the body. Yes, I've tried some myself back on Mars, Jumper said with a chuckle. Well, if you don't mind, I think I might go poke around in a few now. Gladdened by his old friend's enthusiasm, Cal watched as he briskly made his way out of the canteen. He'll be like a kid in a candy shop sifting through all those herbs. Kaya smiled, then shook her head. How are they all so calm and relaxed? I mean with what we're about to face. They're a brave bunch. I wish I could feel braver. I wish I could relax. Cal smiled. Trust me, you are relaxed. I've seen battle-hardened soldiers biting their nails when there's no nails left to bite before a mission. You'll be fine. Besides, if all goes to plan, those insidions won't even know we're there until it's too late for them. There's a lot riding on my plan, Cal. Makes me nervous. After all, I'm hardly a military strategist. You could be. It's a damn good plan. He wished he could take some of her burden. But the fact was, it was 100% her plan. If it makes you feel better, we'll double and triple check each step together. I'd really appreciate that, she said, pushing away from the table and getting to her feet. Now? he asked, looking up at her with a grin. She nodded. Yes, please. Last night it was all talk. Maybe it's time I actually showed you a few things. Cal's grin widened. I thought you'd never ask. The Aurelian's hangar was a stark contrast to the sleek appearance of the rest of the ship. It was all blocks of unpolished metal, grated floors and heavy launch doors built for practicality rather than style. Bar a few particularly advanced-looking cranes and loaders, the hangar itself didn't appear much different than any other. As well as the Star Splinter, there were three other ships present two simple dropships, and a very small craft that Cal didn't recognize. With Kaya by his side, they strolled towards the star splinter. As he neared, he couldn't help but let out a long, impressed whistle. Kaya, this is incredible. You did all this yourself? Yes. Unfortunately, I didn't have much choice. Victor and Melinda have helped a lot over the past couple of days, though. Sitting neatly in front of the Star Splinter's loading ramp were rows upon rows of large crates, each one filled to the brim with handheld weaponry. Cal could see everything from slimline pistols to big ten-click pulse blasters. Looming tall behind the crates were masses of multi-level racks holding meticulously neat rows of syringes, each containing a bright green substance. Neither the racks nor the crates held Cal's attention for long, however. Instead, his eyes were drawn to a tall figure standing, statue still next to the loading ramp, a fully grown Carcarian. Cal's heart felt as though it took a momentary pause. He gestured towards the alien figure. I assume that fellow is the infiltrator, not one of your drones escaped from its cage. Sorry, I forgot to warn you about that. Yes, that's the infiltrator, she assured him as she walked towards the tall, menacing figure. Glad to hear it, he replied his heart seeming to start up again and indulging in a couple of extra beats. His mind felt so overstuffed that he'd almost forgotten this particular element of Kaya's plan. 
As he approached, the realism of the Karkarian astounded him. But then it stood to reason that if a synthetic combat soldier could be made to look human, the same technology could be used to create a realistic synthetic Karkarian. What do you think? Kaya asked. Will it pass as one of the enemy? And better, the plan will go to hell if it doesn't. He nodded. It certainly fooled me. And if the plan goes to hell, all these rifles will make damn expensive clubs. During her observations of the enemy, Kaya had discovered the reason for the military's failure to put up any sort of fight. A disruptor signal emanating from the Insidion vessel that rendered pulse weaponry inert. Unfortunately, pulse-based weapons were a clear favorite of the military, from the huge starship cannons to simple pistols. Without a weapon, what sort of fight could a human put up against a Karkarian drone? Cal could scarcely believe the simplicity of it. One single disrupting signal becoming the ultimate weapon, devastating in its effect. Fortunately, Kaya had managed to pinpoint the signal's source. Unfortunately, that source was deep inside the Insidion vessel. Kaya let out a long breath. Well, it better fool them. If we don't manage to disable that signal, she shook her head. There's so many unknown elements. Cal silently agreed. It was most definitely the riskiest part of the plan, but also the most crucial. Moving around the synthetic alien, he peered closely at the black lump attached to the back of its neck. The Insidion looks real, too. Suitably slug-like. Kaya frowned. To be honest, both the Karkarian and the Insidion looked pretty awful before you all arrived on the scene. Constructing the chassis was fairly easy. It's just bigger than the norm. The equipment down in the tech lab practically built it for me. The musculature and the flesh, though. My attempts were pretty laughable. It wouldn't have even gotten close to the Insidion vessel, let alone inside it. Fortunately, your young friend Victor is nothing short of a genius. He's been working non-stop since I told him what I had planned. Still staring at the synthetic Karkarian, Cal nodded in agreement. He's a good lad. Brave, too. He'd have to be to hang around with you lot, she said with a brief laugh. He's also upgraded the cloaking technology on the Star Splinter with a ghosting net system. It'll be as undetectable as the Aurelian. I must say, Kaya, this really is pretty damn impressive considering the amount of time you've had. I just hope I'm not missing anything. Cal shook his head. Even the best laid plans have weak points. If problems arise, we'll adapt. There's only so much planning you can do. The rest is left to chance. He shot her his best lopsided grin. Don't worry. We'll pull it off. I hope so. I can't stop thinking about all those people held captive. It looked like hell down on that planet, Cal. Even if we can only save some of them, we've got to do it, right? Kaya looked at him with an expression that longed for reassurance. We're doing the right thing, and the sooner we do it, the better. His words were full of confidence that he didn't really feel. But Kaya needed and deserved the reassurance. He wanted to comfort her. He wanted to take her in his arms. But then, in all honesty, he'd been wanting to do that since he'd seen her emerge from that pool. Seeing her relax a little, he turned to the crates. Quite the collection. Yes, we had a few guns on board, but the majority I salvaged from one of the drifting starships. It was pretty spooky, Cal, walking around on a completely empty ship of that size, especially when all the lights and equipment had been left on. Imagine just leaving them to drift among the moons like junk. It's as if they're collecting them, like some damn hobby. Cal nodded. Or trophies. Cocky bastards, Kaya said angrily. Cal turned to her with raised eyebrows and a grin. Cocky bastards? Her anger quickly dissipated. Sorry, just venting, she said with an embarrassed smile. It's frustrating, though. If only they'd invaded us twenty years down the line, ten even, then they'd have had far less reason to be cocky. We've got some incredible technology here. Stuff that would have given us the chance to put up one hell of a fight. The Aurelian's ghosting net has proved that, not to mention all the biological agents we've discovered on Alvor. We just needed more time. Time to implement all this stuff into our military. Cal put a hand on her shoulder. Don't worry. The fight hasn't even begun yet. If we, when we, pull off your plan, that will be the start. These Insidians are going to find out a thing or two about guerrilla warfare. And I wouldn't worry about their cockiness. It's a blessing. From everything you've told me, it's because of their arrogance that you've already found a way in. They're overconfident. They've left gaps wide open. Cal turned and looked over to the thousands of syringes lying neatly in the racks. 
The Alvorian serum you told us about, he asked, nodding at the racks. Kai's face brightened, inside every single syringe. Cal stared at the multitude of little bright green tubes. This is what he'd been itching to see. This was the part of Kaya's plan that had kept him most intrigued through the night. As they made their way over, he could see pride in her expression. Unlike the clunky weaponry in the crates, the contents of these syringes well and truly fell within her area of expertise. This was her arena. It's known as XN 4283P61. Huh. Kaya smiled. One of the technicians began calling it XL, so maybe we're better off sticking to that. It's extracted from one of Alvor's deep sea algaes. It'll make us stronger. And faster. You'll heal far more rapidly, too. Sounds... well, it sounds pretty damn wonderful. Kaya smiled again, and Cal didn't miss the mischievous glint in her eye. Every new expression only made him want her more. You want to try one? Cal shrugged, hit by a wave of unexpected nerves. Now? Of course. He shrugged again, trying to look calm. Why not? Kaya nodded her approval, and not giving him a chance to change his mind, plucked one of the syringes from the nearest rack and passed it to him. How long does it take to kick in? He asked, even though he already knew the answer. He'd seen Kaya use it only moments after he first laid his eyes on her in the lab. It's fairly instant. Then the effects will eventually start to fade after about three or four hours. That long? He held the little glass tube up to the light. It's, um, it's an interesting color, he said, still attempting to look and sound nonchalant. It's okay, Cal. It won't hurt, and it certainly won't do you any harm. Quite the opposite, in fact. Cal laughed. What's funny? Nothing, he answered with a shake of his head. It's just that you seem to be able to see straight through my bravado. I'm usually pretty good at hiding my nerves. Kaya's lips curled in amusement. Don't worry. Your record's still intact. It was more of an educated guess. The stuff is bright green. Who the hell wouldn't be nervous? Cal twiddled the syringe in one hand and used the other to rub his jaw. I still remember those damn muscle stim drugs they made us test in the military. I thought I was going to explode with adrenaline overload. To be honest, I wasn't overly keen on the experience. Kaya shook her head. Those stims relied on sloppy science, Cal. They concentrated only on the effects without a moment's thought for the consequences. I can assure you there's nothing that your body will benefit from more than the liquid in these syringes. Something like the black pool. Consider it a close relation, a kind of bigger brother. Okay, I'm sold. Taking a deep breath, he put the syringe against his neck, then took another breath and pressed the button. The effect was immediate. A warmth spread out from the injection point and suffused through his entire body, seeping into every muscle. Pure, liquid energy. He grinned uncontrollably, and as the warmth faded, he felt his head become clearer than it had been his entire life. His thinking suddenly felt sharper and more focused, all mental debris purged. My God, this is incredible. He looked at Kaya wide-eyed, feeling sure his grin must be stretching from ear to ear. It felt as though his body were a solar-powered machine that had been moved from a lifetime under cloud into dazzling sunshine. Kaya was beaming back at him, her eyes full of knowing. Looking down, he experimentally began to move his arms and legs. Every muscle felt relaxed, but at the same time spring-loaded, charged up. He looked at his hand and wiggled his fingers, then clenched his fist, feeling incredible power within the grip. It was as if his tendons were enhanced by cybernetics. I feel I could lift a horse. Kaya laughed, obviously amused by the look on his face. You probably could. That crate full of guns looks pretty heavy, wouldn't you say? She said, indicating the crate to his left. Cal grinned and moved over to the nearest corner of the container. It was at least three square meters, and with the amount of weapons loaded in it, probably weighed a good eight or nine hundred pounds. Feeling like a little kid trying out a pair of hover boots for the first time, he grasped the corner and couldn't help but laugh out loud as he easily tilted the huge box. I'd say that right now your strength isn't all that far off that of a fully grown male Carcarian, and you're possibly a touch faster. That's good to know, he replied as he slowly lowered the crate to the floor. Kaya shook her head. Of course, Carcarians have lethal claws, and their flesh and skin is a hell of a lot tougher. Unless you had a weapon, I'm afraid my money would still be on them if it came to a fist fight. 
Well, let's hope that it doesn't come to that. Also, be aware that your body can be a little too fragile for its newfound strength. The Excel Serum does seem to toughen up the skin and harden the bones after long-term use, but you can still do yourself damage. For instance, you'll now have the strength to crush certain hard objects in your hand, but your skin and flesh wouldn't enjoy the experience. I see your point. That caution motto of yours might be worth remembering, she said, her mischievous glint returning. God, she's beautiful. What are you thinking? I, um, how long can I hold my breath? She gave a little laugh. Long enough to dive to the bottom of the healing pool for a time? He nodded, and an image of her pale face and swirling hair surrounded by blackness flashed through his mind. A dream. Their eyes met and lingered. We're having a moment, he thought, feeling a little mesmerized by the blue of her eyes and the curve of her smile. He'd known beautiful women in his time, but there was much more to this attraction, a blend of emotions unlike any he'd experienced before. Eventually, those beautiful eyes looked down, and Kaya's smile became almost shy. Definitely a moment. Suddenly feeling a little shy himself, Cal looked about the hangar. Now what are you thinking? Cal laughed. Haven't you found a serum to help you read minds? Not yet, but you never know. He continued to look about the hangar. I was actually trying to think of a good way of testing this speed that you mentioned. Oh, I could help with that, Kaya said, and plucked out another syringe from the rack. Pressing it to her neck, she gave him another mischievous look as the bright liquid disappeared from the tiny glass tube. Think you can catch me? She asked, and barely gave him a chance to laugh before spinning on the spot and vaulting easily over one of the weaponry crates to run towards the hangar's exit. Deciding to leave the crate vaulting until he'd gotten a little more used to his newfound strength, Cal skirted around it and took off at a speed that threatened to make the ridiculous grin on his face a permanent feature. Part 4 Chapter 33 C9 Cal stood alone in the center of the Aurelian's observation deck. Lost in thought, he twiddled a control wand between his fingers and stared through the huge exterior viewing panel that stretched out a good twenty-five feet to his left and right. Directly in the center of that viewing panel, and amid the array of distant stars, was the Karkarian planet of C-9. Despite the effectiveness of the Aurelian's ghosting net systems, he and Kaya had decided not to get any closer than necessary, and from this distance, the planet appeared little more than a blip. Just as he had every day for the last week, Cal raised the control wand and activated the zoom capabilities of the smart glass until the planet filled the viewing panel. The planet was a black orb, broken up by veins of red magma and streaks of grey ash cloud. Its tectonic plates were in a constant extreme state of convergence and divergence, resulting in an extremely unstable planet. The only vegetation that managed to thrive was a thick, vine-like plant that tightly wound its way around the entire landscape, as if desperately holding it together. There were also huge oceans made fierce by the earthquakes and as dark as the rocks they pounded against. Cal manipulated the control wand and brought up a view of the planet's moon cluster. Zooming in further still, he focused on the collection of drifting military starships. Kaya was right in her estimations. The ships seen here only represented about a third of what had once been the Federation's military fleet. Cal could only speculate as to what had happened to the rest, perhaps in a similar state, drifting aimlessly around some other conquered planet. He focused in on the starship that Kaya had chosen to execute the plan. All appeared normal. It was distressing that only one of the ships would be needed to transport the surviving prisoners. The numbers within the camp were only a fraction of those that would once have crewed that portion of the fleet. It seemed only the very strongest had survived, or perhaps the enemy was simply killing at random. Such thoughts only served to strengthen Cal's resolve that time was of the essence. Bringing up the view of the planet's surface, he activated the preset close-up of the prison camp. True to historical form, the invaders hadn't been satisfied keeping their prisoners idle. The expanse of black rock within the boundaries of the camp's force field had been turned into a mine of sorts. Cal didn't imagine for a second that these insidions needed humans armed with crude handheld machinery to excavate the rock. Such work could be done in a fraction of the time with basic mining drones. 
Subjecting them to such unnecessary slave labor was more evidence that these alien invaders were sadistic to their core. Fear and despair were effective weapons, and it seemed the Insidions knew it only too well. The fact that they'd begun their invasion by destroying an entire planet only served to strengthen this theory. Perhaps the disabling of long-range communications was further proof, a calculated decision that caused fearful rumors to escalate and inevitable chaos to ensue. Cal studied the image. And though it wasn't easy to see from this bird's-eye view, every one of the prisoners appeared strong and able. He allowed himself a humorless smile. When the time came, those men and women would get the opportunity to put up one hell of a fight, a fight they'd been denied when the enemy had disabled their weapons. Despite his anxieties, he couldn't help but look forward to that part of the plan. Shifting the view, Cal homed in on the Insidion base. Five huge gleaming blocks sat in a circular pattern upon the dark landscape. When Kaya had last viewed the planet, those blocks had made up one monstrous vessel, quite possibly the very one that had destroyed Earth. Now, that vessel had broken apart, perhaps to make a more effective base, the circumference of which dwarfed even the prison camp. There was a pale line connecting the two. It was a massive conveyor belt ten times wider than the average hover track, which was slowly transporting cut rock into the center of the alien's base. Once there, unmanned machines were manipulating it further and constructing structures. Cal peered at the image. Were they buildings? Were the invaders building a home? Hey, that's a good look for you, Cali boy. Cal used the control wand to brighten the overhead lighting and turned to see Toka, Eddie, and Jumper entering the observation deck via an elevator that had emerged from the ceiling. The three of them had been loading the multitude of crates containing handheld weapons into the Star Splinter's cargo hold. He shot them a grin, which they probably couldn't even see under the big, shaggy beard he had seamlessly stuck to his chin. Kaya and Victor had somehow managed to make the beard in the lab. He didn't like to think what materials they'd used. He was also wearing a military uniform salvaged from one of the starships. He'd made good use of the rock dust and dirt samples in the biology lab to make the uniform suitably filthy, before proceeding to tear it ragged. Think it'll do the job? he asked, holding his arms out and doing a 360 turn. You look like crap, Eddie said, wrinkling up her nose. The girl's mood still hadn't improved. I'll take that as a yes. Token nodded. Yep, reckon you'll blend right in. Um, I'm not too sure, Jumper said, frowning as he approached. The beard's nice and bushy, but it really is pretty damn filthy in that prison camp. You don't think I've made it dirty enough? Cal asked, looking down at himself. Sure, the uniform's dirty enough, but, um... Jumper rubbed his fingers into a particularly heavy patch of grimy black rock dust on Cal's shoulder and smeared it across his face. There. Perfect. Eddie interrupted her bad mood with a quick snort of a laugh. Nice touch, J-Man, Toka said, walking over and giving Jumper a slap on the shoulder. So, the doc and her little skinny sidekick are all ready for you up there, Cal. You really sure you want to risk it? It's not too late to go with the synthetic Kalkarian option, Jumper added. Cal shook his head. Those people down there need a face they can trust, one without fangs. He had run through Kaya's plan countless times in his head, and despite a few weak spots, couldn't fault it. All of those weak spots were unavoidable, except perhaps one. To set the plan in motion, contact had to be made with the prisoners, their trust gained and their cooperation agreed. Kaya's original plan had been to send down the cybernetic Karkarian and use it to infiltrate the camp unnoticed. The body of the infiltrator could be controlled within a specially designed sync sphere on board the Aurelian and used as an avatar to communicate with the prisoners. Cal was unconvinced, however, that they would give their full trust to one who looked exactly like their captors. Explaining the situation and convincing them would take a great deal of time, and the more time they took, the more likely they'd be discovered. Also, he wasn't keen to risk the infiltrator. They were going to need it later in the plan. After a fair amount of discussion and reluctance, he'd convinced them that venturing into the camp himself was a better option. Okay, let's get this plan underway, he said with a cheery confidence that he suspected, with the possible exception of Eddie, wasn't fooling anyone. Cal had seen the craft briefly on his first visit to the hangar, but hadn't taken the time to study it closely. 
He'd never seen such a small, weird-looking ship. Standing a mere ten feet high and being only four feet in width and depth, the Mosquito was most definitely a one-man craft. True to its name, it was bug-like in design, all bubble curves of smooth, dark metal. The tiny craft had been designed for the unique purpose of sneaking up on an enemy ship and scanning for the weakest area of its hull where it would attach itself. It would then utilize an incredibly powerful piercing needle to punch through the ship's outer hull, allowing thousands of nanothreads to wriggle their way in and begin extracting information from the ship's systems or steal power from its energy reserves all the while going unnoticed. The Mosquito had not gone into production before the invasion had hit. In fact, the ship that Cal was about to climb into was really only a concept model. Kaya assured him, however, that the little craft had been tested to the hilt and had already been put to use on numerous occasions. It was the perfect ship for the job. The entire gang, Kaya included, was now huddled around the ship, looking a little on edge, all except Eddie, who just looked irritable. You sure I can't fit in there with you, Cal? What if you need backup? It's okay, Eddie. I appreciate the offer, but I'll be down and back again in no time. The enemy will be none the wiser. It should only take about half an hour for you to reach the surface, Kaya said as Cal climbed into the snug standing cockpit. You won't have to do a thing, Victor assured him. I programmed it to land behind a big bunch of rocks close to the northern end of the camp. There's plenty of cover once you leave the ship's cloaking net. Cal nodded as numerous smart straps snaked their way around him and secured him in place. Victor held out his hand. Here, Cal. A small cube sat on his open palm. Cal took the cube and gave it a brief study. It was crafted from a copper-like metal, and he was amused to see the words Little Lockpick engraved into its topside. Smaller than I thought. It seemed that on this mission, size really wasn't everything. It's packed full of nanothreads, Victor explained. Before you enter the prison camp, just place it in any one of those posts emitting the energy force field. Don't forget to pick it up again on your way back, though. By then it'll have learned the best way to disable it. Cal smiled at the boy's confidence and placed the cube in his pocket. Speaking of the force field, I think you'll be needing these, Jumper said as he brought over two large discs. They were made of black metal, not much more than an inch thick and about two feet in circumference. Two pop platforms as requested. He slid them into the little space that remained at Cal's feet. Thanks, Cal replied, suddenly wishing he'd spent a little more time practicing with them. And these? Kaya said as she passed him a few syringes filled with the bright green XL serum. Cal took them with a grin. Feels like Christmas. Not much of a place to spend Christmas, Kaya replied. Cal tried to shrug, but the smart straps denied him the motion. Perhaps we'll have better luck next year. Kaya smiled. One other thing. I've been going through the SS recordings. SS? Toker asked. Don't interrupt, idiot, Victor snapped. Hey, bright spark, we're not all tech geeks. Kaya turned to the disgruntled Toker. Sound snatcher recordings. It's similar to a visual function on smart glass, but it's for audio instead of visuals. I've been collecting sound samples from the prison camp. You've discovered something? Cal asked. Yes, it might be of help. A man's name keeps cropping up in conversations. It seems the other prisoners consider him a leader. It might be worthwhile trying to seek him out. Sounds sensible. He's called Decker. Cal's eyes went wide, a wave of hope flooding through him. Admiral James Decker? No, I don't think so. As far as I can gather, his name is Lawrence. Lawrence Decker. Cal's heart sank, the flood of hope instantly draining away. Lawrence Decker? You're sure? Pretty sure. You know him. Cal nodded, trying to hide his disappointment. A leader. The situation must be more desperate than he thought. The name keeps coming up time and time again. It sounds as though they really look up to him. Surely that couldn't be right. Lawrence Decker? The man was an incompetent idiot, not to mention a bona fide coward. If it had been his father. Okay, thanks, Kai. I'll find him. He dug his fingers into the fake beard and scratched. So, I guess it's time to blast me out of the cannon. Kaya took a deep breath and gave him a confident smile. She was clearly doing her best to hide her nerves, and Cal was grateful for her efforts. We'll keep track of you visually and listen in with the sound snatcher as best we can. Cal nodded. They had agreed to forego any short-range communications at this point to minimize the risk of detection. 
Toker casually ran a hand through his blonde hair. We'll see you soon, Cali boy. Yeah, kick some ass, Cal, Eddie added. Hopefully I won't need to. As the doors to the mosquito slid closed, Cal stared at his friends, old and new. Victor wore a nervous smile that made him look younger than ever. Melinda stood tall behind him, a protective hand on his skinny shoulder. She seemed more human with each passing day. The ever-optimistic Toker was grinning with an enthusiastic thumbs up, while Eddie leaned against him as if he were merely a sturdy post. As always, the girl looked tough and at the same time incredibly fragile. Next to them stood Jumper, his oldest friend, steady as a rock and expression unreadable. And then there was Kaya, wearing a gentle smile full of encouragement and eyes bright with hope. The mosquito's doors sealed shut, and the tiny craft was maneuvered toward the airlock. It was about to be blasted down to an ominous prison planet occupied by an even more ominous alien race. Strange, then, that in that moment, he truly felt like a blessed man. Chapter 34 Eye Contact With the dim lights lazily blinking around him, Cal found himself almost cozy within the mosquito's tiny cockpit. The soft hum of the engines was calming, and the flight was smooth. Only one small circular viewing panel graced the craft's compact hull, and through it, Cal could see a spinning array of distant stars. A cold vastness of deep space through which he slipped alone, cocooned in a small bubble of metal and glass. He knew the experience should be frightening, terrifying even, but it wasn't. He had many fears, but this wasn't one of them. It never had been. He closed his eyes and almost reveled in the moment of peace. Unfortunately, the peace was short-lived, as the entry into C-9's atmosphere caused the little craft to shake with increasing violence, an effect it seemed could never be avoided no matter how advanced the ship. When the shaking finally stopped, Cal took his cue to pull out one of the little glass syringes. He tried the XL serum many times now, and as always, its effect was close to instant. Warm, liquid energy, strengthening his muscles and focusing his mind. A perfect, God-given fuel. Cal felt the ship touch down on the planet's surface. He took a moment to check his positioning on the cockpit screen, then, releasing his restraining smart straps, leaned forward to have a good old-fashioned look out of the window. Even during the daylight hours, C-9 was a dark planet. Orange and red skies filled with streaks of volcanic ash clouds. As the little craft's doors bowed open, he was hit by a blast of hot, sulfur-infused air. Fitting, considering that the first thing his eyes focused on was the bright red magma of a distant spewing volcano. Wasting little time, he snatched up the two pop platforms and maneuvered from the cockpit to step down onto the hard, jagged ground. The hot air swirled about him random in its strength and direction, as if confused by its purpose. Turning once to check the mosquito's doors had closed behind him and that the craft was completely cloaked, Cal set off at a run. Thanks to the XL, he was swift and confident over the rough terrain, the two pop platforms feeling practically weightless tucked under his arm. Huge splinters of rock jutted out of the ground ahead of him like giant black spearheads, which, as Victor had promised, offered him good cover as he sped towards the prison camp. As the camp came into view, he cracked a brief smile. The invaders had obviously reached a very high level of technological advancement, but mistakes were becoming more and more evident. The blue glow that emanated from the force field encircling the camp served no purpose other than to give those who might want to escape the benefit of the force field's exact size and shape. Like the huge gleaming ships that sat in the distance, it was nothing more than a showy spectacle of their power and dominance. From his elevated position, Cal could see the countless human prisoners within the boundaries of the force field. Most were chipping away at the rock with crude mechanical tools and machinery, while a handful of Karkarian drones stalked amongst them, keeping a watchful eye. The mining machinery was definitely human by design, probably taken from one of the less advanced fringe space mining colonies. Just as he'd seen from the Aurelian's observation deck, nearly all the activity within the camp was concentrated in its center while the areas near the ridiculous glowing force field remained blessedly unoccupied. The chances of entering the camp unseen were looking good. Spying the best spot for using the pop platforms, he set off again at a run. 
As he neared the blue glowing barrier, which rose approximately twenty feet above him, Cal heard dumping pulse drills and screeching disc sores. The noise reminded him that he wasn't all that far from the activity. Fortunately, the force field was transparent enough to reveal a scattering of tall rocks on the other side that offered a good amount of cover. The rocks had been one of two reasons for picking this particular spot, the second being that it put him in front of the tall poles responsible for emitting the force field. Reaching into his pocket, he pulled out Victor's little lockpick and touched it to the pole's base. He hoped the boy's confidence in the little cube was justified. Their plan would break apart if the force field remained up. Setting one of the pop platforms on the ground six feet from the barrier, Cal stood on it and waited a few moments for it to calibrate his weight, topography of the ground, and the size of the force field itself. He doubted the machine would have much luck in reading the random gusts of wind, but nothing could be done about that now. Hugging the second pop platform to his chest, he crouched down and waited for the tiny green light to indicate that he was good to go. With the power of the XL serum coursing through his legs, he almost felt the pop platform wasn't necessary. Perhaps an unrealistic expectation, but his enhanced muscles would at least make for a far easier and less painful landing. After one last check that no one was in view, Cal thrust himself upward. Reading the pressure applied through his feet, the pop platform added just enough aid at just the right angle to launch him up and over the twenty-foot barrier. Still holding the second pop platform to his chest, he performed a single neat somersault, clearing the apex of the barrier by a good few feet before the inevitable fall. Despite nailing the landing, the sharp rocks cut deep into his knuckles and right knee. Ignoring the pain, he moved quickly to conceal the second pot platform. Satisfied he'd be able to find it again even in a hurry, he adopted his best casual stroll and headed towards the center of the camp. Cal didn't have far to walk before he saw his first prisoners, ten men and three women. They were busily excavating a five-meter-wide trench, most of them operating disc saws, while the remaining few manipulated clasper cranes to hoist the blocks of cut stone. He was relieved to see that they all looked healthy, well-fed and strong. He was also glad to see he hadn't overcooked the ragged uniform and the beard. As he neared the busy group, Cal became aware of a form moving in his peripheral vision, tall and dark against orange horizon. Forcing himself not to snap his head around, Cal attempted to retain his casual manner as he approached the group. Without missing a step, he strode directly up to one of the clasper arms of the nearest crane and began physically checking the support straps wrapped around a newly cut block of stone. The dark form was growing larger in the corner of his eye. He had no doubt it was a Karkarian drone. He also had the distinct feeling that it was heading straight towards him. He looked at the prisoners. Despite one or two brief glances in his direction, they were paying him little attention. Either he'd succeeded in doing nothing particularly unusual, or they were being quick not to make his situation worse. Risking a casual glance, Cal confirmed his fears. The drone was heading straight for him. His heart began to thump, quicker and harder with each beat. Had he done something wrong? Something to make him stand out from the crowd? Or was he just paranoid? He had studied the bird's eye view of the camp for many hours from the Aurelian and had discerned no particular patterns or organized teams within the mine. On the contrary, the prisoners seemed scattered rather haphazardly. What the hell am I doing wrong? With the XL bolstering his system, Cal knew he at least had a chance of defending himself, but it wasn't just his own life at stake, not by a long shot. He had a distinct feeling that the drone had come to a halt just a few meters behind him. He could feel its icy gaze boring into his back. Doing his best to act unawares, he continued to tug at the crane straps. Helping to maneuver the block onto the back of a hover crate, he even decided to shout out a few instructions to the machine's operator. A couple of the other prisoners were looking at him now, anxiety clear on their faces. What the hell? He reached up and checked his beard. Still in place. What was he doing wrong? Had he screwed up already? but surely if the game was up he'd be feeling the force of those clawed fists by now. Seeming to attempt the same casual indifference as Cal himself, one of the female prisoners moved around the hover crate until she stood next to him. What the hell are you doing? She rasped under her breath. Good bloody question. He shot her a brief, confused look. Turn around and look it in the eye, damn it. Look it in the eye. Cal looked at the woman and took in the cocktail of emotions on her grubby face. Fear, 
desperation and more than a hint of bewilderment. Giving one last hard tug on one of the crane straps, he gave his right shoulder a stretch, looking behind him as he did so. Then he feigned a double take. The drone was indeed only a few meters behind him, standing statue still, its eyes directed at nobody but him. A chill ran down his spine. Deciding to trust the woman's advice, he turned and forced himself to return the creature's stare. His heart continued to hammer against his chest as the Carcarian's pale, unblinking eyes remained locked onto his. For a worrying moment, he considered whether these insidions somehow had the ability to read minds. Fortunately, his seemingly unread mind was soon put at ease when, instead of lunging forward to tear his head off, the drone simply snarled in what might have even been some sort of smile and turned its attentions on another distant group of prisoners. Cal could just about make out the leech-like insidion attached to the back of its neck as it strode away. What the hell were you thinking? Cal turned to the voice. The woman who'd offered him the advice was glaring at him in disbelief and annoyance. He raised an eyebrow. I wasn't aware that a staring contest was necessary. Thanks for the tip. The woman's brow creased. You've been hiding under one of those bloody great rocks or something? Something. What was that about, anyway, the eyeballing? The woman shook her head and turned back to the crane strap that she'd been unfastening. Most think it's their way of weeding out rebels. They study your eyes like some kind of lie detector. I guess you passed. God only knows how, though. Even I can see you're up to something. I need to find someone. Uh-huh. And who would that be? Decker. Lawrence Decker. Cal saw the corners of the woman's mouth twitch in response. A little smile quickly brought under control and replaced by a frown. Cal wondered whether the smile was one of respect and admiration towards the man, or simply amusement at his idiocy. He hoped to God that it was the former, but couldn't help but suspect the man was still an idiot. What business do you have with Decker? I have information he'll want to hear. What makes you think he'll want to hear it? Cal sighed, getting a little annoyed himself. I don't think I know. He turned his green eyes on the woman, his expression stern. It was a look he'd used many times in the past to subdue the more troublesome soldiers under his command. On occasion, it worked. I'm in a bit of a hurry here. Are you going to tell me or not? Fortunately, she seemed to shrink a little under his gaze. Over there, she said reluctantly, turning and raising an arm. Head over the ridge till you get to the big mining belt that carries the cut rocks out of the camp. Decker will be at its loading end, somewhere near the engine room. Cal nodded his thanks and set off without another word. He saw only two other Carcarian drones by the time he arrived at the mining belt. As luck would have it, both were busy intimidating other prisoners. Here, in the very center of the camp, many of the other prisoners were walking about solo, which thankfully made him far less conspicuous. Approaching the engine room, he saw a large group bunched around the loading end of the belt, busily operating the cranes. He made his way over. I'm looking for Lawrence Decker. Can anyone help me out? He asked no one in particular. Only one of them took any notice. A big, burly man with thick, hairy forearms and hands black with grime. I don't recognize you, friend, the man said, more as a question than a statement. I'm a new arrival. The big man looked a little confused, but nodded. Hang on here for a moment, he said, before heading to the engine room. Thankfully, it wasn't long before he reappeared. Another man was by his side. He was of average height, slim but well-muscled, and just like every other man on the planet, was heavily bearded. The slim man continued forward alone and came to stand before Cal, looking perplexed, an expression that quickly turned into wide-eyed disbelief. Cal sighed, frustrated. I'm trying to find Lawrence Decker, he said, failing to hide the exasperation in his voice. The man's shocked expression morphed into a wide smile. Then he laughed out loud, making Cal feel like the butt of some idiotic joke. What's the matter, Callum? You don't recognize me with all my teeth? Cal's brow creased for a moment before his eyebrows shot up in surprise. Holy shit. Decker. Cal braced himself as the man moved closer. After all, if this was Decker, he'd knock the man's tooth out, and people had a habit of holding onto things like that. Suddenly the man was lurching forward and wrapping his wiry, muscled arms around him. 
Cal was about to counterattack by twisting and slamming him face first into the hard ground, but then realized he was being embraced. Damn, Callum, it's good to see you. Well, thanks, Cal replied, his bewildered tone not nearly doing justice to his confusion. Eventually, Decker released him and stepped back to regard him intently. Come with me. We've got a hell of a lot to talk about. Still bewildered, Cal nodded. No shit. Chapter 35 The Last Tribe Callum Bloody Harper. What the hell were the chances? Lawrence's mind was reeling as he swiftly made his way down the steep passageway. The little pouch of glowworms he held only penetrated the inky darkness enough to illuminate his next two strides and no more. Despite the lack of light, he strode with a brisk, assured confidence. He'd been down the passageway countless times now, enough to navigate it blind if need be. Of all the individuals that could have turned up, life certainly had a peculiar synchronicity at times. His arrival was the little miracle Lawrence had been waiting for. He came to a halt and turned to face the smooth black wall of the passage. Then he walked straight through it. Identifying the near invisible entrances had been a challenge for Lawrence at the beginning, but now it was strangely easy. Striding into a large cavern, he took a moment until his eyes adjusted before having a good look around. The space was lit by countless glowworm pouches, far larger than the one he held, and most radiated an orange glow that gave off a certain warmth. Under that glow were hundreds of carcarians, their muscled forms scattered throughout the huge space. None of them paid him much attention. They were well used to his visits by now. As he walked further in, Lawrence saw young carcarians, smaller in stature than most humans, leaping from high ledges and chasing each other around the sharp, jutting rocks. Most of the adults were busily performing tasks, some crafting crude weapons out of the very rock that surrounded them while others manipulated bundles of the local weed-like substance. Rather than using it for sustenance, as he'd once been forced to do, the Carcarians were weaving the weed into rope and clothing. As far as food went, Lawrence had only ever seen them feast on massive reptilian carcasses that hung at the far side of the cavern. Not one scrap was wasted, from bones to the hide to the eyeballs. They even consumed the mushy, multicoloured contents of the great beast's stomachs. Indeed, the half-digested pulp seemed to be considered a delicacy, one that Lawrence was running out of excuses to turn down. With a grin, Lawrence thought of his first visit to the cavern. His friend Tarquintin Matisse had led him down the mysterious pitch-black tunnel and persuaded, no, tricked him, into entering the cavern first. The little bastard hadn't even hinted a warning as to what he'd face inside. Now Lawrence was all grins and chuckles about it, but when that Carcarian had lunged forward and grasped him in its steely claws, he'd been close to wetting himself. But instead of tearing him in half, the Carcarian had simply lifted him like a child and placed him down a few feet to the left, making room for his giggling little bastard of a friend to enter behind him. The sight of the Carcarians held little fear for Lawrence now. Quite the opposite, being among them made him feel strangely optimistic. Despite their fearsome appearance, these true Carcarians were nothing like the cruel, possessed abominations on the planet's surface. At first, he'd recognized little in the way of emotion among these survivors. No fear, no anger at the tragedy that had befallen them. Except for the occasional scowl, their cat-like features seemed forever cold, almost lifeless. After time spent in their company, however, he began to recognize the subtleties of their expressions, and at times caught glimpses of very real emotions something that Tark was quick to confirm. Coming to a halt near the center of the cavern, he looked about for Tark. It didn't take long. The little man stood out like a snowy hatchling among a flock of ravens. His long white hair shone luminously under the warm glow, so much so it almost seemed a light source in itself. Lawrence waved, and Tark was quick to spring down from his perch. On their first meeting, Lawrence had found it hard to place his new acquaintance in any particular military role. He'd even questioned whether the strange little man was simply a hallucination manifested by his own delirium. As it turned out, Tark was neither. As Lawrence had eventually learned, his friend was in fact a highly regarded anthropologist, zoologist, alienologist, and a couple of other ists that Lawrence couldn't recall. He'd been living on the planet for the last twelve years, 
More than a decade of communication, integration, and eventually full acceptance, even friendship, with the planet's inhabitants. Lawrence could see it now, the way the little chap hopped deftly across the sharp rocks and weaved so casually among the tall, dark aliens. Such a confident manner could only come with years of experience. I just had a rather strange meeting, Lawrence said enthusiastically as Tark sauntered towards him. It was with a man who's got a half-decent plan to get us off this rock. And by that, I mean all of us. Well, all of us who survived the plan, that is. Tark perched himself on a nearby rock. Excellent. Where are we off to? Lawrence snorted a laugh. Where are we off to? Tark brushed some black rock dust off his knees and looked up expectantly. Lawrence shook his head and gave it a rub. You're not interested in the how? Tark waved his hand dismissively. I'm sure it's a good plan. Lawrence continued to shake his head, half amused, half bemused. He wondered whether he'd ever be able to surprise his little friend. Alvor, the planet Alvor's the destination. Ah, the planet where the ingredients for that nice ale come from. Lawrence grinned. Yes, Alvorian ale. Good, I like ale. Count me in. Really? You look surprised, Lawrence. I may be small, but I can knock back the ale like a pregnant guzzlefish. That's not what I meant. Lawrence took a seat on a rock opposite him. I'm surprised because you seem keen, eager even. I thought, well, I thought I was going to have to persuade you to leave. God knows why, but you seem to love this planet. God would be wrong, Lawrence. It's not the planet I love. It's the beautiful inhabitants that hold my affections. Tark swept a hand about. Besides, I need a change. You get as old as me, and you need to keep the body and soul toned with new experiences. Lawrence nodded. He was starting to see the truth in that. So, this escape plan, I hope it encompasses our tall friends here. Of course, Lawrence replied, smoothing his thick, shaggy beard. I mean, I hoped they'd want to escape, but I wasn't sure they'd want to leave either. Yes, this is their home, and your assumption is logical, but again, it's wrong. Tark grinned. I've discussed the matter with them many times of late. Their words are few, and my ability to hear their full vocal range is limited, but their meaning is clear. They think their planet is a crap hole. Lawrence couldn't decide whether to laugh or feel sad, so he did his best to keep his expression neutral. I see, he said after a moment. Well, of course they can come. I've arranged that everyone can leave. He turned to look at a nearby group of Carcarians. They were crushing a huge bone into dust, then adding some sort of liquid to make a paste. We'll need them to be distinctive, stand out from the drones up above. Drones? Fitting, Tark said thoughtfully. Then after a moment, don't worry, I'll make sure they're distinctive. Good, that's good. Lawrence smoothed his beard again and continued to watch the nearby group. I'm glad they're coming with us, Tark, he said after a moment. We're going to need all the help we can to pull off this plan. Oh, yes? Lawrence turned to him. It's going to involve a bit of a fight, you see. Terrific! Again, Lawrence found himself shaking his head in bewilderment. Like a bit of a fight, do you? Tark shrugged. You know, Lawrence, no matter how intelligent or spiritually evolved a human male might claim to be, there's always a primal part of him that can't help but enjoy a good old tussle. Come to think of it, quite a few women I've known over the years enjoy it even more. Lawrence chuckled and shifted himself on the rock in a failed attempt to get comfortable. And the Carcarians? You think they'll be up for joining the fight? Tark gave a slow, thoughtful nod. Despite their tribal divisions, they're a peaceful race. In all the time I've been here, I've witnessed very little fighting or conflict, quite unlike us humans. But just because they're not naturally aggressive doesn't mean they don't have it in them to be quite lethal. Tark looked over to the huge lizard-like carcasses hanging at the far side of the cavern. I've seen them take down their prey often. Quite a show. I promise you, Lawrence, you piss them off enough, and they'll make sweet music with your bones. Tark's expression was serious, and Lawrence nodded his understanding. But you don't think maybe they'll have trouble fighting against... Lawrence glanced upwards to indicate the planet's surface high above them. They might feel they're fighting their own. They kind of will be, in a way. I was here during the invasion, Lawrence. I saw what happened. The Carcarians aren't an easy species to sneak up on, very light sleepers. 
but these slug creatures have incredible stealth, and they blend into their surroundings incredibly effectively. They came while the tribe slept. By the time the alarm was raised, most had already fallen prey, and those that hadn't soon did. I would never have believed such tiny, legless creatures could move so fast. Snakes at least have the benefit of length. Tark's eyes, which had grown distant, suddenly snapped back into focus. It takes a hell of a lot for a Carcarian to retreat, Lawrence. Hence the reason you see so few survivors here. Tark took a moment to gaze around the cavern. When he turned back, his expression had grown dark, angry even, something that Lawrence had never seen in the little man. Let me tell you, Lawrence, those beasts up there, those drones, as you call them, the resemblance absolutely stops at the physical. They are dead, their bodies hijacked, and their spirits long gone. This I know, and I can assure you that every male, female, and child Carcarian you see around you knows it too. This is the last, the very last tribe. When it comes to a fight, they won't hold anything back, and this time they'll be prepared. You'll be wise not to get in their way when that happens. Again, Lawrence quietly nodded his understanding. He tried to imagine the battle that lay ahead. The vision sent a shiver down his spine. He'd never been one for combat. Just the thought of it had always scared him witless. During his molly-coddled life, he'd never once been involved in a fight, at least not until Harper had punched his tooth out, and calling that a fight was perhaps a little generous on his part. He wondered whether his newfound courage would stand up to the battle ahead. At this moment, he felt like he could face any challenge thrown at him. More than that, he wanted to. It was like a switch had flipped within him, a switch that he hoped to God stayed flipped. His musing suddenly reminded him of Callum's sample. The gift. Reaching into his pocket, he pulled out the little syringe. Maybe it was time to give it the trial run Callum had insisted on. As he rolled it between his fingers, Tark took interest and leaned over to peer at the bright green liquid within. Pretty. Uh-huh, Lawrence agreed, holding the syringe up to the light of a nearby glowworm pouch. You know what, Tark, for all our sakes, I hope it's a lot more than pretty. Chapter 36 The Gibson Gun Eddie, what the hell are you doing? Toker asked in disbelief. Seriously, that gun's bigger than you are. Halfway up the Star Splinter's loading ramp, Cal caught sight of the girl's perspiring red face. Toker was laughing at her. Oh man, your delusions of grandeur are really starting to border on insanity. Shut your face, she growled, and stop shying off to the dock with your smart-ass long words. As he continued up the ramp, Cal saw the gun Eddie was wrestling with, a five-barrel rotating blaster and he found himself inclined to agree with Toka. She was attempting to lift the huge weapon as if it were a slimline pulse rifle. The massive gun was originally designed as a mounted weapon, and only after the Battle of Greenwich six years previously had it ever been considered otherwise. During that battle, a sergeant by the name of George Bulldog Gibson had become a little carried away while facing an overwhelming force of pirate invaders. So it was told, the Greenwich Moons had been Sergeant Gibson's boyhood colony. And, possibly because of this emotional attachment, the fury of battle had overwhelmed the man. It was rumoured that he'd heaved the monstrous gun off its mounting as if it were a mere toy, and led a charge while unleashing all five of the weapon's barrels in a thunderous rage. The act had apparently turned the tide of the battle, resulting in the pirates fleeing. Word of Sergeant Gibson's Herculean act had spread, and before long others were trying to imitate the achievement. A successful attempt at wielding the huge weapon, renamed the Gibson Gun, had soon become the ultimate test of strength among military units. The result was nothing but a massive increase in the incidence of dislocated shoulders and torn biceps. George Bulldog Gibson was a giant of a man, and his feat was not something easily repeated. By the time Cal made it to the top of the ramp, Toker's laughter had diminished, but he was still grinning widely and shaking his head. Even if you did manage to lift it, you'd fire yourself further than the pulse discharge. I will bloody lift it, and when I do, I know exactly which direction I'll be firing. Cal strode past the pair and headed towards Kaya. She was leaning back against a loading crate, watching Eddie with a mixture of disbelief, amusement, and possibly even a hint of respect. How did it go with the infiltrator? She asked as he approached. It's in the Mosquito and heading down to the planet's surface as we speak. 
Victor and Jumper have the sync sphere up and running in your lab. Good, Kaya smiled at him. Glad to get that fake beard off, I bet. Cal grinned as he realized he'd been scratching at his chin. Yep, he nodded towards Toker and Eddie. I swear one of those two clowns must have put itching powder in that face glue. It was worth it, though. There's not a lot of personal grooming going on down there. I can imagine. Kaya pushed herself off the crate. So this man, Decker, do you think we can rely on him? Cal rubbed his hand across his chin, doing his best not to scratch. If you'd asked me that a couple of days ago, I'd have said not a chance in hell. But I have to admit, the man I met down there isn't the Lawrence Decker I knew. Far from it. And I'm not just talking about his physical transformation. I didn't have long to judge, but yes, I think we can rely on him. Just as well, we're not exactly overwhelmed with alternatives. Cal nodded and took a moment to look about the cargo hold. One of Victor's self-built toys, Kaya said as she saw him doing an almost comical double take at something stored at the back of the hold. He's calling it the Silver Widow. Cal raised an eyebrow. The Silver Widow looked something like a mechanical spider, about six feet in circumference, four feet in height, and sported a modified swivel blaster on its back. Lost for words, Cal blew out a breath and resorted back to scratching his chin. He's going to control it remotely from the cockpit, Kai went on to explain. Says he doesn't like to send Melinda into battle unprotected. He seems a little disappointed we put him in charge of the ship. Cal nodded. It's for the best. Victor has many talents, but fighting isn't one of them. Unless, of course, it's a virtual. How's about this one, Ed? Toka shouted, drowning out Cal's words. Reckon it's more your size. Cal turned to see Toka strolling towards Eddie, holding a tiny, slim-lined pulse pistol between his thumb and forefinger. Get that bloody girl's weapon out of my face, bugger lugs. I got my weapon right here. Just gotta work out a technique is all. Cal was amazed to see that Eddie had managed to lift one end of the mighty Gibson gun, the barrel tips grinding against the metal deck while its butt rested on her trembling knee. The petite girl was still a world away from wielding the weapon, but he was still damn impressed. Jeez, Chick, give it up, Toker almost pleaded. Why the hell are you trying to lift that bloody great thing now anyway? We're not even on the planet yet. Cause, idiot, you never go into battle with an untested weapon, she replied, her voice shaking and her slim limbs clearly suffering under the command of her unyielding resolve. I got some armor plating set up out there in the loading bay. I'll blast off a few rounds so I can get used to the gun's kickback. Ed, where exactly is your little brain at this precise moment? I'm just curious. Toka glanced back at Cal and Kaya. There ain't nothing wrong with my brain or my plan. Actually, Eddie, I'm afraid none of the weapons will work yet. Kaya informed her a little tentatively. Even from this distance, the pulse disruptor from the Insidion base is fully effective. Still refusing to give in to the Gibson gun's massive dead weight, Eddie risked a quick glance around. Pulse what now? The pulse disruptor? The thing I was explaining last night, remember? When we were going through the plan? Eddie shifted her grip on the weapon a little. What's she going on about, Cal? Cal looked at Kaya with an almost apologetic shake of the head. Eddie had been distant over the last week. When she was around, she barely listened, and when she did listen, she disagreed. She was hostile, and most of it was directed at Kaya. None of the weapons are going to work yet, Eddie. Not until we've taken out the Insidion's pulse disruptor. Eddie swore as the Gibson gun finally slipped from her increasingly sweaty grip and slid harshly down her trembling leg to thud loudly onto the deck. If her leg was in pain, and Cal imagined it probably was, she didn't let it show. So let's go and take care of this pulse thingy now, then. Cal rubbed the back of his head, wondering if his words were actually sinking in this time. Well, actually, yes, that's the plan. Kaya and I are going to take care of the disruptor, but we'll need you to help with the escape. Help keep the prisoners safe. Eddie sniffed and paused for a moment, mulling over what he'd said, then said, Of course, Cal, they'll be safe with me around, especially once I've worked out how to lift this bloody gun. She looked down at the huge chunk of metal with a creased brow. Cal guessed her confidence was finally beginning to wane. Still, true to her usual form, she reached down yet again and wrapped her perspiring fingers around two of the gun's thick barrels. Cal started forward, but Kaya laid a hand on his shoulder. Eddie, I have something that will help, she said, walking over to the girl. Not that bloody green stuff again. Kaya nodded. 
you missed out when the others tried it. Had stuff to do, Eddie said, then hefted one end of the gun off the floor with a grunt. Important stuff. Only inches from the ground, the Gibson gun once again slipped from her grasp and hammered into the deck. Bloody flipping heck, she spat, then straightened up and gave a loud huff. Wiping her sweaty hands on her combat pants, she looked around suspiciously at Kaya. Kaya was holding out one of the XL syringes. It really will help, she said encouragingly. Trust her, Ed, Toka said. It's bloody good stuff, and I really don't hold out much hope for your technique if you don't. Eddie looked at Toka, then peered at the little syringe dubiously, then back at Kaya even more dubiously. You'll like it, Kaya persisted. You put this end against your neck and press the button just here. Cal gave the girl an encouraging nod as she looked his way. After one last glance at the Gibson gun, Eddie wordlessly snatched the bright green serum out of Kaya's open hand, sniffed twice, shrugged once, and then shoved it roughly against her neck. Giving Kaya one last suspicious look, she pressed the button. Chapter 37 Waiting Lawrence wasn't overly keen on this waiting business. Attempting to operate the mining machinery and acting the normal downcast under the watchful eye of the roaming drone guards was proving tricky. With the knowledge of what was soon to unfold rolling about in his head, he could barely keep the weird cocktail of fear and excitement from bursting forth onto his face. On top of that was the fact that his mouth kept suffering almost spasm-like grins that he hadn't experienced since childhood. They came whenever he thought of that weird green liquid Callum Harper had given him. Its effects had been everything the man had promised and more. Lawrence could only hope that his thick beard was doing something to conceal these stupid grins, because try as he might, he couldn't stop them coming. There were no such grins on the men and women working around him. Being told of the serum and actually sampling it were very different things. Still, their faith in him remained true. He still couldn't quite get his head around the fact that each and every one of them seemed utterly trusting in his words and judgment. The previous evening, those who had been carefully selected had listened intently to him as he'd laid out the proposed escape plan. No one had argued or questioned it. On the contrary, they'd all accepted it without hesitation, and many had even voiced their approval. Perhaps they were desperate, or perhaps they simply believed. The plan had then been relayed to the countless others, and it wasn't long before every person in the camp knew every detail. Not one negative report had been voiced. Lawrence had been pleased at that, but he wished they'd all been able to feel the miraculous experience of the serum. It would have undoubtedly removed a great deal of their fear. Switching his disc saw off, he retracted it from the rock beneath him. As he repositioned the blade, another uncontrollable grin struck him. That serum had made him feel something close to invincible. So much so that after a whole load of running around and lifting of numerous heavy rocks, he'd gotten carried away and ended up in an arm wrestle with one of Tark's larger Karkarian friends. He hadn't won, but he'd definitely given his big opponent something to think about. Best of all, though, he'd managed to wipe that annoyingly impassive mask from the alien's face just long enough for something resembling surprise to appear in its place. Fortunately, the resulting claw gashes on his hands and wrists were healing rapidly. Lawrence hoped there'd be a scar or two. He wanted to remember that glorious experience for the rest of his life, however short that may turn out to be. Eventually, he got his grin under control. Won't be long now, he thought as he stretched his back and looked to the horizon. He could see the distant black clouds building. They were moving towards the camp like some sort of slow-motion, soot-filled explosion. Such clouds had been common of late, seeming to form practically every evening. These, however, appeared larger and denser than the norm. He could even see bright white crackles within their depths, which was something he'd only witnessed a couple of times before. A dry storm. If he was right, there'd be no rain, but a wind force would more than make up for it. What the hell is it with storms? Lawrence mused. So often they'd arrive when a battle was about to commence. He'd never actually been in a battle. He'd been too precious for that, but he'd seen hundreds of them. Sitting comfortably in the command deck of his starship, he'd watched almost idly as the live images were relayed from the multiple buzz cams hovering above the bloody action. Sifting through his mental catalogue, he could barely recall a single one that hadn't been accompanied by some kind of extreme weather. Snowstorms, sandstorms, tropical tempests. 
One time he'd even witnessed an entire squad of rebel colonists getting sucked up into a tornado on the dusty plains of Gideon III. The unfortunate buggers had been winning, too. Lawrence turned his attentions from the horizon and back down to his disc saw. The approaching storm clouds were close enough now for the warning rumbles to be heard. The sound was softer, lower pitched than that of the distant volcanoes, but somehow held more menace. He shook his head. Just like all the others, this battle was going to get its storm, and it was a big one at that. Starting up his saw, he mused whether it was Mother Nature showing her disapproval of the violence soon to take place. Then he pressed the saw down into the rock and smiled a humorless smile. Or maybe she just wanted to join in. Chapter 38 The Sink Sphere She's all fired up, Kaya called out as she sat herself at the main control console for the Sink Sphere. Cal felt clear-headed and confident as he bounded up the last few steps of the platform and approached the large silver sphere. There had been a long night of waiting. Preparations had been completed, checked, rechecked, then rechecked a couple more times. Cal had never been overly keen on that stage, but now that the plan was underway, his mind had reached a level of focus that pushed any lingering fears and doubts aside. In short, he was feeling like the plan might actually work. The platform on which he stood was about ten feet in height and fifteen feet in diameter. With Melinda's help, Jumper and Victor had cleared equipment from the center of Kaya's biolab in order to erect it. The sink sphere sat in the very center of the platform. It was a shiny silver ball, ten feet in diameter and flawless, except for a large wedge-shaped entrance hatch in its side. How does the suit feel? Kaya asked. Cal turned to look down at her. There was an amused curl at the corners of her mouth as she busily tapped away at her controls. He was glad to see it. Now that the plan was in motion, her anxieties seemed to have calmed. Snug, he replied. The suit she was referring to had been specially designed for use within the sphere. It was black and silver and tightly covered every inch of his body with the exception of his mouth and eyes. He wound his arms around in a circle, testing the suit's flexibility for the hundredth time. The boy in him felt like some kind of superhero. The adult in him felt like an idiot. Okay, you're all good to go, Kaya said, her amused smile turning into an encouraging one. Once you're inside and hooked up, I'll run a few tests to make sure the sphere's running smoothly. Cal nodded and raised a fist with an extended thumb. As he turned to the sphere, he silently cursed himself. A thumbs up. He couldn't have come up with a less heroic gesture if he'd tried. Shaking his head, he stepped through the wedge-shaped hatch into the hollow sphere, and the hatch sealed shut behind him. Once inside, the sphere's concave walls appeared transparent, as if they were constructed from one-way glass. Taking in the surrounding lab, Cal couldn't help but feel like a bug in an upturned fishbowl. Turning his attentions downward, he located the pulsating red spot at the very bottom of the sphere that marked the point on which he was required to stand. Can you hear me, Cal? He heard Kaya ask as he positioned himself on the red marker. Loud and clear. I'm in position. Good. I'm activating the feelers now. Cal gave his arms a little shake flexed his fingers, and prepared himself with a couple of deep breaths. He'd already given the sphere a couple of trial runs, so he knew that the next few minutes would feel more than a little weird. As if filling with liquid mercury, the transparent concave walls rapidly began to turn silver from the bottom up, and within seconds, the sphere's interior appeared as solid as its exterior. A second later, and every inch of that interior began to sprout what looked like tiny metallic worms, literally millions of them. Tightly bunched and each no thicker than a needle, the feelers wriggled and squirmed as they extended almost menacingly towards him. It was as if the sphere's interior was rapidly growing metallic hair. Indeed, just like Melinda's long locks, every one of those feelers contained a mass of highly adaptable nanothreads. Cal did his best not to flinch or squirm as the wriggling feelers made contact with every millimeter of the suit he wore and began to communicate with the nerves of his skin. They configured around his lips to allow unobstructed breathing, while smooth, goggle-shaped gaps formed over his eyes to give him a liquid mercury view. Not designed with claustrophobia in mind, he mused as he took a few calming breaths. Then the mass of feelers lifted him and positioned him into the very center of the sphere. Like much of the tech on board the Aurelian, 
the sphere was a military prototype, its purpose to recreate a realistic sensory experience while enabling physical control of a remote cybernetic avatar. Kaya had explained that, unlike the highly popular pleasure pods, the sync technology avoided the need to tap directly into a person's brainstem to stimulate and trick the nervous system. Brainstem taps left the user confused, delirious even for a good while after the experience. Cal guessed that the military considered this an unacceptable side effect. They preferred their soldiers not to be delirious under any circumstances, unless under strict orders to be so. Fortunately, the sync sphere achieved similar trickery over the senses without any internal poking or probing, and left the user relatively intact, mentally and physically. How you doing in there, Cal? Just peachy, he replied as he experimentally moved his body around in a series of complex movements. With every motion he made, the feelers easily and naturally obliged, as if he were simply floating in water. Did I mention what an incredible machine this is the last time we used it? Twice. The feelers obliged Cal's grin. I'm just starting up a few tests. Tell me exactly what you feel. Sure. Heat in my right thigh. Yes, good. A tapping against the back of my left hand. A sort of rippling down my upper back. Pressure under my feet. Excellent. Okay. I'm increasing that pressure under your feet until it matches that of your normal body weight. There. Now try jumping for me. Cal did so. The pressure against his feet felt exactly like solid ground, and when he jumped, he could even feel his feet leave that ground and meet it again a moment later. The feelers mimicked the various pressures and sensations with incredible precision and realism, even creating subtle air pressures against his skin. If it weren't for the blank, silvery view before his eyes, he felt he might simply be jumping in a park. Okay, Cal. Movements all seem fine. So no making me hop on one foot for five minutes this time, then? I can assure you that was a valid test. Suddenly the silvery view before Cal's eyes disappeared, and he found himself standing in a flat, dusty desert with a deep, blue, cloudless sky overhead. Visuals are coming through okay for me, Cal. How are they for you? Perfect. You know, you really should let Victor put some of his virtual worlds into this system. The kid's got a talent for scenery. Sensing movement to his left, Cal turned to see the slightly unnerving sight of a fully grown giraffe plodding toward him, hoofs scuffing noisily on the hard, dusty ground. Soon, the awkward-looking beast was looming over him. Then it was bending its long neck and peering into his eyes. Friend of yours? he asked. The only answer he got was a wet, slurping sound as the beast opened its mouth, extended a long, purplish tongue, and licked his face. Even though he knew it wasn't there, Cal still felt the need to wipe the dripping saliva away from his cheek. How are the acoustics? Terrific. Good. Well, I guess it's time. Cal could hear a hint of anxiety returning in Kaya's voice, which he fully understood. I guess so, he replied, hoping she found his calm tone encouraging. Let's get to it. The desert view disappeared, and there was a moment of darkness while the system connected to its avatar. Down on the rocky surface of C-9, the synthetic Carcarian twitched within the cramped confines of the little mosquito ship. Cal blinked a few times as his eyes adjusted to the sight of the ship's cockpit. Looking down, he raised his arms to see jet-black, thickly-muscled forearms and large, clawed hands. He flexed them and felt the cybernetic power within. The feeling wasn't new. Twice before he had taken control of the infiltrator while it had been on the Aurelian. Turning his head, he directed the pale grey eyes to the ship's readouts. Everything appeared to be in order. Okay, Kaya, I'm hooked up. How's your screen? All good. I'm seeing everything crystal clear. I've disabled the mouth feelers so you can talk without the infiltrator's mouth moving. Cal hit the door release and experienced deja vu as he took in the familiar sight of the dark C9 landscape. They had landed the mosquito in precisely the same location as his previous excursion and so far the only thing distinguishing this visit from the other was his taller stature and an inability to smell the sulfur on the gusting wind. He looked toward the distant camp and then at the Insidion base beyond. This was the first time they'd risked any sort of remote signal from the Aurelian to the planet's surface. If the Insidions were going to detect their presence, now would be that time. Well, I don't see any cavalry yet. Me neither. Maybe they're lazily waiting for us to go to them. Kaya replied. 
Well, let's oblige, shall we? Cal said, stepping the infiltrator out of the ship's cockpit and down onto the rocky ground. It looks like there's a storm brewing on the horizon, Cal. There always is. Chapter 39 Lying in Wait Jumper grimaced as he looked to the horizon and saw the gathering storm clouds. He didn't mind a good storm, but was unsure whether this one would help or hinder their plan. One thing was for sure, it wouldn't make his long-range targeting any easier. Bringing his long-eye bliss rifle up to firing position, he directed the sights on the little mosquito ship far below. It was hard to see the dark figure against the equally dark landscape, but he could just about make out Cal and Kaya's synthetic Carcarian as it left the ship and swiftly negotiated the rocky terrain toward the prison camp. Cal's on the move, he called to Eddie and Toka. Both were uncharacteristically calm and quiet as they gazed out of the Star Splinter's open cargo doors. Toka sat on the deck, slouched against a weapons crate and idly rubbing his adrenaline cuff that was firmly strapped to his wrist. Eddie stood by his side, eyes hard like a boxer's before a bout as she twiddled one of the XL syringes between her fingers. The Gibson gun was laying at her feet. As the Star Splinter was a much larger ship, they had decided to land it much further away from the Insidion base than the Little Mosquito. The effectiveness of the ghosting net technology had proven successful multiple times now, but landing a ship the size of a Star Splinter would cause heat changes to the ground on which it settled, a very subtle giveaway, but an unnecessary risk nonetheless. When the time came, Victor would maneuver the ship closer to the prison camp. As always, Jumper found the feel of the bliss rifle in his hands reassuring. He'd always disliked pulse weapons. They were powerful and effective, no argument there, but he'd never liked the complexity of their workings, too much opportunity for malfunction. Of course, now, with the Insidion's ability to disable pulse-based technology, the rifle felt more reassuring than ever. He continued to scan the landscape through the weapon's sights, then brought them into focus on the relatively flat area of ground where the dropships would be landing. Just looking at it reminded him how nervous he was about that aspect of the plan. His worries weren't concerning the functioning of the dropships. He and Cal had physically checked and rechecked all 98 of them. Neither was he worried about the starship. Kaya had assured them she could take control of it as easily as she had the star splinter. He also trusted Victor's ability to have successfully fitted the starship with the ghosting net technology. The aspect of the plan where his confidence waned, however, was in the fact that they'd not had the time, or indeed the means, for the individual dropships to be fitted with that same cloaking technology. As it stood, there would be a race to get all the escapees to the dropships and back to the safety of the cloaked starship before the Insidions managed to take action. It was a race he feared they could lose. It's time for me to go, Jumper. The voice was Melinda's, and Jumper turned to see the cybernetic woman approaching him. She was dressed from neck to toe in black to provide as much camouflage against the landscape as possible. Okay, Melinda. You have the cube key. Yes, she replied, holding up the tiny box between her forefinger and thumb. The nano threads within the box were already set to deactivate the camp's force field. Melinda was to make her way down to the camp unseen and await the signal. You want some camo cream for your face? Jumper asked, eyeing her pale skin. I've got some here somewhere he continued, looking down and patting at the multitude of pockets on his combat jacket. That won't be required. When Jumper looked back up, the synthetic woman's blonde hair had turned jet black and had begun to move, something Jumper thought he'd never get used to, until it had wrapped firmly around her neck and face. Before long, the only part of her that was no longer black were her bright blue eyes. Jumper grinned. Looks like you've got it covered. Good luck to all of you, she said as her eyes darkened until they too were black. Before any of them had a chance to reply, she silently sped off down the Star Splinter's cargo ramp and exited the relative safety of the ship's ghosting net like a panther in the night. Chapter 40 Infiltration The infiltrator's long, powerful legs handled the rugged terrain well as Cal guided it across the harsh C9 landscape. As he closed in on the five gleaming structures, the scale of the Insidion base really started to sink in. He'd been aware of its immense size from studying the bird's eye views, but with the nearest cube looming over him like some sort of colossal alien castle, 
He couldn't help feeling they'd bitten off more than they could chew. He took a moment to glance back at the now distant prison camp. There was no one following him, but that did little to extinguish his foreboding. The low rumbles from the approaching storm weren't helping either. They seemed nothing but growls of warning. Bar one rather messy dive over the prison camp's force field, so far everything had gone smoothly. The pop platform had easily adjusted to the synthetic Karkarian's extra weight, and its heavy cybernetic form had cleared the force field with room to spare. But Cal had found controlling the infiltrator's descent within the sink sphere tricky to say the least. He'd gone into a tumble and had landed face first. Fortunately, the Avatar had remained undamaged, and doing his best to play the part by glaring at various prisoners along the way, he'd guided it through the prison camp untroubled. Taking advantage of a fortunate opportunity, he then boldly followed a Karkarian drone straight out of the camp's exit and continued to follow it as it strode parallel to the conveyor belt in the direction of the Insidion base. Of the half a dozen drones that had come within close proximity thus far, not one of them had paid the infiltrator the least bit of attention. He and Kaya had been fairly confident that this would be the case. Three days previously, they had presented the synthetic to the two captive drones on board the Aurelian. Their reaction had been entirely promising. On sighting the infiltrator through the smart glass barrier, both drones had become immediately alert, excited even, at the prospect of one of their own appearing. It had taken the drones some time to realize they were looking at some sort of imposter. The giant Insidion cubes were constructed of no material Cal could name, a shimmering kind of metal that seemed to take on a life of its own while reflecting the surrounding landscape and skies. It was entirely fortunate that, of the five structures that made up the base, the source of the weapon-disabling signal was emanating from the closest. It was also fortunate that the drone inadvertently guiding him was heading directly for that very structure. As they neared, Cal saw a tall, hard-edged entranceway that looked as though a block had simply been removed from the side of the structure. Bright light was pouring from it and falling across the dark rocks. He could see no guards. What would such a superior, arrogant race need to guard against? They're not overly keen on curves, he muttered to Kaya as he followed the drone through the entranceway into a wide, straight-edged corridor. Despite the infiltrator's agility, he was relieved to leave behind the rocky train in exchange for a smooth, well-lit floor. The corridor was completely featureless, with no doors or windows apparent, just more corridor that seemed to stretch endlessly straight ahead. Well, this is a little underwhelming, he said as he urged the infiltrator on with a confident march making sure to stride no faster or slower than his guide, who was a good twenty meters ahead. Yes, Kyra agreed. Still, I'm quite happy with underwhelming. So I guess there's not a lot of point in asking which way. Kaya let out a small nervous laugh. Not yet, at least. She had assured him that she'd managed to pinpoint the signal to quite an accurate degree, and, assuming that they would at some point have a choice in their route, was confident she could direct him to it with ease. It's coming from the center of the ship, she reminded him. Eventually we're going to have to find a way to go up, but for now, straight ahead is good for us. Cal felt it was an eternity before he could make out any sort of end to the corridor. It started with a muffled din, then colors and lights ahead. As he continued on, it became apparent that whatever they were heading towards certainly didn't match the bland, featureless design they'd witnessed so far. What do you suppose is going on up there? Kaya asked. I have no idea, but I have a nasty feeling we're approaching a party without an invite. Cal could feel his heart pounding against his chest, and wondered for a brief moment if the sink sphere was sensitive enough to pick up on such a subtle movement. As the corridor finally came to an end, Cal sucked in a breath, and had to force himself not to sweep the infiltrator's head up and around like some kind of awed tourist. The space was so large that no matter which direction he looked, not even the infiltrator's synthetic eyes could see an end to it. He hadn't been far off when he'd said party. The area was bursting with activity, close to chaos, in fact. So much so that it reminded Cal of Vangos, the once capital city of Earth's pleasure moon. Everything he saw could easily have been human in design, but was at the same time distinctly alien. There were countless establishments, all set around huge pillars, offering strange foods, drinks, and who knew what else. All were adorned with dazzling bursts of colour. There were Karkarian drones everywhere, but the life forms didn't end there. 
a host of different alien breeds meandered around the great space. Most were approximately humanoid, but rather disconcertingly, the Karkarians were among the smallest in stature. The aliens on view weren't limited to live flesh and blood either. In the distance, Cal could see crowds gathered around massive hologram projections that hovered in the air, displaying images of monsters the likes of which he'd never seen. Crowds were gathered around the holograms, hissing and screeching in what he assumed was appreciation or disappointment as they watched the monsters violently rip and grapple at each other with huge claws. My God, Cal. You took the words right out of my mouth, he replied. He was doing his utmost not to break his stride as he moved the infiltrator directly into the throng. Looking up, he saw a high, transparent ceiling that seemed to double as a floor for the level above and he could make out at least two other floors above that before his vision became a confusing blur of colour and movement. It seemed the array of chaotic bustle was replicated on multiple levels overhead, and having witnessed the colossal height of the structure from the outside, he could only imagine how many levels that might be. I think we should make this visit brief, he said, trying his best to remain level-headed as he continued to move deeper into the strange internal city. Definitely, Kyra agreed. When you can, start veering to your right. Cal did so, all the while doing his best to avoid any sort of physical contact with the city's occupants. The last thing they needed was to get into a tussle. You recognize any of these species, Kaya? Not even remotely. They all appear far more sentient and evolved than any of the aliens in our little corner of space. I suspect they're from far beyond. Cal agreed and did his best not to stare as he continued on. I think we'd better pick up the pace, Cal, Kaya suggested after a time. There's a lot of communication going on. I don't fancy our chances if we're talked at. We need to go up at some point, right? Yes, quite a way up. I might be wrong, but that huge opaque cylinder ahead looks to be stretching through the floors. See the red cubes moving up and down it? Could be elevators. Looks promising. Cal manipulated the infiltrator carefully through the crowds and soon found himself having to skirt around an area filled with multiple aliens slouched in hanging cradles. There were brightly coloured tubes entering their arms. He didn't waste any time studying or musing over the sight. Everything he saw was being recorded by the sync sphere and could be reviewed at a later time. One detail he had taken the time to observe, however, was that the slug-like insidians were attached to every neck he'd seen. So far, all seemed to be drones. Eventually, he brought the infiltrator to a halt in front of the massive opaque cylinder. At closer inspection, it looked more like a wide, fizzing beam of energy. Inside were numerous static cubes, all of which were blue. What do you think? He asked Kyra as he peered through the haze at one of the cubes. Should I just walk on through? As if in answer to his question, two Karkarian drones barged the infiltrator aside and walked through the shaft's hazy wall until they disappeared into one of the cubes. Moments later, the cube turned red, seeming to solidify as it did so, and took off in a rapid ascent. I guess that answers. Cal's words caught in his throat as a large, powerful hand clamped onto the infiltrator's right shoulder. Managing to twist around, he saw no less than five bulbous eyes, all on the one face, peering down at him. The owner of the eyes was more or less human in shape, but was at least a head taller than the infiltrator. The creature had pale, yellowish skin that was stretched tightly over a particularly bony head and body and was translucent enough to reveal a network of pulsating brown veins beneath. The creature also sported four stubby arms, the short length of which was more than made up for by long, multi-jointed fingers that protruded spider-like from each hand. Cal glared at the alien, hoping the icy Karkarian stare would cause it to reconsider its aggressive proximity. Achieving little success, he casually swiped at its bony arm in order to knock the hand away. The long fingers, however, were surprisingly strong, and the swipe did nothing more than aggravate the tall brute. All five of its eyes were beginning to bulge to the point of popping. With a stab of alarm, Cal wondered whether any of those bulbous eyes could see through the infiltrator's synthetic trickery. As if in answer, the creature turned its bony head and began to hiss loudly, attracting the attention from some of the nearest bystanders. How does it know? There was fear in Kaya's tone. I have no idea. You've got to get away from it. Inclined to agree, Cal attempted to twist free, 
but incredibly the alien's long-fingered grip remained firm. Desperate measures, he thought as he seized hold of the creature's lower arms and launched the infiltrator's heavy cybernetic form back through the energy shaft. After a few meters of awkward stumbling, the infiltrator hit the floor with a thud, the big brute landing heavily on top of it. Fortunately, they'd landed where Cal had planned, or at least hoped. Seeming to register their presence, the lift's fuzzy blue walls solidified and turned red, and they started to ascend. Quick to recover from its abduction, the multi-limbed alien soon had all four of its massive spidery hands grappling in determination. Instinctively, Cal tightened his grip on the big brute's lower arms. Christ, this bastard's strong. Heavy, too, he exclaimed, shocked that the infiltrator's cybernetic arms seemed to be struggling. You're going to have to finish this quickly, Cal. The lift's automatic and it's going up fast. Cal's vision was suddenly obscured as one of the big spider-like hands clamped onto the infiltrator's face and another wrapped around its neck. The alien was undoubtedly exerting immense pressure, but fortunately any pain emitted by the sync sphere's feelers was preset not to go past a certain level. 650 meters to go, Cal. Then we need to get out of this thing. Still gripping both of the alien's lower arms, Cal was becoming acutely aware of the advantage of multiple limbs when it came to a fight. Reluctantly releasing one of his opponent's wrists, he began issuing a series of fast, powerful punches to its ribcage. Despite the crunch of bone, any pain response from the alien was worryingly absent. Tough bastard. Cal's voice was strained. Even with the immense cybernetic strength at his disposal, he was still having to work hard within the sphere. It's nothing but a drone, Cal. It maybe doesn't register the pain. Try going for the Insidion. Grateful for the advice, Cal blindly reached the infiltrator's free arm up and around and began to feel for the back of the creature's neck. 450 meters. He felt a hard, lumpy spine, then soft flesh. The Insidion wriggled as he gripped it. Then he squeezed. The reaction was immediate. A pained noise somewhere between a rasp and a roar rushed out of the alien's mouth. Unfortunately, the long fingers around the infiltrator's face and neck tightened further. 300 meters. Cal squeezed again. But the Insidion had obviously activated some sort of defense mechanism and become hard as stone. Abandoning the direct attack on the slug-like creature, he forced the free arm back underneath the drone's body and pushed with all his might. Slowly, the cybernetics began to overwhelm the alien's impressive strength and forced it upwards. Feeling the positioning was right, he swung the infiltrator's right leg up in an arc and hooked it around his opponent's head. 200 meters. Feeling multiple eyes squashed against hard, cybernetic calf, Cal used the power of the hooked leg to twist and force the brute further back. Taking a gurgling cry and a slight loosening of pressure around his neck as his cue, Cal planted the infiltrator's other foot on the drone's chest and pushed hard and fast. Its spidery grip finally failing it, the creature was thrust backwards, and there was a loud crunch as it hit one of the cube's solid walls. Springing the infiltrator up, Cal slammed a knee into his dazed opponent's head. That about did it. Only eighty meters left. How the hell do we stop this thing? There, to your right, that panel. Cal turned to the illuminated panel. How's your insidion? he asked, staring at lines of obscure symbols. Forty-five meters. Try blind luck. He began pressing the symbols at random. Not a lot happening. Damn it, only fifteen meters. Taking a step back, Cal lifted the infiltrator's right leg and slammed its heel into the center of the panel, cracking it straight down the middle. Instantly, the cube began to slow, and a few moments later, it came to an abrupt stop. Zero meters, Kaya said as the cube turned blue. That was seriously impressive. Absurd luck, Cal replied as he glanced at the flawed alien. Thankfully, it was unmoving. The target's a hundred meters or so dead ahead. Cal took a couple of deep breaths. The cube's walls had once again taken on a fuzzy haze, and he tentatively stepped the infiltrator through, relieved that the floor remained solid as he did so. Clearing the energy shaft, he was faced with yet another far-reaching space, but it was a far cry from what they'd seen below. The few drones he could see were moving with purpose, but fortunately not in his direction. There was machinery in the distance coupled with huge hologram readouts. Looks like some kind of control deck he said as he moved forward, keeping the infiltrator's stride swift, but not so much as to attract attention. Keep going straight. It's dead ahead. Despite the pace he'd set, 
crossing the shiny expanse of floor seemed excruciatingly slow, every thudding footstep seeming increasingly likely to reveal their deception. There, Cal, the cylinder, that's it, that's our target. Cal saw it about fifty meters ahead. A tall, clear cylinder containing a coil of fierce, pulsating white light that looked ready to burst from its glassy prison. The cylinder was protruding from a wide hole in the floor that was bordered by a simple metal railing. There were a number of consoles close by and a similar number of aliens manning them. Other than that, the way was clear. Steadily continuing his course, Cal felt a triumphant thrill rising in his chest. Unfortunately, the thrill was short-lived. No, Cal, gods no! Cal almost stumbled upon hearing the panic in Kaya's tone. Kaya. Christ, Cal, we've got serious trouble. Cal slowed the infiltrator's stride and looked about. Where? I don't see it. Finish the mission. Destroy the signal. What? Kaya. What the hell is it? Where's the problem? Kaya. Kaya. There was no answer. The thrill that had died became a knot of fear that sunk to the pit of Cal's stomach. He felt a sudden overwhelming urge to disengage from the sink sphere, but the sound of heavy footfall abruptly muted the urge. He cursed, whipping his head around. In his confusion, he'd slowed the infiltrator's pace and was now stumbling in the empty expanse like a delirious drunk. Two aliens, the same yellow-skinned, long-fingered breed that he'd faced in the lift, were bolting directly at him. Cal turned to run, but the nearest alien threw itself forwards, crashing heavily to the ground and managing to wrap three of its long, steely fingers around the infiltrator's ankle. Breaking his inevitable fall, Cal immediately twisted to get a better view of his attackers. The second alien was already caught up and was now looming over him, all four spidery hands reaching down. Unwilling to get into another grappling match, Cal planted a devastating kick to the inside of its knee joint. As the alien crumpled to the ground, he sent a second kick into the face of the other attacker. Cal's fear was gone. Surging adrenaline had taken its place. Lurching the infiltrator upright, he began slamming a fist into the hand gripping the ankle. Enough bones broke for him to slip free and scramble clear. Before the two attackers had a chance to right themselves, he had the infiltrator back on its feet and was bolting towards the cylindrical target. The time for remaining inconspicuous had well and truly passed. A suspicion was growing in Cal's mind as to Kaya's panic, but he pushed it aside. In the next few seconds, all that mattered was the cylinder. He could sense that the two aliens he'd floored were already giving chase, but they didn't worry him. Not much could catch a synthetic running at full speed. There were, however, more ahead. Every drone within earshot had turned its attention to the commotion, and, as he closed in on the target, they moved to intercept. Cal ignored them. They were nothing more than a blur. All of his focus was on the cylinder. Contact Star Splinter! He shouted as he thrust an open palm into the face of an intercepting drone. The plan is a go! The strike lifted the attacking alien off its feet. Repeat, the plan is a go! Cal didn't even see his victim hit the floor before he was slamming the infiltrator's shoulder into the next interceptor. Engage! His heart thundering in his chest, Cal slipped under the desperate grasp of a long-armed alien, sprang up, and in one fluid motion leaped onto the huge cylinder's protective railing. Bright, pulsating light filled his vision as he launched the infiltrator out over the gap. As its heavy form sailed through the air, Cal instinctively put a cybernetic hand to its torso, to the very place where the helix bomb was concealed. The very moment before the infiltrator's head collided with the glass, Cal shouted one last word. Detonate! Chapter 41 The Plan is a Go Repeat, the plan is a go! Cal's voice was loud and clear within the Star Splinter's cockpit as it sounded out through the comm unit. Jumper turned to Victor, who sat front and center in the piloting chair. Okay, kid, this is it, he said before leaning down to the comm. Eddie, Toka, we're a go. Victor's fingers glided swiftly across the control panel before him. Right, he said, taking a deep breath. Firing the packs now. Jumper nodded and opened up a view of the distant prison camp on the cockpit's window. The Star Splinter's cannons had been pre-programmed to fire the packs, each filled with thousands of XL serum syringes to precise points within the camp. Already Jumper could see the packs speeding in high arcs through the dark skies, hover stabilizers battling against the ever-increasing winds. That storm's coming in quick, 
Victor observed, slipping his skinny arms into the ship's flight controls and shooting Jumper a nervous smile. Don't worry, kid. It would only help to confuse the enemy. It's a good thing. Jumper hoped he sounded more confident than he felt. Yeah, I guess, Victor replied as he activated the Star Splinter's launch engines. Lawrence stood up as a deep boom reverberated from the direction of the distant Insidion base. Well done, Callum, he muttered to himself. Turning away from the noise, he looked towards the opposite horizon. After a few moments, he saw multiple black shapes arching through the ever-darkening skies. He allowed himself a grin and looked about at the men and women working around him. They were hiding their nerves well. Okay, people, he bellowed. This is it. Eyes up. Simultaneously abandoning their mining machinery, they all looked up and tracked the paths of the black shapes tearing through the sky. Lawrence turned his gaze to the Karkarian drone that had been stalking nearby. As he knew it would, his shouting had attracted its attention, and it now had him locked in a deathly stare. That's right, you son of a bitch. We're done with your little slave camp, Lawrence snarled, his heart thumping madly as he crouched down and snatched up a fist-sized rock. He'd been wanting to do this for what seemed an eternity, and he couldn't help but grin as he brought his arm back. Come on then, you big bastard. He threw the rock with all his might straight at the drone's head. Unfortunately, the swell of satisfaction that surged through him as the rock left his hand died when the big bastard in question casually plucked it out of the air with one clawed fist. Despite this lack of success, Lawrence's grin remained, faltering only slightly as the drone crushed the rock and let the wind take its remains. Lawrence wanted to continue his defiant stare, but the warning voice echoing in the back of his mind was becoming almost deafening. Time to run, you fool! Clear a path! he cried as he turned and began scrambling over the rocks. He didn't bother risking a glance back. The fear in the eyes of his fellow prisoners stumbling out of his way told him the Karkarian drone was already in pursuit. Other than the trial of Cal's bright green serum, Lawrence couldn't remember the last time he'd run. He'd certainly not done any during his time in the prison camp. Such an act would have attracted unwanted attention, and he was definitely no runner before the invasion. The experience was exhilarating, but at the same time utterly exhausting. He'd spent a lot of time in the past weeks building his strength, but his cardiovascular fitness remained a joke. Sucking in ragged, desperate lungfuls of air, his arms and legs started to burn almost unbearably. If it weren't for the pissed-off alien hot on his tail, fueling his adrenaline, Lawrence imagined he'd be a wheezing wreck by now. The storm was closing in, the winds whipping up like a squall. Huge piles of discarded rock dust lay a short distance ahead. Lawrence bolted straight toward them. Even over the noise of the wind, he could hear his pursuers pounding feats and snorts of exertion close behind. In the corner of his eye, he caught a large black shape gliding steadily to the ground. He risked a quick glance and was glad to see his fellows converging on the pack. He wished he was with them. He might even have turned to fight if he had some of that bright green liquid pulsating through his veins. Perhaps foolishly, however, he'd given Cal's extra samples to a couple of his more fearful comrades. Still, even without the serum, he was doing a good job leading the drone away from the packs. With any luck, his efforts would buy valuable time for the syringes to be distributed. A series of particularly violent gusts of wind suddenly barreled their way through the mine ahead, picking up large quantities of rock dust as they did so. Lawrence covered his eyes as best he could. If the winds continued like this, he soon wouldn't be able to see a thing. But he surged on, and as he did, it began to dawn on him that his pursuer might actually be struggling to catch him. Maybe these hulking Karkarians with their formidable muscular frames just weren't built for speed. Maybe he'd even outrun the bastard. A savage blow to the back of his right shoulder brought the thought to a sudden and painful end. Without a hope in hell of keeping his feet under him, Lawrence flew forwards and inevitably downwards. Only with the help of a particularly strong sidewind did he manage to twist his body before pounding into a large pile of rock dust. With his breath knocked out of him, Lawrence kept his arms up, shielding his eyes from the gritty, gusting air. Squinting, he forced himself to look. The dark mass of the Karkarian drone was looming over him, white fangs and pale eyes gleaming brightly through the grey. His chest heaving, Lawrence managed to regain just enough breath to mumble a curse, but not a lot else. At the very moment the infiltrator ceased to be, the feelers within the sink sphere lowered Cal to the floor and disengaged. Disorientated, 
He stood on unsteady feet for a moment, shaking his head and rubbing at his face. Having a massive bomb explode within your gut was a strange sensation to say the least, no matter how fleeting the experience. He hoped to God the explosion had done its job. The plan on the planet's surface would be well underway by now, and without weapons, the chances of success would be bleak. Once he'd gained enough sense of self, Cal tore away the sink suit material covering his head and face and turned to the sphere's door release. Then he paused, his finger hovering just short of the button. What had made Kaya panic in such a way? What had forced her to disconnect the communication link? Pirates? What else could it be? He moved his finger to the left and pressed a different control. The interior wall of the sphere began to melt away to give him the same 360-degree view of the lab he'd had earlier. His blood turned to ice. Only a handful of paces from the sphere's base stood a rough-looking man who was staring directly up at the sphere, directly at him. Cal knew the man couldn't see him through the one-way glass. All he'd be seeing was his own unpleasant reflection distorted on the sphere's shiny outer surface. Still, the fact didn't make the stranger's proximity any less disconcerting. There was an old-fashioned bolt rifle slung over one of his shoulders and a modern pulse rifle slung over the other. He wore a long coat of dark, scuffed leather, beneath which Cal could see the glint of multiple knives as well as a pair of pulse pistols holstered on his hips. Bloody weird, eh? the man shouted without taking his eyes from the sphere. Hearing no response, he scratched roughly at his thick chin stubble and turned towards the lab's entrance to repeat his statement. Oi, I said check it out. Bloody weird, eh? Shut your damn face, Fallon. Get on with the job. Cal looked toward the man who'd replied. He was older, tall, and thin with sharp, hawk-like features. Even from this distance, Cal could see that those features were twisted into an impatient sneer. Three others also lingered near the lab's entrance. Another man busily tapping away at a console, and two tall, bald women, one of whom had black tattoos covering her face and skull. The two tall, bald women could easily have been twins. The sight of the pair ignited a sickening feeling in Cal. There were other intruders milling about the lab, but he couldn't tear his attention from the bald women. The one without tattoos had an arm wrapped around Kaya's neck and was brutally twisting one of her wrists up behind her back. Kaya looked to be struggling for breath and was tugging desperately with her free hand at the woman's grip. She had two long cuts across her torso, the red blood bright against her pale bodysuit. Cal pressed his clenched fists against his forehead and swore angrily under his breath. There was no doubt the intruders were pirates. There was also no doubt that the two bald twins were not women, nor indeed were they human. As Victor brought the star splinter into land, Jumper magnified the view of the prison camp in the cockpit's window. Of course, without a force field, it was arguably no longer a prison. Melinda had seen to that. There she is, Victor shouted, relief plain in his voice. Through the enhanced window, Melinda could be seen speedily making her way across the rocky landscape back towards the star splinter. No longer concerned with going unnoticed, her face was uncovered and her blonde hair was hanging free. The star splinter's landing was less than smooth, but it did the job. Well done, kid, Jumper said, putting a reassuring hand on his shoulder. He looked towards the distant Insidion base. As yet, there was no obvious activity. Maybe Carl and Kaya's explosion had thrown them into disarray, he mused hopefully. In contrast, the once prison camp was now a hive of activity. The escaping prisoners had divided up and were converging on the hover packs. With any luck, every single one of them would receive a dose of the serum. There was, after all, a lot of rough terrain for them to cover in order to reach the star splinter and the weapons. Make sure you keep the engines fired up, kid. I've got a feeling this might be tight, he said, glancing again towards the Insidion base. Don't worry about me, Jumper. It's those two idiots down below you should be worrying about. Jumper nodded. The boy had a point. By the time he made it down to the Star Splinter's loading bay, Eddie and Toka had opened the cargo doors and activated the all-terrain shifters, which were already transporting the huge crates of weaponry out onto the dark, rocky plateau. Good job, he shouted to the pair, making sure his voice could be heard over the gusts of sulfur-infused air swirling about the bowels of the ship. No problem, Toka replied confidently. The young man looked more composed than Jumper had ever seen him, perhaps sobered by the number of lives depending on him. 
Melinda's just arrived. She's opening up the crates. We'll help dish them out once the prisoners arrive. Jumper nodded his approval and looked down the ramp at Eddie. The girl was wild-eyed and looked ready to sprint solo to the Insidion base to finish what the Helix bomb had started. Turning to him, she jogged up the ramp, an Excel syringe grasped tightly in her hand. Time to dose ourselves up yet, Jay? She asked, even though she was probably still feeling the effects of her first dose. Jumper looked out of the cargo doors, eyes watering against the fierce wind. There was no sign of the escaping prisoners yet, but it wouldn't be long. Yes, Eddie, it's time. Without taking his eyes from the dark horizon, he reached for his own syringe and pressed it to his neck. The Karkarian drone thrust its massive clawed hands down at Lawrence, grasped him by the front of his ragged shirt and hauled him into the air. Lawrence kicked furiously at his attacker's legs and repeatedly slammed both of his fists into the drone's face. It was futile. Although it was tough to see through the torrent of dust-filled air, Lawrence could have sworn there was amusement on the alien's feline-like face. Where the hell are you, Tark? He thought desperately as the beast lowered him to the ground. With one of the clawed fists still clamped to his shirt, Lawrence stopped struggling and watched helplessly as the drone raised its other fist like a big black hammer. Accepting his fate, Lawrence ignored the stinging rock dust and stared directly into the cold grey eyes before him. Then he surprised himself by letting out a loud, mocking laugh. It seemed his newfound bravery was going to stick with him until the bitter end. A shame then that the end was only seconds away. A gust of wind erupted, so fierce that Lawrence was forced to break his defiant stare and shield his eyes. When he finally uncovered them, he found his shirt had been ripped clean in half and was now flapping free. Confused, he looked about with rapidly blinking eyes. The drone was nowhere to be seen. After a moment of confused searching, he detected movement to his right. Moving cautiously toward it, a lull in the wind improved the visibility enough for him to see his attacker lying on the ground. It wasn't alone. Two Karkarians with grey swirling patterns marking their skin were savagely beating the drone. Tark's friends. My friends. The ferocious pair were concentrating their attack on the slug-like creature clinging to the fallen drone's neck. Despite the stinging rock dust, Lawrence watched on with horrified fascination. The Karkarians began clawing and tugging at the wriggling creature, which was now little more than a pulpy mass of dark flesh. Eventually, they succeeded in ripping it free from their long-dead comrade, its tiny, pale tendrils hanging limp. Raising the ruined creature to its mouth, one of the Karkarians proceeded to sink its fangs into the pulpy flesh, then triumphantly tore it in two. Lawrence couldn't help but shudder as the two aliens raised their clawed fists to the rumbling storm clouds and let out blood-curdling roars. Quite a sight, don't you think? came Tark's voice in an uncharacteristically loud tone. The little man stepped up beside him, his white dreadlocks flying like the swirling tentacles of some albino creature of the deep. His eyes were fixed on his Karkarians. You were right, Lawrence shouted over the howl of the wind. No problem fighting. The ash war paint's formidable, eh? Yes, Lawrence agreed, although he found it difficult to imagine a situation when the creatures wouldn't look formidable. Attempting to study them further through the grit, he noticed tight bindings covering their necks and running down their spines, a crude but seemingly effective protection from the neck slugs. Tark turned to face him. Here you go! He held out a glass syringe, its green contents glowing brightly in the bleak air. The little man cracked a wide grin. Might help you put up a bit more of a fight next time, eh? Lawrence nodded with a half grin and gratefully plucked the syringe from his little friend's hand. Chapter 42 Best Laid Plans Fucking pirates. How the hell did they beat the Aurelian's warning sensors? A barrage of curses coursed through Cal's mind. The plan was well underway. There'd be no stopping that now. He and Kai had just achieved a near miracle, and he had no doubt that the Helix Bomb had done its job. But now, fate had gone and punched them full in the face. Why the hell did they get two synthetics? And who the hell broke their behavior inhibitors? It took a few deep breaths. He had to calm down. He had to focus. Turning about within the sphere, he made sure he was aware of everyone in the room. Fortunately, they were all situated in the direction of the lab's entrance. 
as well as the man in the long coat, who was still standing near the base of the sphere, and the two men standing near the synthetics, there were three other men idly roaming the room. Even at a glance, it was clear they were as fond of weaponry as their long-coated friend. There was also a woman, short, with spiky brown hair. She was standing apart from the others, leaning against a desk and clutching her left arm with a pained expression. Not everyone was standing. There was a lifeless body sprawled on the floor halfway to the lab's entrance. Kaya's handiwork, Cal thought as he scanned back toward the console surrounding the sink sphere. A moment later, he saw what he was looking for, a discarded syringe. Kaya had injected a dose of XL and put up a good fight. Unfortunately, she'd ended up in the clutches of a synthetic, and that was where her fight had finished. No amount of XL could match a human to a synthetic's cybernetic strength and speed. Even so, Cal would have given anything for one of those little syringes. His eyes swept over the nearby consoles, but he saw none. There was something, though. Kaya's control wand lay on the floor not far from the heavy boots of the long-coated pirate. It wasn't much, but it was something. Will you hurry the hell up, Finch? The shout came from the older hawk-faced man who was standing near the synthetics. He was aiming his small, dark eyes at the man next to him, who was tapping away at a console. In case you've forgotten, there's some nasty fucking aliens down on that planet. Get the hell on with it. The man at the console shrugged without looking up from the screen. They can't see us. Besides, I've been acting to the ship's system for a while now. The hawk-faced man pressed his palms on the edge of the console and leaned forward. So why the hell didn't you tell me? Again, Finch shrugged, seemingly unperturbed by the sharp tone. Shaky chain of command, Cal noted, something that could work in his favour. Again, not much, but something. I've been poking around, Finch replied nonchalantly, still not bothering to look up from the console. Well, hello, what have you been up to, woman? He said, finally lifting his eyes to turn and regard Kaya. Kaya had gone limp in the synthetic's tight grip, but still appeared conscious. What? What is it? The hawk-faced man asked irritably, leaning in closer to get a better look at the screen. Somehow this clever little bitch has hooked into one of those starships drifting out by the moons. Cal cursed. The sight of the synthetics and his fear for Kaya had distracted him from the dropships. They should have been en route to the planet's surface by now. He could easily activate them from any one of the multiple consoles throughout the lab, but what was he going to do? Step out of the sphere and politely ask for a pause until he'd seen to an urgent task? With his eyes back to the console, Finch suddenly barked a laugh. God knows what the bitch is up to, but she has the bloody great thing all powered up and ready to go. Even the dropships are prepped and programmed to... The hawk-faced man grabbed him by the shoulder and roughly pulled him around until they stood face to face. Stick to the bloody mission, Finch. Untroubled by the sudden violence, Finch simply grinned, creating a standoff, which lasted for some time until the spiky-haired woman broke the silence. Oh, bloody well get on with it, Finch, she shouted across the lab. I've got a pilot this frickin' vessel and that bloody bitch has smashed my arm good and proper. Finch ignored her protests. What are you gonna do, Wreck? Bust me up? Don't expect any of these idiots to run the ship's systems, he said to the hawk-faced man. Oh, bloody well run em, Wreck Vit, the spiky woman blurted. You got a pilot, Finch said quickly. Ain't easy to do both at once, especially with that dangly arm of yours. Finally breaking eye contact, Rekvit turned his hawk-like gaze towards the tattooed synthetic. The tall, cybernetic woman took a step towards them, her face impassive. Finch's eyes flicked nervously towards her. Then he snorted a laugh and pulled Rekvit's hand off his shoulder. Easy, eh? I was just screwing with you, Rek. No need to get your pet involved, he said, backing up a few steps and raising his hands. Peace. I'll get on with it. I'll look forward to hearing you explain to the boss why you missed the opportunity of swiping a Class One military starship. Finch didn't get to finish his sentence. In fact, his face slammed so hard into the console that there was very little chance he'd ever do anything again. Cal blinked in surprise, unsure of exactly what he'd seen. The tattooed synthetic hadn't been responsible, she'd not moved an inch. Neither had it been Rackfit. The man's hawk-like face was speckled with blood, and he wore an expression somewhere between shock and anger as he watched Finch's limp body slide almost comically down the sloped console to crumple to the floor. A moment later, Rekvit turned his shocked gaze towards Kaya. She was no longer limp in the synthetic's embrace and was once again struggling in defiance. The corner of Cal's mouth twitched as it dawned on him what had happened. 
Having spotted Finch backing up towards her, Kaya had seemingly kicked the unwitting man in the back. With the Excel in her system, the kick had probably contained all the force of a speeding hover truck. What the? What the? Reckvit was staring disbelievingly at Kaya. Then he looked accusingly to the face of the synthetic holding her. The woman seems unnaturally strong, the synthetic woman explained in a monotone voice. No fucking shit, Reckvit spat. He still appeared stunned as he turned towards the bloodstained console and stared at it dumbly. His fists were bald, knuckles pure white. The commotion had attracted the full attention of everyone in the lab, including the long-coated man who had finally turned away from the sphere. After a few moments, Reckvit raised his hand and looked about. Okay, everyone just bloody well stay calm, he barked, his own voice completely devoid of calm. He whipped his head around towards the tattooed synthetic. Get on this console, he shouted at her. Activate the ship's flight controls. And hurry the hell up, the woman with the spiky hair added. My arm's freaking killing me. The tattooed synthetic took hold of Finch's lifeless right ankle and pulled him aside like an obstructing sack of rubbish. Then she turned her attention to the bloodstained console. No more delays, Regvit barked, looking around the room, his cold, hard eyes hammering the point home. We're taking control of this ship and getting the hell out of here. Cal pressed his knuckles into his forehead, teeth grinding, temples throbbing. If it was just humans, but two synthetics. Even one would have rendered his chances impossible, but two? Shit. Shit. Visions flared into his mind. The faces of his friends, the countless prisoners. He could only imagine their desperation waiting for the dropships. Cal had never been one to give in to despair, but as he looked across the lab again at Kaya's beautiful face strained in futile struggle, he suddenly found himself dropping to his knees. In a few moments, he would burst from the sphere. He'd give it everything he had, rain down as much destruction as he could, but... Shaking his head, Cal steeled himself and began to rise. Then he saw it, a bright green smudge in his peripheral vision. The syringe had been placed neatly on the sink sphere's platform, right at the foot of the exit. How the hell had he missed it? He cursed his stupid mistake, then managed something close to a smile. God bless you, Kaya Svensson. The sink sphere's door was little louder than a soft breath as it slid open. A couple of seconds was all it took for him to reach out and snatch up the syringe before reclosing the door. Not one of the pirates noticed, not even the long-coated man who stood a few meters away, nor the synthetics with their hypersensitive hearing. They were all too preoccupied, listening, or at least giving the impression of listening to Reckfit, who continued to bark out orders. Still crouched, Cal wasted no time pressing the syringe to his neck. He could feel a glimmer of hope expanding within his mind. With Excel coursing through his system, maybe there was a chance, an upgrade from impossible to poor, but he was grateful nonetheless. As the serum ignited within him, he stood and scanned the lab one last time, taking in the position of each and every one of his opponents. And you, you good-for-nothing mechanical bitch, Regvit rasped, addressing the synthetic who was restraining Kaya. Keep that little wildcat under control. The synthetic stared at the hawk-faced man with soulless eyes. After a few moments, she asked in an equally soulless voice, Should I render her unconscious? Regvit paused in thought rubbing at his angular face. Yes, he said eventually, but don't bloody well kill her. The boss wants her alive and intact. Got it? Yes, the synthetic woman replied and immediately began tightening her neck hold. Kaya's struggles became more desperate, her expression even more strained. Cal had seen enough. His body felt ready to explode with strength and the sight of Kaya's desperation only fueled it further. He had no plan, just instincts, perhaps some dirty tricks, and hopefully some blind luck. He pushed his finger against the sphere's door release and leapt out. Jumper stared up at the dark red skies, disturbed by the lack of dropships. Picking up his long eye bliss rifle, he set its sights on the Insidion base. Still no activity. The helix bomb had definitely detonated. The Star Splinter's scanners had confirmed that. Then, just to be sure, he had popped off a couple of test rounds with a pulse rifle. He'd never particularly liked the pulse weapons, but his relief at its functioning was palpable. The Insidions wouldn't remain idle for long, and he suspected their reaction would be brutal when it came. That thought probably should have caused a good deal of fear. 
but that was a hard emotion to give into when you had XL searing through your veins. Shifting the rifle's sights, he focused on the prisoners emerging from the swirling clouds of grit. As planned, they were running across the harsh landscape in droves, directly towards the plateau on which the Star Splinter sat. How are they doing? Turker asked. He looked energized to his core and was pacing back and forth along the rows of weapon-filled crates. Are they on their way? Oh, they're on their way, all right, Jumper replied, and they're moving fast. Shouldn't be long before we're dishing out weapons. He twisted around to his left. Victor's large mechanical battle spider was hunched next to him on its eight sword-like legs. Any sign of the dropships yet, Victor? Still nothing. Victor's reply had a metallic shrill as it sounded from the battle spider's sound emitter. I don't understand. They should have activated them ages ago. Something must have gone wrong. Ain't nothing gone wrong, Eddie said casually. She was squatting down next to her beloved Gibson gun and staring toward the approaching storm. Cal and the Lady Doc can take care of things. They're probably just hanging back a bit, giving us a chance to get some fighting in, test out the enemy. She sniffed, then spat on one of the gun's barrels and gave it a vigorous rub with her sleeve. Course, the time them bloody aliens is taking, we ain't likely to see any action. Can't you activate the dropships, Vic? Toker asked hopefully. No, we've already talked about this. Only the Aurelian systems can activate them. The boy was tetchy obviously frustrated that a technological problem had arisen beyond his ability to remedy. Okay, bro, take it easy. How's about contacting them? No good. We're still cloaked. So is the Aurelian. If we start communicating, then our cover could be blown, and then the Insidions might... Sure, sure, I get it. Jumper had a bad feeling the boy was right. Something must have gone wrong on board the Aurelian. Something pretty damn serious to prevent Cal from launching those dropships. What should we do, Jumper? Toker asked, stopping his pacing to look at him expectantly. Jumper kept his face as calm and composed as ever, though his mind was anything but. He wasn't keen on this new role as leader. His talents lay in survival, one-on-one -on -one combat, and making solo tactical decisions when the problem was laid out in front of him, or indeed actively trying to eat him. But these decisions with multiple factors and other people involved, it wasn't his strong point. He'd spent decades on his own, ordering and answering to no one but himself. Whatever decisions he made right at this moment would affect thousands. The pressure was a little overwhelming. He began to sift logically through his options, and did his best to bring his whirling mind in line with his outward expression. Before he could manage it, however, Victor's shrill metallic voice interrupted his efforts. There's something! Something's happening! The dropships! Jumper asked hopefully. But as he said it, he realized that wasn't what the boy was referring to. Even the distortion of the mechanical spider's sound emitter didn't mask the panic in his young friend's voice. The Insidion base! One of the blocks! It's coming apart! Lawrence's eyes felt raw from all the rock dust that had assaulted them. They were watering like crazy, making it hard to see. A problem that the constant flashes of lightning wasn't helping. Damn this bloody dry storm! He'd been right. It seemed Mother Nature did want to join the battle. The winds were the worst he'd ever witnessed, and they seemed insistent on refusing a direction. Even with the XL serum feeding his muscles, he'd almost been blown off his feet numerous times already. In two bounds, he leaped to the top of a pile of boulders and scanned the landscape. We're lucky the twins are in full force, Tark shouted at him. The little man had remained close by his side the entire time. Yes, Lawrence replied, looking to the horizon. At least something's working in our favor. The two monstrous volcanoes that dominated the northern horizon were spewing huge volumes of fiery magma into the dark skies. He and Cal had chosen the massive twin peaks as a point of reference for the escape. Trying to ignore the temptation to rub his eyes, Lawrence looked around at the scores of running bodies. At first, most of his fellows had become confused and scattered within the blizzard of rock dust. But now, as they gained distance from the prison camp's mine, the air had become clearer and all eyes had fixed on the gap between the two massive volcanoes. If Callum had remained true to his word, a great horde of weapons lay ahead, as well as a fleet of dropships. Shouldn't be far now, he shouted. Let's hope not, Tark replied, and edged to his voice. Lawrence turned and followed the little man's gaze. He was looking at the distant alien base, ghostly pale in the grey air. Something was happening to one of the block-like structures. Multiple silver dots were breaking away from it and rapidly rising into the rumbling black storm clouds above. Lawrence felt his heart thud faster and stronger. 
They're coming! he bellowed. With Tark close behind, he leapt off his perch and joined the mass of bodies surging like a swarm controlled by one brain, their destination clear. Chapter 43 Uninvited As he leaped from the platform, Cal had already decided not to go for any of the unsuspecting pirates' guns. There was no way of knowing if they were charged or even loaded, and he was unwilling to risk his element of surprise. With his back turned to the sink sphere, the man knew nothing of Cal's presence until he'd slammed into him. Wrapping an arm around the pirate's neck, Cal used his other to reach for one of his many knives. With the benefit of the XL, his actions were lightning fast, and before the bewildered man could register what was happening, Cal had withdrawn one of the knives and thrown it at the woman with the short, spiky hair. Whether due to blind luck or the XL fine-tuning his abilities, the heavy knife spun through the air in a blur until the metal handle struck the woman directly on the forehead. She was unconscious before hitting the floor. Making a clumsy grapple for one of his holstered pistols, the pirate in Cal's grasp tried to twist around, almost breaking his own neck in the process. With no intention of fighting fair, Cal slammed his forehead into the side of the man's head, knocking him out cold. Before dropping to the floor, however, the pirate's body convulsed as multiple pulse blasts tore mercilessly through his frame. Having predicted this, Cal was already throwing himself to the ground, aiming for the relative safety of the nearest console. He wasn't quick enough. The pulse blast spun his body in mid-air, and as he crashed to the deck, a searing pain ignited across his ribs on the right side of his body. Even with the benefit of the XL, the pain was excruciating. Ignoring it as best he could, he scrambled back against the console, pressing himself hard against its life-saving cover. Pounding vibrations rocked his spine as the pulse blasts pummeled the console. He stayed put, putting his full trust in the robustness of the Aurelian's construction. At least the helix bomb had done its job. That was something. Eventually the blasting ceased and was replaced by a stony, almost eerie silence. The acrid smell of burning flesh filled Cal's nose. He looked at his torso to see that the right side of his sink suit had been scorched away, revealing a bloody mess. He winced, eyes pressed shut as he swore under his breath. Even with the XL, he'd not been quick enough. But he wasn't finished yet, not by a long shot. Trying to push the thoughts of the injury and its implications aside, he searched for Kaya's discarded control wand. As it turned out, it was practically sitting on the little device. Gratefully, he plucked it off the floor and slid it through a hole in his sleeve. A small piece of luck in a huge crap pile of misfortune. A man's voice broke the silence. Guns are working again, boss. No shit, you imbecile. No one fires another shot till I give the order. Got it? Cal recognized the voice. It was the hawk-faced man, Wreckfit. Unfortunately, he sounded far more composed than Cal would have liked. Do you hear that, young man? Wreckfit shouted. No one's going to fire another shot until I give the order. Now I won't give that order if you go ahead and stand up with your hands raised. Ignoring the empty promise, Cal fixed his attention on the lifeless form of the pirate who lay sprawled in a bloody mess close by. It seemed his appearance had shocked them enough that they'd accidentally shot their comrade. Or maybe they just didn't give a shit. Grinding his teeth as his pain flared, Cal stretched out a leg, hooked his foot under the strap of the bolt rifle still slung across the dead man's back and pulled the body towards him. Even with his injury, the XL made the act virtually effortless. I reckon he might be dead, Wreck. I think I caught him with one of my shots. I don't think so, Wreckfit replied. You're not dead, are you, young man? If you're unable to stand, just go ahead and yell out or crawl your way into the open and we'll come and patch you up. If there wasn't so much at stake and he wasn't in so much pain, Cal might have laughed at that. Don't waste our time, Wreckfit continued. You're sorely outnumbered. How long do you think this will last? Cal set about removing all of the dead pirate's guns. As well as the old-fashioned bolt rifle, there was a five-click pulse rifle and a pair of identical needle-shot pistols, all charged and fully loaded. Ripping a sleeve from his sink suit, he folded it, and with a sharp intake of breath, pressed it against the wound in his side. Then he used the strap from the old bolt rifle to bind it. It would go at least some way to stemming the blood flow. Carefully slinging the five-click pulse rifle over his back, he took up a pistol in each hand and readied himself. He would need to let them know that he was armed and most definitely dangerous. I'm running out of patience, Rekvik called out. Turning to face the console, 
Cal raised a pistol above its edge and, careful not to aim anywhere near Kaya, fired a torrent of random shots. Confident that the occupants of the room would be taking cover, he raised the second pistol, peered over the console, and ceased his random fire. He waited. There, a raised head, one of the men near the big screens. Cal shot him and was down behind his console again before the inevitable barrage of return fire. A little less outnumbered, he thought with grim satisfaction. He'd always been a good shot, but the XL made him a marksman without equal. Fuck! Diggs is down, Wreck! Bastard shot him right in the head! Shut up and stay put till I say. There was a long silence. Taking advantage of the moment of calm, Cal considered his next move. He'd be damn lucky to pull off the same trick twice. To stand any chance, he'd have to get inventive. That was a fine shot, friend, Rekvitz shouted. His voice was still calm, but it was fast-sounding forced, an underlying edge of anger and possibly fear. Might be that you were just lucky, though, eh? I'm saving my luck for a difficult fight, Cal shouted back, trying his best not to let his pain seep into his voice. Let the girl go, and I'll allow you all to leave unhurt. As soon as he'd finished shouting the words, he began shifting himself along the floor with as much stealth as he could manage. None of the pirates would take his words seriously, no more than he had theirs, but with any luck they'd keep their weapons trained on the spot they'd heard his voice. The console behind which he'd taken cover was the first in a long line. They curved around the center of the lab in a wide arc, and if he stayed low, he could move alongside them without revealing his position. The fact that his left side felt as though it was being eaten away by acid didn't make stealth an easy thing to achieve. Nor did the pulse rifle slung over his back. But fortunately any noise he made was drowned out by Rekvit's loud rambling. He was still making a feeble attempt to weed him out without losing any more men. Cal knew his type well. His concern would be for his reputation rather than the well-being of his comrades. He also suspected there was a good deal of fear encouraging the man's efforts. The boss wants her alive and intact. Even in the pirate world, there was always someone to answer to, and when mistakes were made in that world, a shot through the head was the preferred method of demotion. The girl is important to you, Rekvit bellowed. I'd hate to be forced to treat her the same way you did Diggs. She has such a pretty head, it would be a shame to ruin it. Cal gritted his teeth. Empty threats. He already knew Kaya was valuable to them. Their intentions had become as clear as day. Technology was their bounty, and based on their ability to track and commandeer the Aurelian, and the fact they had two synthetics, made it clear they were way beyond the average crew of pirates. They wanted the ship, and with it, Kaya's wealth of knowledge. Cal shook his head. The insight wasn't going to help him now. Pushing the thoughts aside, he did his best to focus on the task in hand. Maybe I should just have my synthetics slowly squeeze the life out of her. What do you think about that? Rekvich shouted. Cal continued to drag himself along, breath rattling in his chest. Even bolstered by the XL, he was starting to feel his strength wane. Although a conjured mental image of throwing Rekvit out of an airlock went a little way to rekindling it. Never had he felt so much hate for a man so quickly. Still, it was good of him to keep drowning out all other sounds with his constant prattle. I think you must like the idea, Rekvit continued. You must, else you'd be standing up by now with your hands held high. Cal was starting to detect a desperate edge to his tone. Finally, he reached the end of the arc of consoles. Whatever the hell his next move was going to be, he'd have to pull it off quick. Rekvit's men were likely creeping around the lab by now in order to flush him out, and it wouldn't be long before they spotted the long smear of blood he'd left across the gleaming white floor. Remaining low, he maneuvered himself around the edge of the last console until he was sat at the front end of its base. It was painfully frustrating that the means for activating the dropships was just above his head. Even to stand for a couple of seconds, however, would have been suicide. Maybe I'll just have to send one of my synthetics after you. That's right, young chap, you heard right, a synthetic. In fact, I have two of them here with me. Have you ever witnessed the speed and strength of a synthetic? There it was. Carl had been wondering how long it would take for the synthetic card to be pulled. What do you think? Should I order one of them to come and pluck you out of your hiding place? Again, empty threats. At least Cal hoped. He strongly suspected that Rekvit, at least for the time being, wouldn't risk a valuable synthetic while he still had expendable men at his disposal. 
The synthetic would very likely succeed in carrying out the order. But Cal was armed, and even synthetics weren't infallible to a direct blast from a five-click pulse rifle. A lucky shot could cause severe damage. Just in case he was wrong, he placed the two pistols on the floor and unslung the pulse rifle from his back, feeling a little dizzy as he did so. The blood loss was starting to take its toll. If he didn't start shooting again soon, they'd be on him. Bloody get in gear, Cal. Pulling Kaya's control wand from his sleeve, he shifted himself to the edge of the console and made sure he had a decent view of the large, high screens on the far side of the lab. Pointing the wand, he brought up a live, wide-angled view of the entire lab. With their attentions fully focused on the center of the lab, neither Rekvit nor any of his crew reacted to the screen, and despite its distance, it was large enough that Cal could easily make out their positions. Nice of them to come wearing dark clothing to a largely white lab. Realizing the futility of coaxing Cal out with words, Rekvit had gone quiet. On the screen, Cal could see him busily directing his men with silent but rigorous hand signals. Seemingly unwilling to risk his own hide, the hawk-faced man had remained near the entrance. As Cal had predicted, Rekvit's three remaining men were cautiously inching their way around the lab and towards its center. Two of them held twin pistols, while the third favored a single pulse rifle. Cal was relieved to see that the two synthetics remained near Rekvit. One of them was still tapping away at a console, while the one holding Kaya stood close behind. Kaya was unconscious now, and the synthetic had thrown her limp body over her shoulder. Cal gritted his teeth. She's alive. That's what counts. He brought his attention back to the human threat. With a tight grip on the pulse rifle and finger firm on its trigger, he waited patiently for the three armed men to move a little closer. Remaining focused on the distant screen, he pinpointed the console behind which he was hiding and judged the position of the men. As he'd hoped, their attentions were firmly set on the spot where he'd shouted his reply. Taking a couple of quick breaths, he swiftly stood and with a calm efficiency that came from years of experience, thrust the muzzle of his five-click pulse rifle in the direction of the nearest man. He squeezed the trigger once and was back down behind the console before the weapon's blast had even stopped echoing around the room. What the hell? Christ, Bolin's down. Shit, shit, where did that shot come from? Back at this. Hold your position, Dietz, or I'll bloody well shoot you myself. Cal managed a grim smile as he listened to the panic he'd created. He peered at the distant screen, his lifeline, and watched the man cowering behind the consoles and workstations. It's only one bloody man. Keep your shit together. Rekvit was now far from composed and had given up trying to hide the fact. How the hell did he aim so quick? I said keep your shit together and hold your positions. Cal listened and continued to study the screen. Despite Rekvit's threats, one of the men was clumsily retreating towards the lab's exit. Damn it, Dietz, I said but Dietz didn't hear. Cal's next shot had caught the man in the left shoulder, and he was spinning to the floor with a wail. Christ! Rekvit cried disbelievingly. Even though the hawk-faced man was all the way over the other side of the lab, Cal could see him stooping down to take cover. The shot man was writhing on the floor, clutching at his shoulder and bellowing in pain. Cal could sympathize. If it weren't for the XL, he was certain that his own pain would have rendered him unconscious long ago. The man was definitely no longer a threat, which left only Rekvit and one other. Cal had a feeling that Rekvit wasn't the sort to dive into the fray, more of a long-range leader armed with long eye goggles and a comm unit. Then, of course, there were the synthetics, but Cal was doing his best not to think of them. Not easy with the remaining pirates screaming at Rekvit to let the cybernetic women off their leash. I'm telling you, Rek, this ain't right. This guy ain't right. No one can move that quick and shoot that easy. The man had to shout to be heard over the cries of pain from his flawed comrade. Cal kept his eyes glued to the screen, eagerly awaiting a chance to take the man out. Unfortunately, fear was keeping him well and truly concealed behind a workstation. Please, just send the synthetics. For all we know, he's some sort of male synthetic himself. Even with his boosted hearing, Cal could barely make out the words over the injured man's cries, which were fast becoming a shrieking howl. Shut your face! I give the goddamned orders! Rekvit reminded his last man. What'd you say? I said, Christ! Rekvit barked in frustration. Can you see Dietz? Yeah, I can see him. His bloody arm's hanging off. He's wriggling on the floor like some sort of flipping eel. Take care of him! Rekvit bellowed. I can't bloody well hear myself think over that racket. Take care of him? Yes, fucking take care of him! A few moments later, 
Cal heard two rounds from a pulse blast and saw the injured man shudder twice. Again, the room became deathly quiet. Cal clutched the five-click pulse rifle tight to his chest and shifted himself a little to get a better view of the distant screen. In particular, a better view of Wreckvit. Surely the man must have learned his lesson by now. Surely he was ready to put the problem into the hands of his precious synthetics. Cal watched closely, trying to get an idea of the hawk-faced man's intentions. Please let him be the incompetent prick I hope he is. The silence was broken by the synthetic at the console. There's activity on the planet's surface. Rekvit whipped his head around. What kind of activity? There was fear in his voice. The aliens? Yes, multiple parts of their base have detached and mobilized. Cal felt his stomach lurch. Shit, Rekvit spat. Are they coming this way? No, they are remaining well within the planet's atmosphere. But I have no way of assessing whether this vessel remains undetectable. Rekvit's tone was dropping, and Cal struggled to hear what was being said. He stared at Rekvit's strained face on the screen. What's his next move? What the hell's my next move? Out of habit, Cal looked down and checked his weapon's charge, even though he knew it was full. He squeezed his eyes shut and tried to force a solution. So far he'd done well in disabling the threat, but his injury was serious, and unless Rekvit ordered a full retreat, the worst was still to come. We're leaving! Rekvit suddenly shouted, causing Cal to hold his breath in anticipation. What? His last man cried from his hiding place. How? How do I get to the exit? That's your problem, Rekvit replied tersely before turning toward the synthetic holding Kaya. Give me the girl. You two stay here. And once you've dealt with the arsehole with the big gun, finish commandeering this ship and follow. God damn it, no. Cal strained to hear every word and watched with growing trepidation as both cybernetic women nodded their understanding. Then the synthetic holding Kaya reached up and pulled her off her shoulder like a rag doll. We'll rendezvous back at Hex, Rekvik continued as he took hold of Kaya. Then, after a brief glance in Cal's direction, he said, Try not to get yourself shot. The boss will overlook a few dead idiots, but if either of you get damaged, there'll be hell to pay. Again, the two synthetics nodded in unison, and with that, Rekvit turned to leave. Anger boiled up in Cal as he watched the man carry Kyre off through the exit. He gritted his teeth, his head suddenly pounding. It took all of his will to not jump up and attempt a last-ditch effort at saving her. He pictured himself unleashing everything he had at the synthetics and running straight for the bastard. Every instinct screamed at him to do just that, but he forced the feeling down. He wouldn't stand a chance. The synthetics would take him out before he got anywhere near. He'd failed her. Anger threatened to overwhelm him then, but he extinguished it with force of will. She's still alive, he reminded himself, something that couldn't be said about him for much longer if he didn't pull it together. He shook his head defiantly. He had to think, had to focus. Kai wasn't the only one relying on him, not by a long shot. If he didn't come up with a strategy, the synthetics would kill him efficiently and without the slightest remorse. And if that happened, the fate of those down on the planet's surface wouldn't be much better. A sudden commotion made him whip his head toward the screen. Rekvit's last man was making a dash for the exit, sending lab equipment flying as he did so. Maybe a desperate attempt at distraction, or just plain clumsy panic. Whatever it was, it didn't matter. Cal let him go. Doing his best to gain control over his anger and his fear, Cal watched the two cybernetic killers on the screen. They were moving slowly skirting in opposite directions around the room. Then, in precise unison, the pair turned towards the centre of the lab and began to stalk him. Chapter 44 Chaos Jumper had never witnessed such utter chaos. He had climbed onto a rock to get a better view of the situation and didn't like what he saw one bit. The multitude of cube ships that had detached from the distant Insidion base were now dropping from the thick storm clouds. The ships were large, maybe three times the size of the Star Splinter, their smooth, gleaming surfaces flaring brightly under the angry sky's white lightning. The ships were merciless in their descent, coming down swiftly, crushing many of the escaping prisoners beneath their huge, flat hulls. As planned, the prisoners were converging on the crates and passing the weapons back, Unfortunately, that crowd was now larger than had originally been intended, 
Only a carefully selected portion of the escaping prisoners were supposed to be arming themselves. Those selected were then to offer cover, should it be needed, while the remaining boarded the dropships. But with no dropships evident, panic and confusion had erupted, and the crates had become the sole focus of attention. Bodies were clambering, limbs were flailing, desperate fingers clawed, searching for that cold, reassuring gunmetal. Jumper, Eddie and Toka had done their best to redistribute the crates, but too many were converging all at once. In a desperate attempt to make room, Jumper had requested that Victor use his mechanical combat spider to tow some of the crates further afield. Pivoting on the rock, Jumper turned towards the star splinter. Despite his proximity, his eyes couldn't register it. As well as the ghosting net, he had instructed Victor to create a temporary force field around the ship to ensure it didn't become overrun by the confused crowds. The expanse of flat ground behind the cloaked ship was still distressingly empty. He glanced up to the skies and again found them devoid of dropships. Twisting back to the chaos, he mouthed a silent curse. Up to this point, the XL Serum had served the escaping prisoners well getting them swiftly over the jagged landscape to their destination in a fraction of the time it would otherwise have taken them. But now, with no dropships to converge on, the XL was proving a hindrance. Being their first time experiencing its effects, many of the men and women were having trouble keeping control. They were far stronger and faster, but there was suddenly no room to allow for mistakes. Further back, bodies were tumbling and crashing all over the place, perhaps due to fear and confusion, or maybe an over-eagerness to fight. Closer to the crates, however, the escapees had become pressed together like sardines in a can. Weapons were being fumbled as they were passed back, resulting in the occasional mistaken discharge. Most of the blasts disappeared harmlessly into the rumbling skies, but many tore into the mass of bodies, causing countless early casualties. Trying his best to ignore the heaving chaos, Jumper took advantage of his elevated position and concentrated on the Insidion cube ships. Those already landed had opened up, one full side of their hulls dissolving away. Peering through his bliss rifle sights, he swore, audibly this time, as he witnessed giant crab-like creatures pouring out of the cubes in nightmarish swarms. The huge beasts had dark red bodies with dirty yellow stripes crossing their broad, flat backs. Upon each back were three Carcarians, all crouched menacingly on the juddering mounts and ready to pounce. Something wrong? Toka cried up to him. Jumper looked down from his perch at his young friend's perspiring, grubby face. He and Eddie had been working tirelessly handing out the weapons, Toka shouting words of encouragement and reminding them to pass the weapons back, while Eddie shoved weapons roughly into the reaching hands, growling at anyone whose eyes fell admiringly on the Gibson gun nestled at her feet. We might have unwanted company very soon, Jumper shouted down, making sure Eddie could also hear and that she was paying attention. The big silver ships? Toka asked, looking skyward. Jumper nodded. Remember, no heroics. We stick together and stay close to the star splinter at all times. As soon as it gets too hairy, we get unbarred. You hear that, Eddie? Eddie was practically falling headfirst into a crate in order to reach the last of the weapons. When she re-emerged, she looked up at him with a shrug. Whatever you say, Jay. She shouted it with little conviction, and Jumper didn't believe for a second that the girl had taken his words in. He watched as she turned back to the mass of reaching hands and practically threw a rifle in the face of an escapee. Get shooting, she growled at the bewildered-looking man. Toka shook his head and looked up at Jumper. I'll keep an eye on her. Another cube ship dropped rapidly from the sky. This one was far closer than the rest, and Jumper had no need of his bliss rifle's sights to see the hull open up. They're getting close, Toka cried out, and without waiting for a reply said, what the hell happens if one of the bloody great things comes down on our heads? The words had barely left Toka's lips before a rapidly increasing roar sounded overhead. Jumper snapped his head up to see a silver square doorway in the black, tumulus sky. It was growing larger by the second. Run, everyone, run! He bellowed, and he wasn't the only one to shout it. Leaping off his rock, he was only vaguely aware of the mass panic erupting around him. His eyes were fixed solely on Toka and Eddie. The huge Gibson gun was already in Eddie's XL strengthened hands, and she was in the process of directing it upwards towards the fast dropping ship. Toka, having wrapped his arms around the girl, was doing his best to drag her away. Seconds later, Jumper was joining him in the effort, practically lifting the girl off her feet as the cube drew nearer. Jumper felt Eddie's tiny frame shuddering in his arms as the Gibson gun spewed out a massive surge of explosive pulse rounds. 
As he and Toka stumbled wildly across the hard, jagged terrain, Jumper saw countless prisoners struggling around and over the weapons crates to join them in running for their lives. It was suddenly getting very hot. He risked a glance up. The smooth, silvery hull was close, so close. He could make out the distorted reflections of the pale, fleeing bodies among the black rocks. He briefly wondered how the hell the strange ship was flying. He could see no thrust jets, no boosters. Faster! We gotta run fucking faster! Toka screamed in his ear. Jumper couldn't have said it better himself. He wondered if Eddie was even aware that she would very possibly be squashed flat in the next few seconds. Whether she did or not, her finger didn't ease off the Gibson gun's twin triggers for an instant. She was even continuing her fire as he and Toka threw her through the air. Even if they were crushed, she might just make it clear. As he made his final leap, Jumper's ears seemed to filter out the thundering storm and the cacophony of guns and ships. All he heard was Eddie's unrelenting battle cry and the unique sound of Toka's half-scream, half-roar. He hoped to God that those kids would survive. He simply couldn't imagine a life without them. Then every sound was overwhelmed by a horrendous boom, the sound of a massive ship meeting hard ground. Lawrence hurriedly picked himself up. He'd misjudged one of his XL-enhanced jumps and had gone head over heels as he'd hit the ground. The wind was gusting stronger than ever, and it didn't help that there were countless others running and leaping around him. Collisions were plentiful. There was blood pouring from a gash on his forehead. He couldn't really feel the injury, just as he wasn't feeling the myriad of others over his body, but this one was troublesome as the blood continuously dribbled into his eyes. He dabbed at the gash with his sleeve in an unsuccessful attempt to stem the flow. Tark landed nimbly by his side. His friend had adapted well to his new strength and speed, and was wielding it with infinitely more style and grace than Lawrence could ever hope to achieve. Without a word, the little man quickly tore a strip off his shirt and bandaged Lawrence's head. Should do the trick. Lawrence opened his mouth, but his thanks were interrupted by a pulse blast that ripped through the small space between their heads. He stumbled back in surprise, falling on his backside. Seeming unfazed by the pulse blast, Tark didn't shift an inch. It's getting pretty chaotic up there, the little man observed, looking towards the increasingly dense mass of bodies ahead. Quite a crowd. Lawrence picked himself up and nodded. They've got nowhere to go. There's still no dropships, he shouted back, trying to sound calm. And those attack ships are causing a mass panic. He looked back at one of the nearest cubes. Did you see what's coming out of them? Before Tark could answer, a man crashed to the ground in front of them. Lawrence reached down to pick him up. Run! They're coming! The crabs are coming this way! The man was young, his eyes wide as he looked desperately at Lawrence. Lawrence laid a reassuring hand on his shoulder. Go get yourself a weapon, son. We'll be barbecuing the bloody great beasts in tonight's victory feast. The words, and the confidence in which they were said, extinguished a little of the fear in the man's eyes. He straightened up and managed a shaky salute before bounding cautiously towards the heaving crowd. Tark shot Lawrence an approving smile. Nicely said. Lawrence nodded. Even as the words had left his mouth, it struck him that they'd sounded like something his father would have said. Even his tone of voice had begun to resemble his father's. A distant screeching, accompanied by multiple human shouts, seemed to hitch a ride on the howling wind. Lawrence turned to see a scramble of people surging over a distant rocky ridge. Three of the massive crab-like creatures stomped among them, Carcarians leaping off their backs to land mercilessly on their victims. Some of the escapees were running as fast as their legs could carry them. Others were putting their faith in their new power and defiantly turning to fight. Lawrence admired their bravery, but he could also see it was suicide. We should hurry! We won't stand a chance without a weapon! Tark gave a nod of agreement, and together they leapt off the rock. A few minutes later, Lawrence was deep in the crowd. He'd given up trying to control the direction he moved. Whether he was heading the right way, he had no idea. The dense mass of bodies was so tightly packed, they seemed one entity. A great number of weapons had already come his way, but reasoning that those nearest the attacking aliens would need them the most, he'd passed them all on and hoped to God they weren't being passed in a circle. He wondered how Tark was doing. He'd lost sight of the little man a while back. Suddenly, Lawrence's back pressed up against something that wasn't flesh and bone. He was rammed in so tight, however, that it took a few attempts to turn around. When he eventually managed it, he found he'd been carried right to the source of the weapon distribution. Looking left and right, he could see a long line of large metal crates. 
Bodies were pressed up hard against every single one, and those who were lucky enough to be facing in the right direction were reaching in and pulling out a myriad of weapons, some of which Lawrence didn't even recognize. The crate he was jammed up against was almost empty, but it had never been the plan for every person to be armed. On the opposite side of the crate, he saw a small, spiky-haired woman who was practically toppling head over heels in order to grab the last of the remaining weapons. When she popped up, Lawrence was surprised to see how young she was, little more than a girl. Despite her dirty face and the slightly crazed look in her eyes, she was really rather pretty. Shooting her a quick, encouraging smile, Lawrence leaned over in an attempt to grab a stinger rifle that he'd spotted. Despite his best efforts, however, the weapon remained a good finger length away from his grasp. Frustrated, he straightened up, and it was just as well he did. The wild-looking girl threw a pulse rifle at his face without the slightest warning. If it hadn't been for his enhanced reactions, Lawrence supposed that he'd have been relying on his fellows to carry his unconscious body to the dropships. The girl was shouting something inaudible at him. The expression on her face suggested they weren't gentle words of encouragement. Awkwardly passing the pulse rifle over his head, Lawrence became aware of a strange roaring noise, and those around him, including the wild-looking girl, turned their attentions heavenward. His gut lurched as he looked up, already knowing full well what he'd see. One of those huge bloody ships was coming right down on their heads. Move! Everyone get the hell out of here! Some were slow to react and continued to stare up in horror. Others were already trying to climb over the crates without much success. His instinct taking over, Lawrence reached across to the inside corner of the crate, ripped aside a safety catch and pressed a button. Immediately the crate gave way, collapsing as far as the remaining weapons inside would allow. Like water through a breach dam, Lawrence and those around him burst through the gap. A man fell and would have been trampled underfoot if Lawrence hadn't grabbed him and hauled him to his feet. Run! Run! Lawrence bellowed, and taking his own advice, began scrambling over the rocks. Just ahead, a torrent of rapid pulse fire from what must have been a massive gun was lighting up the increasing darkness with flashes of bright orange. But soon, even the noise of that weapon was drowned out as the roar overhead became almost deafening. Visions of being squashed flickered into Lawrence's mind, but he ignored them and continued running as fast as his boosted muscles would allow. He was tempted to look up, but fearful of tripping, he forced himself not to. The ship was so close that the electric white light from the dry storm was all but blocked out. The roar above his head was merciless, threatening to burst his eardrums at any moment as an intense heat began to scorch the top of his head. Suspecting that the vessel would be crushing its way onto the rocks at any second, Lawrence dove as far as his boosted, burning legs could manage. Then, quite suddenly, every last flicker of light was completely snuffed out. The two synthetic killers stalked like a pair of lionesses. Cal watched their progress intently on the distant screen. Fortunately, they were adopting a slow, deliberate approach, undoubtedly cautious of his five-click pulse rifle. Cal tried to ignore the increasing warm damp seeping from his injured side. He kept telling himself not to look down at the wound, but he couldn't resist a quick glance. It was a mess, that was for sure, and the pool of blood beneath him was a sickening sight. The blood triggered a thought, or more accurately, a memory. He was standing over Lawrence Decker's crumpled form, the faint buzz of cutting lasers the only sound to be heard. There was blood dripping from the man's nose and mouth, pooling on the floor where a single white tooth settled. Despite the events happening only a handful of months ago, it felt to Cal like a different age. He had made a decision that day, a resolution to live a life free from responsibility. The thought of it almost made him smile. The more you try to control life. Now thousands of lives were hanging in the balance, with nobody but him to tip the scales. A whole world of responsibility. Yes, fate could really be quite the bitch. He took a deep breath, and the last of his lingering fear seemed to seep out of him and run dry. An idea took shape in his mind. As the synthetics crept nearer, Cal pulled Kaya's control wand from his sleeve and assessed his new plan. Ironically, it was the morbid thought of not being able to win this fight alone that had triggered it. It was an absurdly dangerous idea that would undoubtedly result in utter chaos followed closely by his death. But all of a sudden, he felt like going out with a bang. And just maybe, the ensuing chaos would give him those precious few moments to activate the dropships. There was really no alternative, and therefore no choice. 
Without further hesitation, Cal stood, feeling more than a little dizzy as he did so, and stretched both arms out in the direction of the synthetics. In his right hand, he held the five-click pulse rifle, and in his left, the little godsend of a control wand. The two synthetics paused ever so briefly, assessing the threat now that he had so boldly revealed himself. The short length of their pause suggested he was barely considered a threat at all. Cal aimed the wand directly between the lethal pair, at a barrier inset within the far side wall, then pressed a button. The heavy barrier immediately shot up to reveal a thick layer of smart glass behind which was a brightly lit chamber and the crux of his plan. Once again, the two synthetics paused in their approach, one of them turning to observe the chamber. Within it, the Karkarian drones reacted like a couple of bloodthirsty hounds as they fought against their bonds. Much to Cal's dismay, the synthetic with the tattooed face kept her deathly stare locked on him while her partner calmly moved towards the two raging aliens. With the combined effect of the XL and his own adrenaline keeping him on his feet, Cal shuffled stiffly to his right and slowly and deliberately placed the pulse rifle down on a work surface. The tattooed synthetic watched his every move with cat-like precision, her focus concentrated on the control wand as he manipulated a couple more buttons and gave it a quick flick. Instantly, the far chamber's smart glass divided and began to separate at a pace so lethargic it seemed to be giving Cal a chance to reconsider his reckless actions. Considerably less lethargic, the smart straps binding the two Karkarians snaked free, allowing the pair to burst forward in furious symmetry to slam into the separating barrier. Satisfied, Cal locked eyes with the tattooed synthetic, placed his wand down and moved back towards his console, both hands raised in a manner of truce. She took the bait. Finally removing her lifeless eyes from him, she turned and moved to join her twin in dealing with this new, far more dangerous threat. The Karkarian drones were free now, and moving slowly into the lab, sizing up their fearless opponents with a strange mix of caution and aggression. Cal didn't wait to observe the outcome. Instead, he turned his attentions to the console below him. He'd never been overly blessed with tech skills, and he'd need every available second to activate the dropships. Trying his best to ignore the sudden eruption of noise on the other side of the lab, he got to work. Chapter 45 Time to Fight The Insidion cube ship pounded into the ground with such force that it sent a huge wave of rock fragments and black dust billowing out from its edges. Just like countless others who'd been running along beside him, Jumper hit the ground only meters from one of those edges. Remaining face down, he used his arms to shield his head as fragments of rock pummeled his body. He could feel the reassuring shape of his bliss rifle pressed against his back. He couldn't remember having slung the weapon there before making his run, but after so many years of carrying it, the action had become automatic. There were a few seconds when all that could be heard was howling wind. Then came the pop of a single distant pulse rifle. Then a shout, or more accurately a scream. Then more gunfire, nearer this time, a repeat blaster. Then a third weapon, more shouting, more screaming. Not wholly convinced that he wouldn't be blinded by rock dust, Jumper rolled over and cautiously opened his eyes, eager to check that a clawed fist wasn't about to make a grab for his spine. There was no immediate danger that he could see, but the air was still thick with grit. He dragged himself to his feet just as many others were doing around him. The sounds filling his ears were building in ferocity as those nearest him were also beginning to react. Peering upwards through the dust, he took in the strange metallic wall of the cube ship stretching vertically before him. It towered further than his eyes could see, its surface seeming to swirl as if alive. With a sudden spasm of fear, it dawned on him that the giant cube had come down where the star splinter had been. He shook his head. No, Victor must have taken off to avoid it. He was about to call out to Toker and Eddie when a particularly strong gust of wind stole his words. Within seconds, the gust had whipped away the worst of the lingering rock dust to reveal a sight that was nothing short of terrifying. Well accustomed to such sights, Jumper reacted quickly, dropping into a crouch that ensured his head remained firmly attached to his body. The huge red claw swept over him with frightening speed. Instinctively, he dove to his left, his enhanced muscles carrying him three times the distance he'd normally achieve. In one fluid, practiced movement, he rolled up onto one knee, snatched his bliss rifle from his back, and fired a series of quick, hopeful rounds at his attacker. Then he grimaced as the bliss darts pinged harmlessly off the huge, armor-like carapace. 
The crab, or whatever the hell it was, stood twice the height of a man, its sprawling spidery legs spanning a good twenty feet in width. Jumper found all his senses suddenly overwhelmed as the people around him burst into adrenaline-fueled action. Bright, fiery pulse rounds streaked through the air at erratic angles, many of which flew high, hitting the glimmering wall of the cube ship which seemed to absorb them without damage. Massive red claws snapped and swished. Long spiked legs rose and fell, thudding into the rocky terrain like thick, falling spears. Carcarian drones began dropping down from their huge mounts, joining the fray with vicious enthusiasm. Spinning his bliss rifle, Jumper allowed the weapon to slide through his hands until he was gripping its barrel. A Carcarian was leaping his way, fangs bared and clawed hands stretched open. Jumper swung the weapon with all the force that his enhanced body could manage. His aim couldn't have been better, and the crunch of the rifle's butt connecting with the alien's head was sickeningly loud. There was no time to watch it crumple to the ground before another had taken its place. Falling back into the rocks, Jumper spun the rifle again. The weapon's barrel was practically pressed against the attacking Carcarian's muscled chest when the bliss dart fired. Springing to his feet, Jumper swept his head around in search for Eddie and Toka, but was unable to see either of them. Everywhere he looked was utter mayhem, with every single human now taking a stand. Despite less than half of them having a weapon, the broken prisoners had once again become highly trained soldiers. More than that, the XL had turned them into a blur of flesh and ragged clothing as they clashed with the alien drones. Where the humans showed incredible speed, the slower Carcarians demonstrated raw power, swinging their clawed fists in thundering blows. The majority of the fights, however, were reaching sudden conclusions by pulse blasts or the razor-sharp claws of the giant crabs. Jumper could see that the battle wouldn't last long, and if it weren't for the pulse weapons would likely already be over. Even enhanced as they were, the soldiers were no match for the brute force and overwhelming numbers of the aliens. Sweat poured from Jumper as he fired shot after shot, all the while attempting a careful retreat with those around him. Occasionally, the lumbering crabs would demonstrate their speed by lunging forward to snip off a limb or even a head. Jumper tried to shut his mind off to the brutality and concentrated on his aim. The long eye bliss rifle had always been his weapon of choice, but it was a sniper's weapon, certainly not designed for close-quarter combat against an enemy that surged in such great numbers. Seeing an opportunity, Jumper slung the rifle over his back and darted between a couple of stomping armoured legs. The crab's huge body loomed over him like a roof as he skidded across the scree to grab an idle pulse weapon. He had no idea of the name of the gun, but like all others it had a trigger and that was all he needed to know. There was also a single black cylinder clamped to its side. This he did recognise. Pulling the point grenade free, he looked up. The underside of the giant crab was full of openings where its multiple legs met its body. Without a second thought, he picked his target, activated the point grenade, and jumped up to shove the little explosive deep into one of the crevices. It stuck fast. Fire in the hole! He bellowed as he barreled his way out from under the beast. As he ran, a Carcarian drone lunged at him. Swiftly bringing up his new weapon, Jumper emptied two rounds into the attacker. The drone's body was blown backwards, only to meet an opposing explosive force as the point grenade detonated. To Jumper's dismay and utter amazement, the point grenade failed to blow the monstrous crab apart. A crack had appeared down the centre of its huge shell, and two of its long, multi-jointed legs were now twitching on the ground, but still the creature stood tall. Seemingly angered by the attack, the partially mangled beast twisted slightly to fix its multitude of shiny round eyes on Jumper. Then, its remaining legs pounded the rocks as it moved towards him like some sort of mechanical killing machine. Swiftly backing up, Jumper directed his weapon and held down the trigger. Blast after blast blackened the beast's hard frame, but it did disturbingly little damage. Even the creature's eyes seemed impenetrable. Continuing to back up, Jumper risked a few glances around, and a strange realisation sank in. All the Carcarian drones were avoiding him. It was as if the giant crab had labelled him as its opponent, and its fellows were respectfully acknowledging the claim. In that moment, it occurred to Jumper that this was perhaps nothing more than a game to these invaders, a sort of sick entertainment. He'd already wondered why such a technologically advanced race were not making more use of weaponry. Maybe they relished the physical combat. The fact that they had created a technology to disable weaponry went a long way in supporting such a theory. These hijacked bodies were the only weapons they needed, and if Kaya was correct in her theories, the invaders themselves would have no risk of injury or death. 
the bodies were simply avatars, much the same as Kaya's infiltrator. Jumper grimaced at the realization. He wouldn't be surprised to find slug-like insidions beneath each and every one of the massive crab carapaces. Probably an avatar of choice. The bastards were near indestructible. With a long practice calm, Jumper began targeting different areas of the huge armoured body as it closed on him, systematically searching for weakness. Before he found any, however, the gun ceased firing, putting an instant dent in his calm. Glancing down, he saw a red blinking light on its side. Throwing the useless weapon to the ground, he again snatched his bliss rifle from his back and considered the option of turning and running as fast as his Excel-enhanced legs could manage. As appealing as the thought was, he couldn't bring himself to turn his back on the brute. Besides, someone had to take it down. Then, someone was by his side. Toka was holding a big ten-click pulse rifle in his hands, the powerful blasts of which caused the massive crab not only to pause in its attack, but even retreat a little. Need some help? he shouted, the pulse blasts illuminating his wide, determined eyes. The sight of his young friend sent a wave of relief through Jumper. That's one accounted for. Much obliged, he shouted back. India boat! Yeah, but I lost her a couple of... Jumper's ears were suddenly assaulted by a familiar noise that completely drowned out the rest of Toka's words. The sound of the Gibson gun had the effect of demoting all the other weapons to mere toys. Looking back at the attacking crab, he saw that Eddie had somehow popped up behind the creature and leapt onto its carapace. With the Gibson gun firmly grasped in her small fists, she was directing its multiple blazing muzzles at the crack down the centre of the creature's broad back. The strength and skill the girl was demonstrating astonished Jumper, and he had to wonder whether the XL was having a more potent effect within her petite body. The crab reacted to the assault with a panicked backward scuttle, which, to Jumper's horror, carried Eddie further into the enemy ranks. She's going to get cut off, Toka shouted between pulse blasts. Jumper cursed. More and more Karkarian drones were surging from the cube ship, many of them converging toward the girl atop the mangled beast. The crab shuddered to a halt. Somehow retaining her balance upon the tipping carapace, Eddie leaned all her weight against the Gibson gun as it thundered out its rounds. Then, with a loud crack, the thick shell began to separate. With its remaining legs jerking, the beast came apart like an old oak tree, splitting in two to reveal a wet, rotten interior. Her feet on either side of the crack, Eddie teetered for a moment. Then she fell. Plummeting head first through the crab's mucus-like insides, she disappeared from view behind the swelling number of drones. With a torrent of pulse blasts tearing through the air around them, Jumper and Toka desperately fought their way forward, all the while hoping to catch sight of Eddie. As they neared, it dawned on Jumper that the drones were now fighting among themselves, and it wasn't until he'd fired off another few bliss darts that he remembered that they weren't alone in this fight. Large numbers of Karkarians with grey ash smeared over their muscled bodies had joined the fray with impressive ferocity. A great roaring cheer erupted as the other soldiers joined Jumper in recognising their allies. Jumper turned to Toka, but his young friend had recklessly surged ahead, weapon blazing, seemingly fearless. Jumper swore and quickly picked off a few drones that were closing in on the bold young man. Trying his best to move forward while laying down cover fire for Toka, Jumper caught sight of Eddie. The girl was covered in mucus and was darting around her fallen foe's entrails. The Gibson gun was laying idly on the ground while numerous Karkarian drones circled menacingly. Dark yellow slime flew through the air in stringy arcs as Eddie fiercely swung her big survival knife in an effort to keep her attackers at bay and reclaim her weapon. Stopping dead in his tracks, Jumper concentrated his aim on the drones nearest her. A cry of warning that Jumper was certain had come from Toka rang out above the din. Lowering his rifle, he immediately saw the reason for it. Distracted by her attackers, who were now backing away, Eddie had missed the huge clawed beast that had crawled over the broken remains of its defeated kin to loom above her. Toka was already close, firing his weapon at the beast, but it was too little too late. Jumper watched in helpless dread as Eddie suddenly became aware of the enormous foe and turned to face it, knife defiantly raised. But without her beloved Gibson gun, she didn't stand a chance. The giant crab snapped a razor-sharp claw down with the speed of a viper, and, in the blink of an eye, Eddie's knife-wielding arm was separated from her body and was dropping to the ground. Jumper heard Toka scream, a sound filled with anguish and fury. Ignoring any lingering enemies, the young man was bolting toward the collapsing girl. 
Firing the two last darts, Jumper slung his bliss rifle over his back and followed as fast as he could. By the time he'd caught up, Toka was standing over Eddie's unconscious form, wildly unloading his ten-click blasts into the eyes of the looming crab. He was roaring at the top of his lungs as if the sound might somehow increase the weapon's power. Without missing a step, Jumper sprinted past him. Sliding beneath an attacking claw, he dove under the crab's body, hitting the ground in a roll. When he came up, the Gibson gun was in his hands. Get her out of here! He bellowed at Toka as he directed the huge gun at the giant beast's underside and tugged on the twin triggers. The weapon's discharge rent the air and filled Jumper's vision like a blazing sun. His whole body shuddering, Jumper turned his head to see Toka gather up Eddie's limp form and bound back towards the relative safety of the human ranks. The Gibson gun was slick with mucus and stank to the high heavens, but he gripped it tight and didn't ease his fingers off the triggers for a second. Jumper had never been one for big, noisy weapons, but as the gun's rounds hammered into the relatively soft underside of the giant beast, he had to admit it was a hell of a way to unleash his anger. It was dark, a complete and terrifying dark. Lawrence could barely move, which, along with not being able to see, caused a sharp panic to stab at him. He forced himself to take slow breaths. They weren't deep due to a crushing pressure bearing down on his chest, but they went a little way toward diluting the panic. It was a searing heat that sent sweat trickling down his face and neck. Other than the sound of his own breathing and thumping heart, which seemed horribly amplified in the blackness, all he could hear was a distant, rapid popping. Also muffled words. Yes, he could definitely make out voices among the popping. The sounds were a huge comfort, as they suggested that he wasn't dead something he'd been questioning since coming to. Finding that he could wriggle his left hand, he did just that. The hand meant nothing but rock, but it was loose rock. He pushed with all the leverage and strength at his disposal. He felt weak, but something was cracking, giving way. Then a long crevice opened up and a spear of light struck him, causing his thumping heart to soar. It was a flickering light, but bright as it penetrated a tiny, jagged gash in the rocks maybe three or four meters ahead. The gap brought with it louder, clearer sounds too. The muffled voices were now cries and yells, mixing with the rapid blasts of heavy gunfire. It sounded like chaos, but it also sounded like salvation. It began to dawn on Lawrence just how lucky he was to be alive. That bloody great cube had landed right on top of him. The fact he'd fallen into a suitably deep crevice was nothing short of a miracle. Most of the others fleeing alongside him certainly wouldn't have been so lucky. But of course, he was still buried. Those countless others might have had the luckier deal yet. Wriggling his entire body, he managed to displace more rocks. He coughed and spluttered as they crumbled around him, causing little plumes of dust. Doing his best to blink away the grit, he kept his watery eyes on the flashing light that penetrated the gap like a guiding strobe. He could still barely move, but at least he could move, and every inch he shifted was a blessing. Soon, he managed to turn the shifting into a sort of forward shuffle, panic and determination battling it out in his head with every inch moved. Unfortunately, by the time he reached the light-filled gap, panic had well and truly won. No, please no. The gap was too small, too small by a long shot. Lawrence desperately peered through the gap. He saw figures. There were Karkarians, hundreds of them like fast-moving shadows against the bright flashes of lightning and gunfire. He could see other moving shapes too, but those didn't make sense. Huge, dark red things that must have been a trick of his grit-filled eyes. All of a sudden, he wanted to cry. This was too much, too great a test for his newfound bravery. Surely even his father would have given in to fear at this. Buried alive. God, no. He sucked in a few shuddering breaths. Then, instead of crying, he found himself letting out a long, low growl. Anger was taking hold, bubbling up from the depths of his mind. If nothing else, it proved a blessed relief from the fear. There was no way he'd go out like this, not after all he'd been through, not after all he'd grown. Urgently trying to steel himself, Lawrence bent, practically contorted, his arms to feel above his head. There was a smooth, unyielding ceiling, the hull of the cube ship, he began slamming his palms against it, pounding at it with everything he had. Then he gave the rocks around the tiny gap the same treatment, letting his rage team up with a sudden burst of adrenaline to fuel his strength. Pushing, pounding.
pounding, heaving as silent prayers repeated in his mind. He directed the prayers not just to God, but to all the gods, to anyone, anything that had the power to move a mountain. The rocks didn't budge an inch. The panic returned then, like an invisible claw come to grip him around the chest and squeeze away any last drops of courage. Frantically, Lawrence increased his efforts, slamming his elbows, knees, and mistakenly his head against the walls of his tiny prison. The serum still in his system gave him strength, but his flesh and bones couldn't match it. Blood began running down his arms and legs, and only after he felt some knuckles and an elbow crack did he force himself to stop. He wanted to cry out for help, or at least for someone who could ensure he didn't die alone. But as hard as he looked, he could see no humans among the outside chaos. Eventually, with his breaths nothing but ragged gasps, Lawrence dropped his head and rested it against a bloody forearm. He lay still for a while, the sounds of the outside chaos echoing around his little prison. So close, but a world away. His body felt numb, a numbness that was blessedly creeping into his mind. Part of him still wanted to cry, but a larger part of him decided to simply close his eyes and quietly accept his fate. Seconds later, or perhaps hours, Lawrence's eyes snapped open. An explosion was rending the air. No, maybe an earthquake. The ground was shaking, causing his rocky cocoon to crumble. Then the ground began to shift. Rocks began to churn, twisting him like an insect caught in a pepper grinder. Lawrence broke his silence then. He screamed as loud as his raw throat could manage. Screamed for someone to help him, anyone, even if it was an enemy wanting the pleasure of killing him, anything but being buried alive. He called out Tark's name, then random names, all those he'd helped in recent days, all those he'd been a leader to. Some leader he was now. Every muscle in his body burned in strain as he attempted to push, crawl, heave himself through the crumbling rock, through the gap to the outside world. Even in his panic, Lawrence could see the gap had widened. Frantically, he thrust one arm out into the open air, his free hand finding a solid, jutting handhold. Roaring with effort, he pulled with all his might but the weight of the disintegrating rocks on his legs and body was too great. Then the rocks were coming down on his neck, then his head. He tried once more to cry out, but fragments of rock were pressing into his face and entering his mouth. Then the light was gone. Lawrence remained conscious. The relatively cool, gusting air of the outside world teased the skin of his blood and sweat-soaked free arm. Possibly due to shock, the sensation felt oddly pleasant. Then. There was a similarly odd sense of disappointment as a new pressure began to bear down on the arm. It seemed fate wasn't going to allow death until every inch of him was buried. His lungs were beginning to burn. It wouldn't be long now. But there was a strange tugging sensation. Somewhere deep in his fading mind, Lawrence dreamily became aware that the pressure on his free arm was different, very different. Not rocks, but flesh gripped him. Multiple hands. No, claws. Then the tugging became more violent. Loose rocks scraped across his flesh. His spine seemed to stretch and pop, and his legs felt they might leave their sockets. Then quite suddenly, he was free. The only pressure being that of the hard ground beneath him. Painfully, he rolled over and blinked his eyes open. With the amount of grit that had assaulted them, he was surprised he could see anything at all. Nevertheless, there, Standing tall over him were four figures. Three Carcarians, their bodies smeared with grey, and one white-haired little man. The gods are most definitely looking out for you, young Lawrence. Trying to break free from his lingering shock, Lawrence managed something akin to a smile. Then he attempted a verbal reply, but it quickly became a painful, bloody coughing fit. With no time to catch his breath, Lawrence again felt clawed hands gripping him, then lifting him to his feet. It was at this point that he realized just what a sorry state his body was in. Fiery pain ignited in every joint, shot up every muscle, and burned its way down every ligament. He wobbled for the briefest of moments before being lifted again and thrown over broad, solid shoulders. The bedlam all around him was overwhelming. Lawrence was well and truly amid all the chaos now, and for that, he was pretty damn grateful. Chapter 46 Relentless. As he hit the last control for the activation of the dropships, 
Cal felt an enormous wave of relief wash over him. He just hoped to God his efforts weren't too little too late. He imagined it would be nothing short of chaos down on the planet's surface by now. An easy thing to picture when a similar chaos was happening right before his very eyes. The far end of the laboratory looked as though it had fallen foul to a crate of pressure grenades. Amid the mass of smashed equipment and cracked workstations, he could see one of the synthetics in a fierce embrace with one of the Karkarian drones. The din they were creating was bordering on absurd as they crashed around in a rapid, violent dance. As he took in the rest of the carnage, Cal felt his heart begin to thud increasingly harder and faster. The second fight was over. The synthetic with the tattooed face was standing victorious over the other drone, its lifeless form slumped over a console. Even from this distance he could see the slug-like insidion crushed in her cybernetic hand, its long, torn tendrils hanging limp down her arm. Throwing it to the floor, she turned her deadly gaze toward him. Cal swore and clenched his jaw. If the activation of the dropships had taken even a few moments longer, he'd already be dead, and he wouldn't have seen it coming. As if reacting to the sight of the tattooed bitch's gaze, the excel within Cal's body seemed to reignite, offering some blessed strength to his damaged body. The dropships were on their way. All that was left now was one last-ditch effort at survival, one last fight. Moving with all the speed available to him, he snatched up both pistols and pointed them towards the synthetic. He was breathing heavily, and the wound in his side was doing its best to oppose his will and fold him in half, but he was damned if he was going to give up now. The synthetic began her approach, and Cal steadily tracked her movements with both pistols. He fired a couple of quick, controlled blasts. She was too far away to hit, but he wanted to get the measure of her speed. The swiftness of her reactions shouldn't have surprised him, particularly after spending so much time in Melinda's company. But still, they did. She was impossibly fast, leaping and spinning away from the blasts in a blur and only taking minimal cover before resuming her steady path towards him. It was as if she could see into his mind, fully aware of when and where he was going to fire the weapons. Cal was careful not to become distracted by the almighty crashes at the far end of the lab. It seemed the other drone was putting up a far more effective fight than its companion. Strangely spurred on by the drone's unwillingness toward defeat, Cal let instinct take over. Taking a step back from the console, he leapt up onto it. The time for caution was over. He knew the synthetic would never be intimidated by aggressive actions, but just as Kaya had surprised Melinda on their first meeting, perhaps a bold attack might just throw her off her programming for a vital second. Launching himself forward, he unleashed a barrage of fire from both pistols, doing his best to track his opponent's movements as he did so. The rest of the lab became a blur. All he saw was that soulless, tattooed face, clearly framed amid the light of his blazing pistols. He leapt from one workstation to the next, his need to survive manifesting into a near animalistic fury. Then, one of his shots found its target, pounding into the synthetic shoulder. Clothing and synth flesh instantly disintegrated as the blast met her hard, cybernetic chassis. The blast did little damage, but the force tipped her off balance for the briefest of moments. Cal took full advantage. Continuing to bolt directly towards her, he made sure that every one of his shots found its mark, hammering directly into the synthetic's body, twisting her, never giving her a chance to regain form. By the time he closed the gap, the force of the onslaught had turned the cybernetic woman almost 180 degrees. Throwing down the pistol in his right hand, Cal launched himself through the air and slammed into her back. He felt as though he'd hit a boulder, but he wrapped his right arm around her neck and held on with all his might. Lab equipment flew and disintegrated as the two of them crashed about, slamming into anything and everything. Cal felt his body crunch under the impact, but still he clung on, excel and determined rage fueling his arms. Raising the pistol in his left hand, Cal pressed it hard against the back of the synthetic's neck and held down the trigger. Blinding orange and white light dazzled his vision, an intense heat scorched his face as the pulse pistol objected to the point-blank range. But despite the heat, he retained his pressure on the weapon's trigger, holding it desperately like the lifeline it was. The weapon's discharge backfired and blistered into the air around him like snakes of pure energy, writhing furiously as they tried to bore directly into the near-indestructible metal. Once again, the synthetic slammed him back against a workstation, making him feel as though he'd been sandwiched between a tank and a wall. The pistol's grip became red-hot in his hand, but it would be suicide to let go. Calling upon every last spell,
spark of energy, Cal angled the weapon up toward the underside of the synthetic skull, causing something to shudder violently beneath him. Every part of his being screamed at him to let go, but he roared back a wordless answer of defiance and somehow found it within himself to cling on to consciousness. All sense of time and space seemed to slip away and it was only with a vague, dreamlike awareness that Cal felt one of the synthetic's hands grasp his right arm. Over the sounds of the pulse pistol's continuous discharge, it was impossible to hear his bones break, but even with his wildly distorted senses, he felt the crunch, one more drop of pain into a sea of hurt. He couldn't breathe, his muscles were refusing to respond. He tried his best to turn his face from the writhing electric snakes, but he failed. It felt like staring into the core of a great sun, his eyes burning in their sockets. There was a terrible noise, a scream painfully filling his ears. Was it the burning weapon or the synthetic beneath him? Or perhaps it was issuing from his own throat? Then, quite suddenly, he was plunged into a dark ocean, no longer able to see, hear, or feel a thing. Cal came too, but only just. He could make out a distant commotion, fighting, crashing, thumping, screeching. Blurred visions were swimming dreamlike in front of his throbbing eyes. He was lying on his back, limbs sprawled awkwardly and unresponsive. His body was rhythmically searing with pain as if his heart was pumping liquid fire through his veins. Slowly, his vision began to clear. He managed a weak shake of the head in an attempt to hurry it along. He felt confused. There was something coming at him, a horribly disfigured form. He shook his head again. It was a woman, a woman turned wild. She had a crazed expression made fierce by tattoos and thin, blackened scorch marks that wrapped around her face like the legs of some arachnid. The woman was stomping forward on one stiff leg. Her other seemed useless, twitching and dragging behind her. One of her arms appeared similarly useless, joints completely rigid the fingers of the hand splayed and frozen. The other hand, however, appeared fully functional and was reaching determinedly, reaching for him. Cal's brain fought its way through the fog. He managed to disengage from the pain to capture some understanding of what he was seeing. He had damaged his opponent, seriously damaged her, but it still wasn't enough. Her reaching hand was close, seconds away. He attempted to get to his feet, but was far from successful. Instead, he settled for a desperate, crawling retreat, keeping his back to the floor and his blurry eyes on the grasping hand. As he moved, he realized that similar to his attacker, only one of his arms was any good to him. The other was shattered and barely had enough function to remain tucked at his side. He tried to ignore the trail of blood that he was leaving in his wake, astonished that his body still retained any. Unconsciousness continued to threaten, but he kept crawling back, relentless in his efforts, desperately shaking his head in an effort to keep the darkness at bay. The demonic-looking synthetic loomed closer still, her spasmodic gait proving just that bit faster than his desperate crawl. Suddenly, her leg buckled and she dropped down onto her knee. Cal felt a glimmer of hope that she was dying a cybernetic death but the hope was quickly and brutally extinguished as he realized she was simply increasing her chances of getting a hold on him. Her hand was now practically touching his foot. Cal searched frantically. He needed a weapon, anything to give him some sort of fighting chance. Then his bleary vision honed in on a pulse pistol, the very one that had already proved its worth tenfold. The weapon lay on the floor, thick blue smoke oozing from its muzzle. It was a little further than an arm's reach away. He turned and stretched, his pain manifesting into an audible cry. His fingers scratched desperately at the smooth floor as he tried to pull his broken body closer. He touched the weapon, its metal grip still hot as his fingertips brushed against its surface. There was a voice in his head, encouraging him, urging him to stretch further, just a little further. Unfortunately, that voice could do nothing about the steely fingers that closed around his ankle. The pistol rocked slightly as his fingers pressed against its edge. Then, within one terrible blink of the eye, the pistol was further away. The hand around his ankle had given one violent jerk, and his reaching fingers met nothing but air. Cal twisted onto his back, a grim sense of defeat pouring through him. He felt a steely hand grip his thigh. Another violent jerk, and he was again yanked through his own blood across the smooth floor. 
The synthetic leaned over him like a jackal over a carcass, and Cal couldn't help but focus on the hideous, scorched face. The hand was reaching for his throat now, soon to meet flesh and begin its squeeze. Something exploded to Cal's right. A workstation split apart, countless canisters splintering into a million shards that rained down on him along with bright blue liquid. Cal's fragile senses spun in confusion as a large, jet-black shape crashed down on top of him. He tried to make sense of the situation, a near-impossible undertaking for his failing brain. Then he realized, with only a faint sense of relief, that the tattooed bitch had gone. He managed to stretch his neck to see the dark form of a carcarian lying across his legs. The drone looked to be in a similar state to himself, bloody, broken, and struggling with unresponsive limbs. There was another movement, a flickering that was almost lost in the haze of his peripheral vision. He turned just enough to see the dying throes of his tattooed foe. Then there was footfall, glass crunching under the weight of a heavy frame. The second synthetic appeared, fists balled at her side like a prize fighter looming over a felled opponent. In contrast to those she stood over, her body still looked well within its physical limits. Other than torn clothing and long gashes to her already healing synth flesh, the cybernetic woman appeared all but intact. Her gaze briefly dropped toward the tattooed synthetic. There was not the slightest hint of pity or grief as she assessed her broken sister, nor did she show any sense of anger as she turned her doll-like eyes toward Cal and the fallen drone. Indeed, it was with an entirely impassive, machine-like efficiency that she dropped to one knee and began slamming her fist into the struggling drone, or more specifically, the insidion that clung to its thick, muscled neck. With the drone pinning his legs, Cal felt every blow. Once satisfied that her alien opponent was no longer a threat, the cybernetic woman looked at Cal. Strangely, he felt no fear. He didn't want to die, far from it, but in that moment he felt too much pain, too much confusion. There was no longer any room for fear. At least death would put an end to the searing agony, and it would be quick. This cybernetic killer wasn't damaged or malfunctioning. She wouldn't falter or hesitate. He gritted his teeth as she took one mechanical stride over the drone before dropping to one knee. Her pale face filled Cal's vision as she leaned forward and drew back her right fist for the killing blow. But it didn't come. A black arm had threaded around the synthetic's neck from behind, causing a hint of confusion to flicker over her face, briefly betraying the impassive countenance. Surprise hit Cal as hard as his delirium would allow. At first he thought he was seeing the arm of a carcarian, but even through his damaged vision he realized the arm was far too slim. Also there was a hand, a human hand, feminine and pale with immaculate snow-white fingernails. Cal stared at it, time seeming to slow almost to a stop, a strange disconnected curiosity fending away unconsciousness, denying it a hold. All he could see was that beautiful hand contrasted against the synthetic's deathly face. Then there was an abrupt, violent lurch that seemed to nudge time back into action. The synthetic killer had been wrenched away from him and forcefully pulled to her feet. Painfully, he craned his neck and watched as she was spun on the spot, then launched through the air right over his head. Then came a mesmerizing sight. Seeming to tower above him, Melinda looked every bit the Amazon of myth incredibly beautiful and entirely formidable. Quite unlike the synthetic that she'd just launched through the air, Melinda's face was far from impassive. Cal could see anger there, which, as she looked down upon him, turned to undeniable concern. Very nearly human. As his vision began to fade, Cal recalled something his young friend Victor had said when they'd first met, the words sounding in a loop in the back of his mind. My Melinda could destroy those pathetic synthetics with one arm tied behind her back. As he watched Melinda leap over him, he had no doubt the boy was about to be proven right. He had an overwhelming urge to laugh, but there was no chance of that now. As he slipped into unconsciousness, however, there was definitely something close to a smile lingering on his bruised and battered face. Chapter 47 Time to Run Lawrence was finding it hard to breathe. The shoulders of the Carcarian carrying him were repeatedly slamming into his gut and chest. Not that he was complaining. As the alien leapt across the rocks, Lawrence did his best to lift his lolling head. Everything was a blur. Multicolored pulse blasts streaked through the air, 
Carcarians leaping, diving, clawing, biting. Crabs, huge bloody crabs stomping and snipping off limbs. A big metal spider, a rotating gun on its back creating a circle of destruction. More pulse blasts, white dreadlocks, grey war paint, bared fangs, humans, lots of humans fighting, shouting, cheering. Feeling his brain could take no more, Lawrence dropped his head, closed his eyes and held on tight. Jumper, here, over here, bro, run! Toka's shout was distant, but somehow Jumper managed to pluck it out of the mad din. He continued to bound over the rocks, his breath pumping through his lungs like some sort of steam-powered cyborg. Without slowing his pace, he tried to hone in on the sound and catch sight of his young friend. His vision was overwhelmed with blaster fire, battling aliens and dropships coming down in dangerously rapid descents. On top of this was the fact that all his running was causing disgusting globs of yellow slime, remnants of the giant crab he'd killed, to drip from his hair into his face and eyes. Using a filthy sleeve, he did his best to wipe it away and was partially successful in clearing his vision. Just as well, too, because at that moment a Carcarian sprung from behind a rock not far ahead. Seeing no grey war paint, Jumper swung his bliss rifle back, ready to strike a club-like blow, the weapon's darts having long since run out. Locking its malevolent, pale eyes on the weapon, the Carcarian raised its clawed fists and lunged forward to meet the attack. But it didn't come. Jumper had rolled beneath the lunge and was already continuing his speedy path across the rocks, safe in the knowledge that the alien could never match his speed. Once again, he scanned the terrain for his young blonde friend. Here, Jumper, over here! The shouts were definitely closer, but still Jumper couldn't spot him. What he did see, however, was Victor's mechanical combat spider, or at least what was left of it. The metallic beast looked as though it had been half crushed, four of its long legs curled up tight, the remaining four flailing while the multi-barreled swivel blaster attempted to spew out non-existent rounds. Jumper leaped over the defeated machine and continued on. Not far ahead he saw swarms of people pouring into the dropships. As they boarded, the armed survivors were offering cover fire. Distressingly late, the escape was finally concluding as planned. A blue bolt of light streaked through the sky high above Jumper's head. For a moment he ignored its existence, then its lightly source dawned on him. The Star Splinter. He slowed his pace, wiped again at the slime invading his eyes, and scanned the dark skies for the next blue streak. There, emanating dead ahead, or perhaps slightly to his left. Because of the Star Splinter's ghosting net, the blue cannon blast had appeared to materialize out of thin air. Judging by its height, Jumper guessed the ship had already landed. Good lad, Victor. Jumper, run, damn it! This time, Jumper knew exactly which direction to look, and spotted Toka almost instantly. Taking his young friend's advice, he summoned every last ounce of the XL left in his system and ran as if his life depended on it, which of course it did. Numerous individual Carcarians came at him as he closed the gap to the Star Splinter. He evaded every one of them, all without swinging a single blow. He'd always had a talent for ducking and diving, and with the XL in his system, he was a near-impossible catch. He was close now. Close enough to see Toka running toward him, close enough to see the warning on his young friend's face. Dodging to his left, he twisted in midair, came down in a crouch, and skidded to a halt on the scree. Two giant crabs, each with at least three Carcarian drones on their wide backs, were coming at him at an incredible pace. Barely having time to register their presence, a flash of blue sliced into their ranks. The crabs exploded in a shower of yellow ichor, and bits of Carcarian drones flipped through the air in a high arch. Thanks, kid. Jumper didn't hang around to see the debris hit the rocks. Instead, he turned and ran toward Toka, ran towards the Star Splinter, ran towards his ticket off this damned hellhole. Chapter 48 Survivors The first thing Cal saw was a clear coiled tube sticking out of his arm. His eyes followed the tube to a white box full of bright blinking lights and low-pitched beeps. Other tubes coiled out of the machine. Sluggishly, Cal followed their paths. They all led to other arms, other people laying on white beds, just like him. His whole body felt numb, and he had the queer sensation that he was hovering in mid-air. He could hear activity. With an effort, he lifted his head and saw the familiar sight of the Aurelian's medical facility. 
the large D-shaped room had been empty the last time he'd been in it. This time, it was anything but. The entire space was jam-packed with beds, people, and monitoring equipment. The vast majority of those people were in a similar position to himself, horizontal and immobile. Some, however, were apparently uninjured and on their feet, weaving their way around the beds, leaning over the patients and tweaking monitoring equipment. Similar bustle was visible through the wide windows set high within the curved portion of the room. The facility's occupants weren't limited to humans. There were a number of Karkarians dotted about too, their dark forms stark against the gleaming whiteness. Cal's eyes drifted toward two of them who were close by. Both were injured, their dried purple blood bright where it mingled with the ash war paint. Between the two hulking aliens stood a skinny, deeply tanned man sporting a mass of white dreadlocked hair. Cal blinked, an odd trio. A familiar low whirring noise tugged at his attention. He looked to the far end of the room, where a pool hoist was lowering two people while two others were simultaneously being raised. Cal peered through the mass of beds until he caught sight of the shimmering black surface of the healing pool. The sight of it was almost hypnotic. As he stared at it, he half expected Kaya's beautiful pale face to break its surface. But there was no chance of that now. The numbness he felt was beginning to fade, and in its place came an increasingly intense pain. The floating feeling was also fading, leaving him to the mercy of gravity, a broken body, and an only partially forgiving bed. A machine near his feet began to beep, louder and higher pitched than the others. The noise made his ears ring. He tried to ignore it and continued to take in his surroundings. A familiar face caught his eye. Eddie was lying three beds over, her eyes lightly closed. The girl's hair was no more than a layer of black stubble, and her face was a patchwork of small healing patches. Cal also saw a familiar tangle of blonde hair on the far side of her bed. Toka was slouched on a chair, his face pressed into the mattress. Eddie had lost her right arm. There was a healing cap on the stump that Cal knew would do little more than seal the wound and help minimize phantom pains. There'll be no fixing that wound, I'm afraid. Cal turned to see a young man, maybe mid-twenties, who had approached the foot of his bed and was looking toward Eddie. That black liquid is pretty incredible stuff, but it doesn't regrow limbs. The young man turned to Cal and gave him a half-smile before turning his attentions to the beeping machine. Without saying a word, Cal looked back toward Eddie and Toka. It was hard to feel sadness about her lost limb. Seeing them both alive filled him with a relief too great to leave room for anything else. Still, that magic black pool certainly did you a world of good, the young man continued. According to that blonde synthetic, you were hanging onto life by a thread when you went in there. Finally, the machine stopped its infernal beeping. Don't get me wrong, you're still in a hell of a state, but you're stable, and that's what counts. We'll get you back in there once the others have been stabilized. The man's voice was cheery, but it seemed a struggle. Chomp, chomp. Uh, the words didn't leave Cal's mouth easily, like forcing treacle through a sieve. You will have trouble speaking, I'm afraid. Your jaw is still partially broken, and you're on enough drugs to topple a horse. If it's your tall black friend you're asking for, he's making his way over here now. Cal tried to follow the young man's line of sight, but his neck wouldn't allow it. Instead, he studied the man. He was clean-shaven and wore an immaculate white coat, but his face was gaunt hair roughly cut short, and despite his youth, his eyes had a haunted edge, the look of a man who'd spent months in a living hell. Suddenly, Cal was confronted by a tall stranger. No, Jumper. The afro was gone. Just like Eddie, all that covered his old friend's head was a thin layer of stubble. Good to see you awake, Cal, Jumper said, giving him a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. You'll not have long, the young man informed him. The drugs will take effect very quickly. Jumper nodded without taking his eyes off Cal. How you feeling? A little pissed off. Jumper didn't laugh at that, just nodded his understanding. Victor. He's fine, Jumper replied quickly. You'd have been proud of him. You'd have been proud of them all. He glanced across at Toker and Eddie. They fought hard, 
saved a lot of lives, and they gave those invading bastards something to think about before the dropships arrived. I'm sorry. There were- I know, Jumper interrupted him, saving him the effort of the words. Victor showed me everything on the lab's security feed. Took Kaya. There's no way you could have saved her. No one could have. It was a bloody miracle you managed to activate the dropships, let alone survive those synthetics. Every soul on this ship and the starship following owes you their lives, Carl. Jumper gave a brief grin. We're just damn lucky you're such a bloody relentless bastard. Cal tried to shrug, but his body only half obeyed. Thanks for Melinda. Dead without her. Jumper nodded. I just wish that mosquito ship had been faster. Then he shook his head. Or I wish I'd sent her sooner. Hell, I wish a lot of things. He rubbed at his stubbly head, and his eyes strayed towards Eddie. I tell you, Carl, I'm not overly keen on being put in charge of anyone but myself. Cal managed a very small nod of understanding. Must be in chaos. Yes. Jumper turned back to him. I saw the recordings from your infiltrator, too. Saw the inside of the Insidion base. Not what I expected. A agreed. It's as if this is all a game to them. A spot. Cal could feel the drugs starting to reclaim him. And if Kaya's theories are right, Jumper continued, we mightn't have even seen them yet. Not the real them, at any rate. How many? Cal managed to interject. How many saved? Of course. Sorry. Jumper looked down and paused a moment before answering. Half. Almost half. The others died fighting. The two men went silent for a moment. A good deal of our Karkarian allies made it too. I'm not sure how many they lost. Cal could feel himself slowly slipping back into unconsciousness. It was a welcome feeling. Before he went under, however, he managed to mutter one last thing. Kaya. She's not dead. Jumper nodded, almost as though he'd been fully expecting the words. I know, Carl. I know. Eddie looked pale and incredibly fragile lying on the large bed. Her shaved hair had barely grown at all since Cal had seen her five days previously. She was breathing steadily, and her eyes were closed, eyelids hiding the wildness within. At that moment... All Cal could see was a young, innocent girl. He looked up at Toka, who was standing over the bed, staring at Eddie, anxiety clear on his face. He was rubbing at his neck, and he kept throwing Cal and Jumper worried glances. She'll be awake any moment now. The voice was that of a middle-aged woman, one of the few military refugees with enough medical experience to aid the injured. Do you want me to stay and help explain about her arm? Instinctively, Cal glanced at Jumper and said, No, that's okay. Thanks, though. The woman gave them a warm smile, then moved off toward another bed. Watching her walk away, Cal caught sight of someone being hoisted out of the inky depths of the healing pool. He looks a bit like you, don't you think? Cal turned to see that Jumper was also looking towards the pool, but he's a little skinnier. With a raised eyebrow, Cal turned back as Lawrence Decker stiffly transferred from the hoist to a bed. He wasn't always so slight. I guess months on a prison planet changes a man. Cal nodded. More than you know. She's waking. I think she's waking up. Toka's voice was little more than a whisper, but it was loud enough to attract Cal's and Jumper's attention. Cal used his crutches to shuffle forward slightly. Toka was right. The rousing drugs were doing their job and stirring the girl from her long, induced sleep. As Eddie's eyes flickered open, her look of confusion was almost instantaneous. Slowly, she turned her head and gazed briefly at each of them in turn. Did we win? We did. Okay, Jumper answered, all considering. How are you feeling, kid? Eddie blinked a few times. J-Man. Where the hell's your hair got to? She asked, ignoring his question. Instinctively, Jumper reached up and rubbed his head. I, um, well, I got a little too close to the slimy innards of the enemy. 
When it dries, the damn stuff sits hard as rock. Screwing up her nose, Eddie turned to Cal. Jeez, Cal, you're looking pretty banged up. Cal tried his best to shoot her a lopsided grin. Well, that's what happens when you piss off a synthetic. Eddie screwed up her nose again, staring at him like she could see right through his forced smile. Then she continued to look at each of them in turn. What's going on? Why are you all looking so flipping sad? And what's up with you, Blondie? You look like your butt's been got out by a giant pincer ant. Toker opened his mouth, but no sound came out. He coughed and tried again. Well, uh, we're... We were worried. You... There was... He shook his head, swallowed hard, and looked imploringly over at Cal. I'm afraid you were injured, Eddie, during the fighting. Yeah, Eddie said, continuing to look back and forth between Cal and Toka. Eventually, she followed Toka's line of sight, and her eyes locked onto the healing cap covering the stump of her missing right arm. My arm's gone, she said in a small, rather bewildered voice. Where'd my arm go? She asked, her gaze not shifting from the space where her missing limb should have been. It was one of those giant crabs, Jumper explained, like the one you managed to kill. Bastard snuck up on you, Toker added, his voice far from steady. Don't worry, though, Ed. Victor's gonna... Victor's gonna... His words faltered as Eddie looked up at him, tears brimming in her big eyes. Victor took a step toward the bed. Hey, Eddie, what Toker's doing a pretty crappy job of explaining is that I'm gonna build you a new arm. A cybernetic, nano-assisted prosthetic limb, actually. Eddie turned her glistening eyes towards the boy, her expression suggesting she wasn't really understanding his words. Cal could sympathize. It was a huge thing to take in, particularly with a drug-addled brain. I've already started working on it, Victor continued, suddenly eager as he turned to Melinda. The synthetic woman passed him a long white box. I took the dimensions of your left arm already, see? Then I started building the basic cybernetic skeleton. It still needs loads of work, of course. Tendon shifters, sensory pads, fiber optics, and of course sufficient tubing for the nano threads, plus all the synth flesh too. But the basic structure's there. Eddie turned to Cal, confusion still evident on her tear-streaked face. The sight made Cal feel like spilling some tears himself. Victor's making you a cybernetic arm, Eddie. Like a synthetics arm. Victor nudged Toker out of the way and setting the box down on Eddie's bed, opened it up like he was presenting the girl with a prize. Eddie awkwardly leaned over to stare at the cybernetic limb contained within. We won't be able to fit you with it on this ship, though, Victor explained. But when we get to the research base on Alvor, they'll definitely have some decent surgeons and all the kit needed to meld the nanothreads to your nerve endings. But that's good, though, see? It'll give me time to make the arm top-notch, way better than anything the military would ever dish out. Eddie gazed into the box for a good long while before lying back on the bed. That'll be my new arm, she asked, looking back up at Cal, her face unreadable. Cal nodded. Yes, Eddie, you'll be able to use it just like your old one. The girl turned back to Victor. Will it be like one of Melinda's? Will it be as strong as hers? Victor also nodded. Yep, you'll be able to squish bones with this new grip. Cal winced slightly and exchanged a quick glance with Jumper. As long as you don't go squishing my bones, little chick, Toka said with a nervous laugh. Eddie didn't say a word. Instead, she turned her head to stare up at the high, bright ceiling. Some time passed with the girl not saying a word. Cal was beginning to get worried, a sickening, helpless feeling taking hold. He looked around at the others and saw that his expression wasn't the only one turning grim. Eddie, I... I mean, we... He started to say, but he aborted the words as he caught the look on the girl's face. A smile had appeared. Thank God. As had always been the case, Eddie's grin was infectious, and before long, a similar one was spread across each and every one of their faces. Then there was laughter. Chapter 49 Epilogue the distant blue and green planet was a beautiful sight. Even from this distance, staring at it through the smart glass of the Aurelian's viewing deck, 
Cal could see that Alvor was a planet bursting with diversity. Lush forests and jungles, immense mountains and deserts, lakes the diameter of large moons, and deep blue oceans too vast to fathom. A giant-scale earth of old, pristine and untouched by the industrial and technological age. Perhaps it would be the new hub of human existence. Cal hoped so. As long as they didn't push it to its limits like they had Earth, he had a feeling it could make an incredible home. Sorry I'm late, Callum. Cal turned to see Lawrence Decker entering the dim room, his progress slow due to his lingering injuries. The first name basis was still catching Cal off guard. The man had obviously gone through a miraculous change over the past months, but the Captain Decker of old, with whom he was far more familiar, had never been a friend. Far from it. But Cal had never been one to hold a grudge, particularly against a man who'd recently played a big hand in saving thousands of lives. No problem, he replied as he watched the man hobble toward him. I was just admiring the view. So that's Alvor, eh? Lawrence said as he came to stand next to him. She's a beauty. That she is, Cal replied, turning back to gaze through the smart glass. With any luck, the perfect place for a fresh start. Lawrence nodded. I'm sorry it's taken us so long to meet for a talk. Don't mention it. You've been in demand, and there's all the pool time we've both had. Not easy to chat in the inky depths. Lawrence grinned. Yes, we both buggered ourselves up pretty good, eh? Cal returned the grin. Despite the miraculous nature of the pool, both of them still had a way to go before they were completely healed. It was worth it, though. Couldn't agree more. A shame it didn't go quite as planned. Cal nodded. Fucking pirates, he muttered. He still couldn't quite believe the timing of the bastards. Still, everyone did well, despite the problems. Particularly you, Callum. I've never seen someone take out a synthetic before. Cal stretched his right arm and did his best to flex his fingers. You saw the footage? Oh, just about everyone's seen the footage. Quite a thing, the way you dealt with those pirates. Even injured, you made fools of them. Cal shook his head. Wasn't enough. I understand one of them is still alive. Barely, Cal replied as he thought of the female pirate he'd knocked out with the knife. Not even the black pool seems to be bringing her out of her coma. Lawrence nodded. I'm sorry about the lady who was taken. Kaya. It seems we all owe her our lives. He placed a hand on Cal's shoulder. I would tell you how there was nothing you could have done to save her, but you've probably heard that a thousand times already. I doubt hearing it again will make you feel any better. She's not dead, Cal thought. But he didn't voice it. Instead, the two men simply stood in silence for a while, gazing through the huge sheet of smart glass at the distant planet. It was Lawrence who eventually broke the silence. If you're able to forgive me, Callum, I'd be grateful if Alvor could also mark a fresh start between the two of us. Cal turned to him, a little surprised by his words. Why would you need forgiveness from me? Lawrence shrugged. Why wouldn't I? You know that I've made a lot of foolish decisions in my past, given bad orders, put people at risk. He looked at Cal with solemn eyes. I feel guilt gnawing at me every minute of every day. I need to ask forgiveness. And in all honesty, I don't know who else to ask it from. Cal stared back at the man, awkwardly rubbing at the back of his neck. He was unsure how to reply, and after a moment said, Surely there's someone better than me. Lawrence shook his head. Who better than the man who saw fit to knock out one of my teeth because of that same foolishness? Cal continued to stare at him. I got a little carried away. I'm sorry about that. Don't be sorry. You did me a big favor that day. Started a change in me. Something that continued to change on that prison planet. Feeling a little weird, Cal took a moment before he replied. Okay. To be honest, I feel like a bit of an idiot saying it, but... Yes, I forgive you. Lawrence nodded his thanks, tense shoulders relaxing a little. Cal studied him closely. The man must have been through hell down on that planet. But how could someone change so completely? Maybe sometimes it took a true nightmare to wake a person up. You know, I'm not just saying that because you've asked me to, he said. 
By all accounts, you turned the tides down on that planet, turned despair into hope. Whatever past mistakes you're guilty of, as far as I'm concerned, you've made a damn good job at turning things around. Lawrence looked about to object, then let out a breath and said, Thanks. Hearing that from you means a great deal. He reached out an open palm. Cal shook it as best he could with his screwed up hand. Of course, you realize it's not over yet. Not by a long shot. No, I didn't think so. There's probably countless others to save, once we find them, that is. Lawrence nodded. You think we'll get away with pulling the same trick twice? Cal shrugged. I imagine we'll have to get creative and hope they don't strike back first. Lawrence turned his gaze back on the nearing planet. You think they'll find us here? Most likely. Eventually. We'd best be ready then, eh? Cal nodded. How the hell do you prepare for something like that? They fell into silence again. After some time, Lawrence tore his eyes from the view and looked down at the floor. You, uh, you mind if we sit down? Christ, I thought you'd never ask, Cal replied. My legs are killing me. Only your legs, lucky bastard. Both men chuckled as they stiffly lowered themselves to the dark, smooth floor. I tell you what, Callum, I feel about a hundred and two. I can't bloody wait to get in that pool again. Cal sighed as he sat. That makes two of us. He rubbed at his legs and after a few moments said, You know, it's a shame your father couldn't see you now. Lawrence smiled, a sad smile. For almost an hour, the two men sat in comfortable silence, staring quite literally into space, taking in the slowly expanding planet. By the end of that hour, Alvor was almost matching the height of the viewing panel, a mesmerizing sight that Cal found pleasantly calming. I think that's got to be the biggest, lushest planet I've ever seen, Lawrence said. The words almost made Cal jump. They sounded ridiculously loud after the long silence. I've been thinking the same thing, he replied. Probably holds a lot of secrets. A ton, I'd imagine. Good place for exploring. Undoubtedly. Fancy exploring it together? I do, Cal replied sincerely but I might have to take a rain check. There's something I have to do. Lawrence looked at him. You're going after the scientist, aren't you? The woman, Kaya. I am. Lawrence nodded. Rubbing at his face, Cal stiffly got to his feet, and after one last look at Alvor, he turned and reached down with an open palm. A fresh start, my friend. Lawrence grinned and took the hand. There was a good amount of clumsy stumbling and some chuckling as Cal pulled him to his feet. Aye, Lawrence replied once he was fully upright. A fresh start. You have been listening to Star Splinter, Fractured Space, Book One. Produced by Greg Lawrence, executive producers James Torn and Greg Lawrence. Text copyright 2015 by J.G. Cressy. Production copyright 2015 by Podium Publishing. All rights reserved. If you enjoyed this audiobook, let us know. Take a quick moment to rate and review it on Audible, so we know we're bringing...